meeting other developers, and so much more. By now, you've checked into registration to receive your badge. Your badge must be visibly worn at all times. And don't forget, you'll need it for the party at the end of the day. The information desk is located near registration. If you have any questions or are in need of assistance, please feel free to stop by. All gender restrooms are located throughout the venue, and you can find the prayer room on the first floor and the mother's room on the second floor. All sessions will be taking place in either Theater 1 or Theater 2 on the second floor. Try the new Android Dev Summit app in the Google Play Store to plan your schedule today and filter by topics that interest you. The Android Dev Summit wouldn't be complete without showcasing the latest updates, so we invite you to explore the sandboxes located throughout the venue. Be sure to attend the Office Hour Pods, Certification Booth, and Review Clinic for a chance to meet the team and get answers to your burning questions. And don't forget to snap a photo of yourself at the 10 Years of Android Land photo wall downstairs. We'd like to take this opportunity to remind you that we're dedicated to providing a harassment-free and inclusive event experience for everyone, and that by attending the Android Dev Summit, you agree to our community guidelines posted throughout the venue. Let's be excellent to each other. Thanks for attending and have a wonderful time at the Android Dev Summit. And welcome to the 2018 Android Developer Summit here at the Historic Computer History Museum in California. This is an event for developers by developers with tons of in-depth content and, most importantly, direct access to the engineers that actually build Android. In fact, we have so many of them here this week that I'm pretty sure Android development is going to stop. <laughs> Uh, in the audience, we have attendees from over 70 countries, both in person and on the live stream. We're glad to have you all with us here today. Now, speaking of history, it was, we're about to celebrate our 10th anniversary of Android. And in fact, it was about 10 years ago that the very first customers were unboxing their G1 devices. And CNET's review at the time said, thanks to the openness of the operating system, there's huge potential for the G1 and any Android devices after it to become powerful mini computers as developers create more applications for Google Android. The G1 did OK, but it's what came next and what you built on Android that fundamentally changed the mobile industry. 10 years ago, the mobile landscape looked very different. Mobile platforms at the time were not friendly to developers, with severely limited APIs and tools. But even more problematic was that each OS required completely different and non-transferable skills. So it was simply impossible to build a mobile app at scale. Now, at the same time, off in a corner of Google in Building 44, a small team of dedicated engineers were quietly working on what at the time seemed like a crazy project. The idea was bold, to build a new open source operating system that any device maker could use with a powerful SDK that put developers first. And to many at the time, this seemed like a harebrained idea. What did Google know about telecommunications, and how could it possibly influence this established industry? It was an intense time for the Android team. And to add to the drama, while getting close to launching version 1.0, Apple announced the iPhone, and it looked awesome. They brought their A game. So what were we going to do? Well, we had two hardware programs at the time. The Sooner device with a physical keyboard 
and the Dream device, which included a touchscreen. So we had no choice but to accel accelerate the schedule of the Dream. And we felt like we had a window to deliver on our vision of the smartphone before it was too late. We were racing to launch, and the team was incredibly motivated. So we started a tradition of putting on a huge breakfast on Sundays in Building 44 for anyone who wanted to come in. Bacon, eggs, pastries, you name it. And it was super productive. No meetings, just coding, and in parallel, bug triaging and release planning. Clearly, these cats do not know about Android Studio's code completion. Uh, in the morning, uh, you'd have a previous week's version of Android, but by the evening, some amazing new piece of functionality would appear, like the notification shade or a new home screen. It was like watching the OS come alive before your eyes. Now, one of the big challenges in creating a new platform is the bootstrapping problem. So how do you motivate anyone to write an application for a platform with zero users? And why would a user buy a phone with no applications? So we did two things. First, the core Android team wrote mobile app versions of Google's desktop services, everything from Gmail to Maps to YouTube. And it worked out well because it let us experience our APIs and framework at the same time as developing the applications. And it's something that I like to encourage we do to this day. But to make the platform shine, we needed apps from across the industry. So we launched an early look SDK in November 2007 and announced the Android Developer Challenge with $20 million to be awarded to the top 100 apps. And developers around the world responded. And by April 2008, just six months later, we had over 2,000 submissions. And it was amazing given that there were no physical devices to use for development, just the emulator. The apps were surprisingly diverse, from games to social networking, and from utilities to productivity tools. And location and GPS were the top used features, along with camera and media and messaging. So it really showed this pent-up demand for developers to be creative on mobile and to use features that were up to now locked down to them. Some of the winning apps are still around today, like Life360, and several paved the way for apps and businesses that would come years later. The T-Mobile G1 launched in October 2008 with Android Market. This was the predecessor to Google Play, and it had just over 50 apps on day one. Uh, one week later, we opened the store for developer uploads. And advanced capabilities like in-app purchases and direct carrier billing and just broader country support were yet to be built. The following 10 years was one of rapid evolution. In the early days, we were doing two big releases uh, a year. And our lead program manager at the time made this offhand suggestion that we codename the releases after desserts in alphabetical order. And that idea stuck, uh, and here's what came next. So Android 1.5 Cupcake, we were eating a lot of cupcakes at the time, added virtual keyboard support. So we'd no longer require that physical keyboard like on the first G1 device. We also added the copy and paste clipboard. Android 1.6 Donut followed, introducing support for different screen densities and sizes, thereby laying the foundation for a variety of phone sizes and form factors that were going to come a couple of years later. And that was Diane Hackborn's idea. She's generally about five years ahead of the rest of us. Android 2 Eclair introduced powerful speech recognition and changed driving forever with Google Maps, Google Na Maps navigation. Android 2.2 Froyo took the speech capabilities to the next level with voice actions, which lets you perform key functions on your phone, like getting directions and taking notes and setting alarms. Uh, and that, of course, was the precursor to today's Google Assistant. Android 2.3 Gingerbread was in many ways the first mainstream version of Android. And it was the one that started to get serious scale with hardware manufacturers. With Android 3 Honeycomb, we added support for tablets with the hollow theme. But now we had a problem because phones were shipping on gingerbread and tablets were shipping on honeycomb. So we merged both form factors with Android 4 Ice Cream Sandwich. And in that release, we also introduced more intuitive navigation with the use of gestures to dismiss notifications and recent apps. And that release was also saw the arrival of quick settings. 
Android Jelly Bean was an incremental release that included Project Butter to optimize graphics to get a buttery smooth V-Sync locked animations. And smooth animations are something that I personally obsess about to this day. Android KitKat came with Project Svelte that reduced the memory footprint to 512 megabytes. And it also included DSP offloaded OK Google hot word. I heard the beep. <laughs> It works. Android 5 Lollipop followed and was the mother of all releases. It brought material design to Android, it giving it an entirely new look and feel. And so between Project Butter and material design, we changed the narrative on Android, giving it a beautiful, refined user experience. Lollipop also introduced support for new categories of computing, including wearables and auto and TV. And Lollipop was the first release with enterprise features, such as the work profile, which we've been building on ever since. Lollipop was such an epic release that we frankly needed to spend our energy in Android 6 Marshmallow on improving quality. We also made a major overhaul of privacy in that release with the introduction of runtime permissions. Android 7 Nougat brought significant new capabilities, including multi-window support, virtual reality, and new emoji. Android 8 Oreo introduced the Android Go profile for entry-level smartphones. And it also came with Project Treble, a massive overhaul of the hardware interface layer to help both speed up and reduce the cost of doing upgrades. Finally, this year, we launched Android Pie, which starts our journey on an AI-first experience. It also contains tons of UI improvements and simplifications and introduces the concept of digital well-being. So that was a very quick trip to have memory lane. I think it's pretty incredible to see just how far we have all come in a decade of smartphone development. And while we're solving different problems today, it's clear the principles upon which we built Android are just as true today as they were 10 years ago. So principles like giving developers a powerful SDK so their apps can run everywhere, or open source code to enable device makers from entry level to high end and an ever-improving UX that delights users around the world. So what does the next 10 years have in store for Android? Well, I obviously don't have a crystal ball, but there are three trends that I want to call out that I think are important. One, smartphones are getting smarter. Two, multi-screen computing is becoming pervasive with exciting new form factors on the horizon. And three, our phones are going to be able to help us with safety and digital well-being. So first, our smartphones are about to get a whole lot smarter. AI will enable your phone to get to know you better, to adapt to you, and to become more personal. And you can already see glimpses of this in Android Pie running on Google Pixel. For example, the screen brightness automatically learns your preferences. And the next apps to launch are predicted with high accuracy to save you time. And the camera is able to recognize objects in real time with Google Lens and the phone can screen calls with an intelligent AI. For developers wanting to tap into AI, we announced MLKit earlier this year. So whether you're new or experienced in machine learning, MLKit enables everything from image labeling to face detection and more. MLKit builds on Android's neural networks API, which provides hardware acceleration via DSPs and net neural processing units, or NPUs. And it's supported on the latest flagship devices from Huawei, Xiaomi, OnePlus, Google, and more. And an API boosts performance considerably. So for example, MobileNet, which is a family of vision models for TensorFlow, runs eight times faster using NN API on the Qualcomm Snapdragon 845 compared to the CPU. And you can expect NPUs to become standard on all smartphone silicon in the next few years. The second trend goes beyond phones. We're investing heavily in a multi-screen experience. This means a great Android experience across TVs, wearables, cars, and Chromebooks. And we're seeing user growth in all of these form factors. For example, user engagement on Android TV has grown to three hours per device per day. And this year, Android Auto has seen 250% user growth and our partners launched 19 new watches running Wear OS. And just when you thought you'd seen everything in phones, we're about to see a whole new form factor idea from Android device makers, foldables. They take advantage of new flexible display technology, so the screen can literally bend and fold. 
And you can think of the device really as both a phone and a tablet. And broadly, we're seeing two variants. There's the two-screen devices and the one-screen devices. When folded, it looks like a phone, so it fits in your pocket or purse. And the defining feature for this form factor is something we call screen continuity. For example, you might start a video on the folded smaller screen while on the go, but later sit down and want a more immersive experience. So you can simply unfold the device to get a larger tablet-sized screen. And as you unfold, the app seamlessly transfers to the bigger screen without missing a beat. It's an exciting concept, and we expect to see foldable devices from several Android manufacturers. In fact, we're already working closely with Samsung on a new device they plan to launch early next year, which you'll hear about later today. For our part, we're enhancing Android to take advantage of this new form factor with as little work as possible from you. For example, we're adding resizable flags so your app can respond to folding and unfolding. And we expect to see a lot of innovation in foldable hardware over the next few years, and we're excited to see what you come up with. The third trend is safety and well-being. Smartphones have gone from non-existent to indispensable in just 10 years. In fact, the very idea of leaving your home without your smartphone literally sends shivers down people's spines. And at Google, we like to build products that give you utility, whether that's putting the world's information at your fingertips, or navigating you to where you need to be, or translating a foreign language. But beyond utility, we feel a responsibility to your safety and well-being. As one example, more than 80% of emergency calls originate from mobile phones. However, locating these phones in an emergency can be challenging, since traditional emergency location technologies often fail indoors or have a radius that's too large. In a serious emergency, minutes can mean the difference between life and death. We launched Android's emergency location service, ELS, in 2016, and just recently announced bringing it to the US. With ELS, when you dial 911, or your country's equivalent, your location is accurately calculated through a combination of Wi-Fi, cell towers, and GPS signals, and sent directly to the emergency provider. ELS is built into 99% of Android phones all the way back to version 4. And we're continuing to look at new ways to help improve your safety with lots of ideas in the works. Now, having a smartphone with you all day is awesome, but we also want to make sure you're in control of your digital well-being. And we know from our research that 72% of people are concerned with the amount of time they spend on tech. So at Android Pie this year, we introduced new tools to let you control your usage with things like app limits, grayscale wind down, and do not disturb that blocks all distractions. Of course, like most features, we've added developer hooks. So you can now tell if do not disturb is enabled or if your app is temporarily limited, and you can implement an intent filter so your app has its own usage dashboard. We're continuing to invest in this space with lots of enhancements planned. OK, so let's wrap up. Android, from the beginning, was conceived as a platform built around developers. We poured a ton of energy into growing this ecosystem and community from the ground up. I see our developer tools and frameworks as living, breathing things. So we're constantly striving to be better. And in return, you've been an amazing community, building incredible apps and services that enable and delight users the world over. We simply could not do this without you. So thank you. So with that, let's get down to business. I'm excited to hand over to Steph and team to talk about some of the recent work we've been doing to increase developer productivity on Android. Thank you. Zomato was started as an app which lets you browse digital menus. Now we are this big food tech company that is operational in 24 countries. More than 150 million users visit the platform every month. We are available in 10 languages. And on the delivery side, we have a fleet of around 60,000 delivery riders. After all the buzz in the developer community about Kotlin, I was intrigued by how Kotlin was able to uphold the object-oriented paradigm and solve many of the architectural flaws in the compile time itself. I almost instantly recognized that Kotlin will enable me to develop more architecturally sound applications. Almost all the new SDKs and APIs that Google is releasing right now has Kotlin support. 
if we convert a java class to kotlin there will be about 15 to 20% decrease in the line of code but if you take data classes there is a drastic improvement of about 55% decrease in the lines of code switching to kotlin is efficient and really exciting at zomato now almost every new feature is being developed in kotlin i would recommend switching to kotlin because of its interoperability with java with recent updates android studio has drastically improved kotlin support it is almost frictionless Hey everyone, I'm Steph. I'm on the Android team, and Dave is right. Developers influence the platform. You're not on top of it. You're a part of what we do. Kotlin's a great example. It's not a Google-designed language. It was not maybe the obvious choice, but it was the best choice, as you made clear. We could see developers voting with their feet in the adoption in the months before we announced support. Like Kotlin. Our developer investments come down to two things at heart. Number 1, your feedback. And number 2, Google engineers using Android and thinking, how do I make something people will love? So the past several years, we've been investing deeply in Android's developer experience. It's been guided by your feedback. We'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about some new things that we have to share. So each year we've been investing Let's start with IDEs. In 2013, we first demoed Android Studio at IO. It was a new IDE built on IntelliJ, designed to accelerate Android development. Over five years, we've progressively built it out, based on the features you asked for most: completely new emulators, a new compile tool chain, profilers, mobile layout tools like Constraint Layout, better C++, inspectors for things like layouts and app size, and tools for every dessert release. We also wanted to add the little things that make a big difference, whether that's Maven integration to lint checks. Second, APIs. In 2016, Diane Hackborn wrote a famous post on app architecture, saying, "We're not opinionated." To which she replied, "Please be opinionated." <laughs> so we created architecture components and we've refined them with feedback over many EAPs and expanded them now into Android Jetpack. We see Jetpack as the future of our mobile APIs. They are opinionated and easy to use, intuitive APIs that work on 95% of devices. We want them to integrate seamlessly with Android's core primitives, so you get the best possible combination of efficiency every day and also deep control. Expect to see us continue expanding Jetpack every year. Third was languages. In 2017, we announced support. for Kotlin. We've added since then IDE support, API support, docs, samples, and moved it into the Kotlin Foundation working with the wonderful language authors. Fourth, app delivery. So, developers have always loved the Play Store for the fast delivery times. It's great when you want to launch and innovate fast, but you told us app size is way too big. And that really hurts installs. So this year we announced the app bundle and dynamic delivery. Developers using this are slimming down apps worldwide with most apps saving up to and over 30%. Finally, security. Android was built with security in mind from day one with application sandboxing. As Android's matured, we've expanded our mobile security services. Today, 99% of abusive apps are taken down before anyone can install. And after you install, We use Google Play Protect to scan over 50 billion apps per day, It's every app on every connected device. When we find a potentially harmful app, we disable it or we remove it. But let's say you're doing everything right and you accidentally get caught in this net without someone to talk to. This is a place I think we need to do better. We need to make it much easier for you to reach us in these cases. So Our engineering director will be here tomorrow at the fireside chat to talk with you about it and get your feedback. Now, another way we protect the ecosystem is moving apps to target current APIs, like API 26 by November. And you told us, okay, makes sense. 
but please give us a long notice period. So that's why we gave almost a year's notice. We think of you as a part of how we work, whether it's early ideas to advisory boards, uh, reading Reddit threads, beta, and iterating after launch. We really want to be trustworthy, and we've definitely heard about things that you love, like architecture components and Kotlin. Sometimes we have underestimated the time it takes to get things right, like Instant Run. What we've heard is you want from us open sharing, so you uh, can see things that are early, as long as we're clear this is early, as well as things that are ready for production. So that's what we'll do today. Let's shift gears. Today, I'm going to share a range of early ideas all the way to stable releases. I want to walk you through two big themes for Android development. First, foundations using languages and libraries to work smarter. Second, productivity, using mobile IDEs, console, and distribution to develop easier, have higher quality apps, and to grow adoption. We're going to start with foundations and Kotlin. Throughout, I wanted you to hear from some of the people who have been instrumental in these projects. So we're going to start with someone who was key in the Kotlin decision, He's a huge contributor to Android, both while he was in the community, now on the Google team. It's a privilege to turn things over to Jake Wharton. Hey, everyone. So I'm Jake. I'm part of the team working on Kotlin for Android. And it's been 18 months since Steph was on stage at Google I.O. just down the road from here, announcing that Kotlin would be supported as a new first-class language. So something that had never been done in the history of Android. But based on positive feedback from developers like you and the growing adoption that we've seen in apps, it's clear that this was the right choice. According to GitHub's yearly stats, Kotlin is the number one fastest growing language in terms of contributors. Stack Overflow's yearly survey places Kotlin as number two most loved programming language by those who participated. For Android, 46% of pro Android developers are now using Kotlin to build their apps. Uh, this was according to a survey of those visiting developer.android.com. In October, we had 118,000 seven-day active projects using Kotlin in Android Studio. This is based on those who opt in to reporting analytics. That's a 10x increase from the numbers last year. Now, when Kotlin support was announced, there already were a bunch of apps that were using it in the Play Store. And that group continues to grow and includes new apps like WeChat, Amazon Kindle, and Twitter. Just prior to Google I.O. this year, uh, the Kotlin language moved into the Kotlin Foundation. And we're fortunate to partner with JetBrains, who spend a tremendous amount of resources on improving the language itself. Just last week, they released the newest version of Kotlin, 1.3, with new language features, APIs, bug fixes, and performance improvements. For example, inline classes, uh, which in most cases don't actually allocate like a normal class would unless they're boxed. For constrained devices that we target, avoiding allocation while still retaining type safety is a big win. The Kotlin standard library now includes a set of unsigned numbers, such as uint, ubyte, and ulong, and these are built using that inline class feature. And in addition to Kotlin code targeting Android or the JVM, you can now target JavaScript, or now native code, as well. This unlocks the possibility of reusing parts of your code base on more platforms. And finally, the long-awaited coroutine support is now stable in 1.3, which is a lighter weight version of threading. The language and library support for coroutines combine and simplify how you do asynchronous operations or perform concurrent work, things that are essential to every Android app. And as I'm sure you are, we're looking forward to using these new Kotlin features in the Kotlin-specific APIs that we provide. So far, the majority of those have been through the Kotlin extensions, which are part of Jetpack. At this, year, uh, this year at I.O., we announced that the Kotlin extensions were expanding from just core KTX to seven KTX libraries for common artifacts that you use from Jetpack, like Fragments, SQLite, Lifecycle. And all of these are now available at stable releases. Since then, though, as new APIs are added to existing libraries or new uh, libraries are added to Jetpack, the KTX extensions are being built alongside. So things like navigation, paging, uh, and slices are all new libraries that each have extensions being built with them. 
And we're starting to go beyond just providing extensions. So Lifecycle is going to support a coroutine scope, so you can easily launch coroutines and have automatic cancellation. And Work Manager will be offering a work object based on coroutines. And we're always on the lookout for integrations like these uh, to, that provide more close interoperability. If you want to get started uh, with, say, coroutines on Android, there's a new code lab that you can work through. It covers performing asynchronous work, uh, testing of coroutines, and the Work Manager integration. And since Kotlin isn't just a language for building Android apps, Google Cloud Platform now offers samples, tutorials, and their own code lab so you can build your application backend using Kotlin. And finally, uh, new Udacity courses are available in preview today, which cover app development entirely in Kotlin. And they use both Jetpack and popular third-party libraries. To speak more about Jetpack as a whole, I'd like to turn it over to Ramon Guy. Hi, I'm Romain, and I work on the Android framework team. So a few months ago, we announced Jetpack, the next generation of Android tools and APIs to accelerate Android application development. Jetpack builds on the foundations that we laid out with support library and app architecture components, but we also add new tools and libraries to the mix. Jetpack is about writing less code and targeting more devices. All Jetpack libraries uh, are backwards compatible and target up to 95% of existing Android devices. We first started running early access programs on architecture components about two years ago. And, they entered, uh, and our first public beta was 18 months ago at Google I.O. 2017. Today, out of the top 1,000 applications in active development on Play Store, 798 are already using Jetpack. This is up from about 560 at Google I.O. this year. Jetpack is used in many applications like New York Times, Kakao Talk, Duolingo, Evernote, Uber, SoundCloud, Pandora, Twitter, Dropbox, Viber, and many more. Apps build all over the world, in India, Germany, France, Korea, Israel, China, the US, and more. Also at I.O., we announced new libraries for paging, navigation, work manager, slices, and Kotlin extensions we just talked about. Although these are still in early phases of development, they are already being used in over 38,000 applications worldwide. And the evolution of those Android X libraries is driven in large part by the feedback we receive from you, the community. But we know that many of you have long expressed a desire to do more than simply give feedback. So that's why this summer, we moved all Android X development to public AOSP. You can now see features and bug fixes implemented in real time, and you can contribute to any of the Android X libraries. All you need is Android Studio and the public SDK. And we also want to use AOSP as a place where we can experiment and prototype new ideas. And our hope is that earlier access to Android features will help us refine and help ship even better libraries. So please join us. With Jetpack, we introduced two uh, app architecture component libraries, Navigation and Work Manager. The Navigation architecture component library offers a simplified way to uh, implement Android's navigation principles in your application using a single activity. These solutions give you consistent animations across devices, atomic navigation operations, and easier transi uh, animated transitions. Work Manager makes it easy to perform background tasks in the most efficient manner possible. You do not need to wonder whether you should be using Job Dispatcher, Job Scheduler, or Alarm Manager. Work Manager will figure out which is the best solution given the, ap the application state and the device API level. These two libraries will become better later this month, so if you have any feedback about those APIs, the engineering teams are here today and tomorrow, so now is the time to give, it that, give us that feedback. We also introduced Android Slices, a new way to bring users to your applications. Slices are like a mini snippet to surface content outside of your application. This can help users book a flight, play a video, call a ride, and so on. Slices is another example where we want to be open very early, but we want to take the time to get things right. After working with several of you on the APIs, we're moving into public EAP at the, uh, at the end of the month. We do this, Kayak, and many other applications. We will run experiments surfacing slices in Google search results. And there's a session today with more info and best practices about building slices, so please check it out. Our team has also been hard at work bringing numerous improvements to existing Android X libraries. For instance, in paging 2.1, you have more control over memory usage, and it offers better Kotlin integration. Room 2.1 is our biggest feature launch since 1.0. We, we added full text search tables, database views, better Rx, Java, and auto value integration. 
Data binding 3.2 brings much faster multi-module compilation, and we expect further improvements in 3.4. And finally, view model lets you save state in OSP. One thing you told us worked really well was deeply integrating libraries and tools in Android. Constraint layout was one example. Uh, but a new great example of this is navigation. So in Android Studio 3.3, we have a new navigation editor to help you easily understand, visualize, visualize and build a navigation, navigation flow in your application. So let's go straight to a demo of the navigation editor. So here I have an application that was already partially written, and you can already see the flow of navigation through the different screens of the application. So if I run the demo on the emulator, and we wait for Gradle to uh, do its job, I can click on leaderboards, I can see different profiles, but if I click on the profile, nothing happens. I can go back to the editor, add a new screen, so I just select the fragments uh, to view user profiles, and then I link the leaderboard screen to the user profile. I also need to add an argument for the selected user, and it's a string. I just rerun the app. Wait for Gradle. The tools team will probably want to chat with me after this. <laughs> we go back to leaderboards, and if I click on the profile now, I can see the profile. But as I go back and forth between those two screens, you can see that there are no animations, no transitions. So if I go back to the editor and I select uh, this navigation flow, I can choose which animations I want. So I'm going to choose the enter animations and the exit animations. And now, if I rerun the app one last time, go back to leaderboards, and now you can see the sliding transition. So if you want to play with the navigation... So if you want to play with the navigation editor, all you have to do is download Android Studio from the beta channel today uh, and, uh, and get started. And as we expand the Android Jetpack libraries and tools together, we're focused on your feedback about the top problem areas that you encounter. So please let us know. We want to know about animations, UI, themes and styles, camera, anything else. We are here today, we are here tomorrow. You can tell us what you need from us. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Karen, who will let, who will let you know about our plans for Android Studio. Thanks. Hi, I'm Karen. I'm on the team that builds Android Studio and Android Jetpack. So Ramon and Jake just talked you through the language and library experiences. To build on top of that, I'm going to talk to you about productivity and what we're doing with Android Studio. For 3.2, we asked ourselves, what can we do to have a meaningful impact on productivity? And where do you spend the most of your time? We heard loud and clear, thanks, Ramon, that it's build speed. Uh, it's something that you do every day. <laughs> He set me up. Uh, it's something you do every day, multiple times a day, and every minute that you're waiting for that build to finish, we know it's a minute wasted. So we took a deep look at our data to see what was going on, and we actually found two things to be true. The first thing we found was that build speeds uh, in our opt-in data is actually getting slower over time. The second thing we found is that new releases of Studio are actually improving build times. In the last year and a half, we saw build speeds get faster by 42% on fresh projects. So something's going on, and we had to take a, a deeper look. Code bases are just getting larger. Custom plugins are adding to build times. Annotation processors that everyone you, people use are negating the benefit of incremental builds. Uh, new languages can add to uh, compilation times. And if you have many modules, resource management can add time as well. The ecosystem and project growth are kind of outgrowing our build improvements. We are committed to making build faster. You'll find a large part of the team um, on build here this week to listen and learn and to tell you more about what we're doing. We want to get this right, and we need your help to do it. We're giving ourselves stretch goals. We're working on attribution tools to help you better understand what's impacting your build in your projects. And we're making Gradle and our first party plugins faster. We also know that iteration speed is super important to app development, because it's all about trying things out, iterating, and then failing fast, and then doing it again. With Instant Run, we want to fix what we started and quickly apply changes without losing the state of your app. Part of that apply changes is around deployment times. So we know they play a huge part, and we've just shipped an update in Android Pi where we're seeing a big difference in real world and sample projects between Pi and Oreo. If you're using USB 3.0, 
versus USB 2.0, we've seen some times that, close see, that seem close to that emulator speed. Please let us know if you're interested in giving us early feedback to get apply changes right. We're starting an EAP very soon. That takes us to emulators. Because we want to make iteration speed faster, we're investing in emulators for every OS. At I.O., we show the ability to save a snapshot of your current state of your emulator and boot up and switch to any snapshot in under two seconds. Productivity is also about making the hard problems easier. We heard that it's really hard to, make, to see how your app is impacting battery life on the phone. So we built the new energy profiler in 3.2. You can now see wake locks, visualize the estimated battery usage of system components, and inspect background events that contribute to battery drain. The new beta for Android Studio 3.3 is available today and was just released moments ago. We know that in order for an IDE to be delightful and to keep you productive, it has to be not just stable, but it has to be rock solid stable because of the number of hours that you spend there. The main focus for our next few releases will be quality, which we're calling Project Marble, reducing the number of crashes, hangs, and memory leaks, fixing user impacting bugs, and investing our infrastructure in tools. We know that sometimes we've missed memory leaks before we've shipped, um, so we're building tools to help detect those leaks before they even happen. Dave mentioned how millions of Android apps already run on Chromebooks. We're bringing the full power of Android Studio as an officially supported IDE to Chrome OS early next year. If you'd like to try it today, you can learn more at developer.android.com. Now I'd like to invite Matt Henderson up to share more about app size and what we're doing with the Android app bundle. Thanks, Karen, and hi, everybody. So I work on developer tools like the Play Console. And I wanted to start by talking about app size. Apps have grown dramatically in size. The average is up five times since 2012. But larger size carries a cost. It reduces the install conversion rate, and it increases uninstall rate. Now, you told us that using multi-APK to configure different app versions was a painful way to reduce app size. So the Android app bundle makes it much simpler. Using the app bundle, we reduce size by generating an APK for the languages, the screen density, the CPU architecture that each user needs. And it's working. While size reductions vary, on average, apps are seeing a 35% reduction in size compared to a universal APK. Now, with the recent stable release of Android Studio 3.2, app bundles in production have taken off. They're up 10 times. Thousands of developers have embraced app bundles. And the number of bundles in production now total billions of installs. And Google's apps, they're switching too. YouTube, Google Maps, Photos, Google News are all in production with app bundles today. Photos, for example, is now 40% smaller. So we're really excited about the app bundle's potential. We sign APKs for delivery to the end user. This is highly secure. We protect your key in the same memory, that in the same storage, we protect Google's own keys. This signing step is critical. It allows us to process the app bundle in order to generate the optimized APKs. And this, in turn, allows you to benefit from additional optimizations in the future, starting right now. So I'm happy to announce that the app bundle now supports uncompressed native libraries. This utilizes an existing Android platform feature that was little used because in the past, you would have had to use multi-APK for pre-M and post-M uh, devices. Now, we just do it for you. With no additional developer work needed, the app bundle now makes apps using native libraries an average of 8% smaller to download and 16% smaller on disk for M plus devices. By adding dynamic feature modules to your app bundle, you can load any app functionality on demand instead of at install time. 
For example, you don't need to send that same big feature to 100% of your users if it's only going to be used by 10% of them. And you don't need to keep big features that are only used once. Dynamic features can be installed and uninstalled dynamically when your app requests them. Or you can choose to defer installing to a later time when the app goes to the background. Facebook was one of our launch partners. And they are using dynamic features in production in the main Facebook app and in Facebook Lite. For example, card scanning is a feature that only a small percentage of Facebook's user base is using. So moving it to a dynamic feature avoids it taking up almost two megabytes on each user's device. Within an app bundle, installed and instant apps can share the same base module and the same dynamic feature modules. So separating out functionality as a dynamic feature is a great way to get your base small enough to offer an instant app experience. Now, you can start building and testing dynamic features using Android Studio 3.2 today, and you can join our beta and become whitelisted to publish them to production. Now, I'd like to invite Orash Mabod up to tell us more about app updates. Good job. Awesome. Thanks, Matt. So yeah, we've heard your feedback that you'd like more control to ensure that users are running the latest and greatest version of your app. To address this, I'm excited to announce the Google Play in-app update API. The update API has two variants. The first is an immediate update flow, where the user is presented with a full screen experience. They can accept the update, have it downloaded and installed immediately before proceeding. Many of you have already implemented similar variants of this in your app, but this new streamlined implementation is less error prone and super easy to integrate. Next is flexible updates. Flexible updates are really cool because they actually allow the, the update experience to be integrated into your app. And it feels far more customized. As an example, Google Chrome has opted to nudge users to update with a small affordance. If the user accepts that update, the download happens in the background, and the user can continue to use your app. When the download is complete, it's up to you as the developer to decide if you'd like the update to be applied immediately by presenting an affordance, or if you'd simply like the update to be applied the next time the app is in the background. Google Chrome is testing this now, and we're excited to be expanding the early access program coming soon. Next, instant apps. Instant apps are now available on over 1.3 billion devices, helping more users discover your apps. We've been hard at work on simplifying the development experience for instant apps. <laughs> Earlier this year, we increased the size limit for instant apps from 4 megabytes to 10 megabytes. And what we found is that just by using the Android app bundle, many developers are already able to get under that size limit without additional work. Additionally, the dynamic features that Matt mentioned earlier are also instant compatible, so you get two for one savings. We've also made it possible to now upload and test instant apps of any size. Uh, this allows you to both iterate on the user experience at the same time that you're optimizing for size. And we've also made web URLs optional. What this means is that you can now just take your existing Play Store deep link traffic and reroute those users into your instant experience automatically. And lastly, I'm excited to announce that today in the Android Studio 3.3 beta, you can now have a single Android Studio project that houses both your instant and installed apps. This dramatically simplifies the development experience for instant apps. And additionally, the app bundle that's emitted by this project can be uploaded once to the Play Developer Console, dramatically simplifying release management as well. We're super excited about it. And with that, back to Steph. Android's open source and scale means it's incredible to watch what you're building on top of the platform. With over 2 billion devices, 3 quarters of that's it for the keynote. Thank you. I hope you enjoy Android Dev Summit.
Now, everyone, please give a warm welcome to Dan Galpin. All right, well, I'm so glad to have you all here at the Android Summit, and I can tell you how excited I am to be no longer part of the team that's planning the event. <laughs> it's great to actually have the event coming off so well. And my name is Dan. I am the MC for this room. And when I'm not MCing, I lead Android developer outreach and training. And I first wanted to start by giving a shout out to everyone there on the live stream. Um, I wish you could all be here in person, but I hope you enjoy the content either at one of the live stream viewing parties or from the comfort of your own history museum. Um, you can also follow the History Museum. Um, you can also follow the online action on Twitter at hashtag Android Dev Summit. And now I need my next slide. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I'll have, to, I'll, have to, I'll have to improvise. I can do this. Um, so there's a lot of stuff going on here today. One of the things I want all of you on site to be able to take advantage of is the fact that we have a tremendous amount of Android experts available here at office hours. And those office hours are going to be right out here in the lobbies uh, next, next to these rooms. Now, whether you're here or tuning in remotely, make sure to check out the Android Dev Summit app so you can, take, so you can uh, look at all of the events and build your own schedule. Now, you'll notice we have some different like, sessions throughout the day. This is a bit of an experiment. Uh, and the 20-minute sessions are going to run back to back on somewhat related topics with the intention that you watch both sessions because there's no time to leave the room. Also, we have lightning talks that are going to, to uh, be a speed round where we move as quickly as possible to smash as much content to 40 minutes that is probably possible. Um, for those of you at the summit, we're going to be, again, having Q&A with presenters outside these entrances as well, along with the office hours. Um, so make sure to check out the schedule posted on the wall. We have so many people that wanted to talk to you that we can't actually fit them all here at once. So they're going to be coming in and out throughout the day. And uh, so you want to make sure that you're here so that the engineer that worked on bugs that you might be interested in are actually going to be there to defend themselves. And uh, finally, note that office hours are going to be running all day during and between sessions. So you're allowed to skip class if you want to go to office hours instead, or app review clinics, or the demo pods. And besides, we're going to be releasing all of the recorded sessions during and just after the run of the show, so you can binge watch it later. Also, we are having a party later on, so hold on to your badges and get ready for an epic night of music and standing around and talking to people. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, that, and that's it. I really appreciate everything. Uh, we have a little break now, and so enjoy the rest of Android Dev Summit. Everyone, our next session will begin in 10 minutes. Thanks, please.
Android Jetpack. Our next generation of components and tools, along with architecture guidance designed to help you accelerate your Android development. So you know that no matter what platform the user is on, tests are scheduled efficiently and with system-wide health in mind. And we're just getting started. Be inspired. Isn't that something? We're excited to be here at GDD India meeting some of our certified alumni. Morgan, how are we doing with the program? We're doing really well. We have nearly 300 Indian alumni here and it's been really fun talking to all of them. Yeah, it's really great to hear the stories of leadership, people making connections, getting jobs, promotions. We're just excited for everything that the alumni do and more. So I have attended like two to three Google event in Mumbai, but I have never came to this uh, big event and this event is very awesome. <laughs> it's my dream actually <laughs> to be part of this events and all the meeting Google people. And my favorite part was being in the launch in the open area where everything was being demoed and I met uh, other people near the certification launch. We have a huge community of people who respond and react to your questions and queries day in, day out. Other than that, we have the Google developers themselves from the Google groups who respond to queries. Our largest group of alumni are from India. We have about 300 and it's constantly growing, so it's great to be here in person and meet the biggest part of our alumni group. After getting my certification, the way people uh, you know, interview a candidate changed and they were really interested in, you know, in the person who has the certification directly from Google. And finally it ended up me in a, the job that I wanted. A couple of offers and I get to choose one. <laughs> the organizations nowadays ask if you are certified up, okay, come forward and we'll have an interview with you. Before this certification, I was not very confident about my skills. And after certification, like then I came to know about myself, what is my level of coding, and uh, I get confident about my developing skills and Android skills. These certifications are all based off of a job task analysis. This means that we've gone out into the field and we've talked with people who have these jobs as careers or who are currently hiring, and basically we've asked what is it that you are looking for when you're hiring an associate level Android developer. So all of this combined really creates a unique certification experience. And for my companies and all, I'm getting more value actually because I'm certified from Google. We have been highly appreciated and uh, they said that this is a good thing because it's not just a personal achievement, it's an achievement for the company also to say that we have not just developers, we have certified developers working with us. So I've been working for three years as a back-end developer and now I'm going to be a full-time Android developer. I'm going to start from day after tomorrow. <laughs> I have proof that I'm an Android developer and uh, Google has uh, tested my all skills and then I have this badge.
haven't yeah. done anything yet. Go for it. <laughs> Thanks for coming to this talk. My name is Jose Alcerreca. I'm a developer relations engineer at Google, working on Android. My name is Yid Boyar. I'm an engineer in the Android Toolkit team. And today we're going to talk about live data. Live data is one of the uh, first architecture components that we released uh, last year. And in this talk, we're going to explain what it is. We're going to talk about some of the transformations that you can do, how to combine live data. And then we're going to talk about some patterns and anti-patterns that you might want to avoid. So live data is a simple, lifecycle-aware, observable data holder. We're going to explain all these characteristics. Uh, but first, we're going to start with observable. What's an observable? So in our object-oriented world, probably the easiest way of uh, communicating one component and another is by having a reference from one object to another and just call it directly. However, in Android, this might have some problems. As we all know, components in Android have different life cycles and different lifespans. You might be familiar with this diagram. It's the view model scope diagram. A simple thing like a device rotation can actually recreate the activity. So uh, you probably know that having a uh, reference to the activity in this view model would be a bad idea because it leads to memory leaks, uh, even crashes with no pointer exceptions. So instead of having a reference to the activity in the view model, we're going to try to have a reference to the view model in the activity. So how do we communicate? How do we send data from the view model to the activity? Well, instead of doing that, we're going to let the activity observe the view, the view model. And for that, we're going to use observables, live data. Let's see how this uh, looks with a little bit of code. In the view model, we expose our live data. We're go you're, going, you're going to uh, see a lot of examples of how to expose live data from a view model. And then in our activity, we make the actual subscription. And we do that by calling the observe method on the observable. The first parameter is something called a lifecycle owner. Ed is going to talk about this in a, in a second. And the second parameter is an observer. This is what's called whenever the observable, the live data, uh, the live data's value is changed. Uh, so, Jose mentioned that you want to reference an object in the uh, larger scope, like a V model, from an object in a smaller scope, like an activity. But of course, when you observe something, it has to keep a reference back to you to be able to call it. So, there is a reference. Uh, but why is this not a problem with live data? Well, live data is a lifecycle aware component. What do you mean by this? To be able to observe a live data, you have to provide a life cycle. And when you provide this life cycle, it basically maintains your subscription for you for free. So if your observer's life cycle is not in a good state, like a stopped activity, it's not going to call you back. Or when your activity or fragment is destroyed, it's going to remove this subscription automatically for you. So you don't have the burden of maintaining this subscription. So if you go back to the previous graph, your live data observer will only be called if it is between started and before it is stopped. Uh, this makes sure you don't need to care about things like fragment transactions. Once you receive an observable value, you know you're in a good state. Uh, probably the most like, distinctive property of live data is that it's a data holder. So it's not a stream. We keep saying this. But what do I mean by that Like, it's not a stream, but it's a value holder? Uh, if you go back to our previous graphs, on the right, we have a live data in our view model. And on the left, we have our activity or fragment that's observing this live data. Once you set a value on the live data, just values pass to the activity. Similarly, if the value changes, the activity receives a new updated value. Now, the difference happens. When you change the value when the observer is not in an active state, it has, it has no idea that value C is never dispatched to the activity. And let's say while your activity is still in a background thread, oh, sorry, in a background, on a thread, uh, you set a new value, and your activity still doesn't see this. Now, the well, data holder property comes in now when your activity comes back, that user is seeing is in the foreground, it receives the latest value from the V model. Uh, 
as you can see, the value C has never a right to the activity because Lydate only cares about holding a single value and it's the latest value. This works perfect for UI because you only want to show what it is right now. Uh, but if you are trying to process a stream of events, this is not what you're looking for. Similarly, if you change the value after activity is destroyed, nothing happens. OK, let's talk about how to combine live data and talk about transformations. The library provides two, map and switch map, but you can create your own using mediator live data. We already said that live data is great to communicate a view and a view model. But what if we have a third component, maybe a repository, that is also exposing live data? How do we make this subscription from the view model? We don't have a life cycle there. What if the app is even more complicated and the repository is also observing uh, data sources in this case? Well, Ed once said to me that if you need a life cycle in your view model, what do you really want well, no, You probably need a transformation, but it's actually wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, <Come on>. Ed. <laughs> so, you know, what I say is that you definitely need a transformation. Don't ever use a life cycle in your view model. So different. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> so OK, how do we make um, the first sample is a bridge between the view and the repository? How do we get to that uh, live data? We use a transformations map, which is what I call a one-to-one -one static transformation. In the view model, we expose a, view, um, a live data. In this case, it's called view model result. And uh, it's the result of a transformations map. The first parameter is the source, the live data source, which is the live data exposed by the repository. And the second parameter is the transformation function. In this case, it's simply converting from the data layer model to the UI model. And this is how the signature would look like in Kotlin. It has a um, source, which is a live data of x, and it returns a live data of y. So it's a bridge of live data. And then in the, uh, in the middle, we have a transformation function that transforms from x to y. It doesn't know anything about uh, live data. Uh, so when you establish that transformation, the key here is that the life cycle is automatically carried over for you. So let's say you run a transformation of a couple of live data, and at the end, it is a live data that you hold on to. When someone subscribes to it, that life cycle is automatically propagated to the inner live data elements without you doing anything. And it's completely managed by us, so it's completely safe. Uh, another transformation we provide is switch maps. When do we need this? Uh, imagine you have an application where you have a user major that keeps the logged in user ID somewhere, like a disk. Uh, and whenever that logged in user ID, when you grab it, you need to talk to your user repository to get the actual user object. And that probably goes to the database and also the server to return you this user object. But that repository returns you live data as well, because user object might change, right? It may return you the cache one while it updates from the server. So you're in a situation where you have a live data of a logged in user ID and a live data of a user, and you need to chain these things. So map works if you are chaining from an ID to a user. But how do we chain from an ID to a live data of a user? That's switch map. Uh, so if you look at the, uh, that example, basically we call switch map. We provided this user ID live data. That's a live data. And then our function this time returns a live data. So the signature looks like this. You have a source, and at the end, you have a live data, and you provide a function that converts, converts the value x to a live data. What this technically does is, every time that user ID changes, it calls your function. You give it a new live data. It unsubscribes from the previous live data you returned, and then subscribes to the new one. It's like switching tracks, or I think this comes from like switchboards. Uh, but it's completely managed for you. And it's still life cycle where you get all the benefits of using live data. Now, we only provide map and switch map. We don't have like a million transformations like some, some other libraries. Uh, the, but this is very limiting. And sometimes you may want to write your own. And we actually don't want to provide many. But if you want to write your own, it's very easy. If I show you our like literal the code we have for the map implementation that Jose talked about, 
it does the CVS source and it does returns the live data and you give it a function, right? All it does is it creates this mediator live data class and adds the given source as a source for this mediator live data. What in which it kind of tells us that the value of this mediator live data is derived from this other live data. So whenever that other live data changes, call my callback, and in the callback, we basically apply the function to the value and set as a value on the mediator live data. This is like super simple to write. And the, there is no life cycle here, but all of this code is life cycle aware. Uh, so if it's so easy, let's create a new one. Uh, let's say you want to create something where user is filling a form. You have a bunch of strings, and you want to have the total count showing somewhere. So you have a live data and a leather live data. And you basically have a live data of integer that has the total number of characters in those live data elements. And this integer updates if any of those values update. So we called our function total lang. We receive a list of live data, and we return a live data. What we do here is we have a sum function. It's actually very simple. It goes through all of the live data and sums their length. Uh, we need to account for nulls here because Live data allows null, so you need to be aware of it. But this is very simple. It's basically look at all the live data values and sum the total length. Once we did that, we add each given live data as a source to our mediator. It basically says the value of this mediator depends on these other live data. So anytime any of them changes, the framework calls back our do some function, which calculates the new value for their mediator live data. And this is it. It's like four lines of code, and you have an operation, a transformation on your live data. Now, uh, there are some common mistakes you can make while using live data, and we want to touch base on these things. One, one thing we see a lot is, let's say you, have, you make a web request, it returns you a giant JSON, and then you convert it to your objects. Using a live data transformation for doing that is not a good idea, because live data is a value holder. So the long string you fetch from your server is going to stay in memory. It's going to hold on to that. So you probably don't want to use live data for something like that. It's not just do it as a one-shot operation. OK, the second item is about sharing instances of live data. Uh, at one point, I was uh, trying to make an app with live data. So, and I had a repository that was a singleton. And there was only one observer in the activity. So I said, OK, I can just save some live data and share a single live data. I had something like this a repository. It takes a data source. And then uh, the mutable live data that we are returning in load item is shared by everyone that calls load item. Now, this is fine. It works. But there's a very interesting edge case, and this this anti-pattern is about you thinking which observers are going to be uh, uh, active. And the edge case is activity transitions. There is um, this case in Android where two activities are going to be active at the same time. So imagine activity one observes item number one, and activity two observes item number two. When we load activity two, it's going to uh, load data for item two, but because they are sharing the same live data, activity one is also going to receive that data. And because it's in the middle of an animation, you're going to see a flash, you're going to see a glitch, and obviously, that's a very bad user experience. Yeah, basically, like if you're class like a repository and you created a field that's an instance of live data, you're probably doing it wrong. Yeah, the solution obviously is to create a live data every time. It's very lightweight. You're not going to save much by avoiding this. The third item is about where and when to create your transformations. And this is all about wiring. It's similar to when you create a, a circuit. You lay down your components, and you wire everything up. And for a known set of inputs, you're going to have a known set of outputs. But you don't unplug a wire while it's in operation and plug it somewhere else, right? This is exactly what this view model is doing. Lots of horrible things happening in this view model, by the way. <laughs> for, st for starters. We should, we should have like a don't do this in these slides. It Otherwise, says don't do this, will... literally. That was... OK. Because <laughs> <laughs> actually, someone will copy past it and then blame us for recommending it. 
that's the standard way of doing it. So first, it's exposing item data, which is a variable. It's not a val, it's a var. And also, it's exposing a mutable live data. Almost, you should almost never do this. Uh, Two-way data binding is the exception to this, maybe. Uh, you should always expose something that is immutable so that our, uh, your observers can't change it. So after subscription, we call load data from our activity to set the ID of the thing that we want to load. And then we are reassigning item data to something new. But the subscription already happened. So the observer is not going to know that you made this reassignment. Yeah. The then, solution. Like, actually, even if you're returning the live data there, uh, and your observer is resubscribing to the new live data, now it is subscribed to the previous one and the new one because you never removed the subscription. So the solution to this requires a little bit of, a little bit of plumbing. We have two live data. One is mutable, and it's private to this view model. And the other one is the one that is exposed uh, to the view from the view model. And it is a transformation switch map. The source of this switch map is that mutable live data. So that every time item ID changes, then the transformation function is going to be called, and data source, which returns the live data, is going to be called with the appropriate ID. After the subscription to this item data has happened, uh, we call load data, we pass the string. This ID might come from an intent in the activity or whatever. And then when we set the value, then it triggers an update, and everything is going to work as you expect it to work. OK, so if you would like to think that live data is awesome and it solves all the problems, it doesn't. Uh, it's designed for a very specific use case. and. Uh, we see people trying to use it in other areas, and they, they struggle with it. So I want to make it clear. If you're writing an application that has lots of like, operators and streams, you totally bought into this reactive uh, idea, just use RxJava. Like, don't try to add like, a million transformations on top of live data to make it work. It's not designed for that. Uh, just go learn Rx. Uh, if you have things that are not related to a lifecycle or a UI, let's say you are trying to synchronize the user's location to your backend service. Uh, there is no UI there. There is no lifecycle there. Like, there is no reason to use live data for something like that. Either use a callback, or if you're using RxJava, that will still work. Another use case is having these like, one-shot operations. Uh, like mentioned, we have, now you fetch some data, and then you convert it. You write into your database, load back, and return it. Uh, for those things, if you are using Kotlin, core routines are actually like a really new, new exciting area. Uh, again, you might use Guava Concurrent, or you can use RxJava, but don't use live data because we didn't design it for that. Live data works very well as the last layer for your UI. It's perfectly OK. It is like kind of the best solution. But if you try to scale it, it's just not going to work. Uh, so many things we mentioned in this talk, actually Jose has blog posts on the Android developers medium publishing. Uh, you can go read them. Uh, check out our samples on GitHub. We have simple usages of live data as well as like a complete application, the GitHub browser sample with like using room, has like multiple data sources, transformations. And also you can look at the source code for IS scheduler app, which is the same app in Dev Summit. And if it has bugs, you can blame this guy. You wrote it. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, I hope this was useful. And we will be in the around. area like around after the talks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. See you. Okay. okay. Uh, we will start. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> okay. Welcome, everybody. I'm still Yeet Boyar from the talk. It <laughs> hasn't changed. Uh, but this guy is new. Who are you? 
Hey, <laughs> I'm Daniel Santiago, and I also I work for the Android Toolkit team, it's mainly on Room. Okay, so today we are going to talk about Room, uh, but before we, I don't think my clicker is working. Nope. Working on it, guys. All right. Sorry. All right. Uh, yes, it started working. Now I'm trying to go back. Okay. Now, yes. All cool. Uh, so why do we want Room, or why did we even write Room? So we ask people to write offline-ready applications. We want your application to work without a network connection. But if you don't have a proper model inside your application, it's pretty much impossible to write a good offline experience. So for that reason, you do need a database. Luckily, on Android, we have SQLite. And SQLite is a really, really awesome technology. It's very fast, and when you need to optimize it for your use case, it's very easy to do so. It's a very powerful query language. You can express many different things and make it concise and easily grab the data. It's the biggest advantage compared to other object stores or key value stores. And SQLite also scales very well. I mean, for an application, you probably won't have much data, but you can have multiple gigabytes of data, and SQLite will be just fine. And as companies using it on the back end, so for your like, scalability data size needs, SQLite will be perfect. Now, SQLite on Android was not that cool. Uh, you need to write out of boilerplate code to convert between your Java and Kotlin objects and your SQLite. Uh, there is no compile time safety. So if you are building an SQL query and you forget like a one comma if case, you're going to get a runtime crash. And it's very hard to test all those cases. Uh, you can also cannot observe what has changed. Now, we want people to write reactive applications or reactive UIs. And if you cannot observe your data model, it's kind of hard. You have to build it yourself. Uh, so we build it for you. So like, around two years ago, we ship room. We introduced the compile time safety. We introduced observability. And we introduced a strong IDE integration. As you can notice, with, like, with room, with navigation, this is a big thing for us. We want to develop libraries together with Android Studio to provide a nice user experience. Then this year's I.O., we introduced write ahead logging, which speed up SQLite a lot. And we also introduced support for paging so that you can have very large data sets, queries, and you can easily load them into a recycler view. 2.0 release is just our conversion from Android support to Android X. And we kept it the same as 1.1 so that you can have an easy migration. And 2.1 is what we're going to talk about today. And this is actually kind of the Excel 2.0. Uh, it's a very large release. We have like full text search, views, multi-instance validation, auto value, and more Rx stuff. So let's talk about them. Sweet. One of the pretty cool new features we added in 2.1, it's full text search, or FTS. And FTS is basically a way to index text documents and make them searchable. Let's take, a look. Let's take a look at an example. Imagine we have a music app, and we want to add search functionality to it. You know, you have a search box, you want to type something, and you want to be able to find songs uh, within that music app. If we have room, you know, we express, we store this song data in a table. That's an entity. Um, conveniently, we have our label as an embedded object. And our song labels, you know, what's the song name, the album name, and artist name, this is kind of like what we want to search and make the index. If we were to do this, Without FTS right now, you know we need to write a query, um, and basically, you have to use the like operator. Um, this is not very good; it's very limited. That percentage sign is kind of like a wild card, and this basically causes a full table scan. Yeah, like even if you index that query column in the database, SQLite will not be able to use that index because the index only works if you are doing a prefix search. Uh, which is not what you want to do here. Yeah, so don't do this. Um, <laughs> moreover, if you try to actually search across album on artists, you have to expand this query. And this, as you can see, doesn't, doesn't easily scale. FTS helps us with this situation because it, create, it now creates a virtual table. And 
all the, all the columns are indexed. And to use FTS, you just now annotate your entity with FTS. Now in your query, instead of using like, you would use match, which is a different operator. And as you can see here, we use where song. So we're using the same table name uh, as our column in our where statement. And that basically tells the match operation that you want to search across all those labels. So this helps us with searching across artists and album if you have an omnibox. Uh, you might say, oh, then I can use FTS on all of my tables if I have any string, but not quite. So using FTS uh, consumes more disk space. And the reason is because when you create an FTS table, you actually create a virtual table. And that's backed by a few tables where your content is and a lot of the indexing information. This is known as shadow tables. When you actually query from your virtual table, the information actually comes from these tables. There's also a few drawbacks also to FTS. Uh, you cannot have foreign keys on your entity or, com or compose primary keys. Um, but there's one pretty neat feature, which is external content. Um, let's, going back to our song entity, if we wanted to instead use our real table and create a second table for only our labels, we just basically use that FTS annotation. But we tell it, hey, my data is actually going to be stored in this other real table that I already have. Um, conveniently, this new data class and new virtual table only has the labels. So in the previous example, everything was indexed. So even the URL, which is not quite what we wanted to index. In this case, we only have the labels. What happens now is, is we have a virtual table in front of it that's on FTS, and behind it, it has the same shadow tables for the indexing, but it, the actual content is stored in the original song table that we had. This is way better. Um, in saving this space, and it's a little bit more flexible. To query this external content, this FTS table with external content, you do have to query from the virtual table, and then you would do a join because we want to get the songs, and then similarly, you would still use match. One thing, though, is that because these are two different tables, when you insert into the song table, things are not actually inserted into the virtual table, FTS table, which means your indexes doesn't get updated, so you have to do that yourself. But you know, we don't want you doing this. Uh, we might not, we wanna make it easy. So when you use Room, Room will actually create triggers for you to keep these two things in sync. Okay. That's pretty cool. Right. Uh, another important feature we have added is support for database views. <clears throat> so. Let's go back to our song and album example. We have songs and they have albums, and a song might be in multiple albums, so we have a junction table that associates the songs with the albums. Uh, now, this is so cool, so let's say you want to fetch a listing, right? You want to have the album name and all the songs in it as a list. Uh, okay, cool, we just write a, we have the listing class, and we write a query and fetch from that junction table. Unfortunately, you cannot do this because that table doesn't have the song's name or the album's title. You kind of need to write a query like this, where you fetch from that table and join it with the song and album table, and then you can return your listing data. Now, this is actually cool. SQLite is powerful that you can express this, but if you find yourself keep writing these things, it's kind of like lots of boilerplate, like things you need to keep in your mind. Wouldn't it be cool if you could just have a table that has the song and the album together without you duplicating the data into that table and the songs and the album tables? And this is where database views come into place. So you basically write the query that defines album and song together as a query. Uh, you annotate an entity with a database view. So you're saying that this is like a view to this database. Uh, and in that POJO, this is the same room rule. So you can have any POJO with the embedded fields or whatnot. Uh, once you declare it and uh, add it to your room database, uh, so we have that declaration. If you try to rewrite the previous query, you can just get rid of all the join and instead select from that table. Well, we are selecting from a view that table doesn't exist. But for the all intents and purposes of querying, that's a table. Uh, and now it's much, much more simpler. Because I say it's like a table, you can also return that POJO. Or you can even return a live data. Because we know how that view is constructed, 
we know when the value might change, so you can get a live data of it. You can run queries. Like you can pretty much do everything you can do with a table, except you cannot do inserts and updates because there is no backing data. But you can have views inside other views. Like all that stuff works. So this makes it much nicer to write queries, and it also allows you to logically uh, address your data. Another important feature we have added is support for multiple instances. So let's say we are writing the application. So we have a playlist, all the songs, and we have a sync service that goes to our backend, pulls the new updates for my playlist, and writes them into a database. When you are using Room, if the sync service updates the database, it automatically updates the UI. And this is a super cool feature, because you write these two components absolutely independent of each other. They don't know about each other. They have the database as a sync point. This works perfectly. But then your startup is successful, you grow your team, your application is bloated, so you decide to move that synchronization into a background process. Now, when it's running in a different process, it pulls the song, writes it into the database, and your UI has no idea. It doesn't know the database has changed, because it only knows that database has changed if the same room instance is the one making the update, so we can fake it, because we don't get that information from SQLite. There's something room tracks. Uh, now, with Room 2.1, you can enable multi-instance invalidation when you build the Room instance, uh, which, will look, which will look for other instances of Room that are accessing the same database. Once you do that, now your background process service can update the database, and all instances of Room will update automatically. Now, we don't do this. This, this is off by default, because we need to create a service. There's some IPC involved. It's not a big cost, but it is a cost that most people don't need. So you need to enable this flag to take advantage of this feature. Another feature we added, which was actually requested by the community, was auto value support. You know, if you're using Kotlin, you don't have to worry about this because you have data classes. But if you're still in Java world, then you might want to have, you might be using auto value because you want Java immutable objects. Well, Room now can understand these auto value annotated objects. Um, if, you, if you know a little bit about auto-value, you basically have an abstract class, and you annotate it with auto-value. But now, you can also annotate that same abstract class with app entity, and Room will be able to discover that you want to make a backing SQLite table for it. In auto-value, instead of having fields, you have abstract getters. These can now be annotated with Room annotations to declare primary key, column information, and things like that. The only caveat, though, is that you do have to also add Auto values copy annotation, and this is uh, this is the annotation that basically makes these two tools work together. By the way, to support this, so normally these annotations were only limited to fields, and we needed to extend it to let you put them on those abstract methods. But it only works if you are using auto value. If you are not using auto value, we are not going to let it compile. Yep. Similarly, if you were writing a normal data class, you would have a constructor with the fields. In audio value world, you still need that factory method. And Rule will be able to discover this to create your auto value class. Um, and then using it is you would use it as any other data class. You would use the abstract class that you declare. Another highly requested feature <laughs> that has been working for. <laughs> We decided that has been requested for a while, and we finally got it. Is you know, more Rx. So now you can actually have a sync return types completable single and maybe in methods annotated with insert, update, and delete. So you know we listen when you when you request stuff. You know we listen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this this is actually uh, yeah it's only available in Rx. That's interesting. Might be available in other other type of async. Like coroutines, Kotlin's, maybe, maybe. Yeah, please. Uh, so, so Room 2.1 is a really big release. Like the full text search, the database views, and when we <clears throat> decided which features to work on, we are basically relying on your feedback. Like these are literally like I, I personally objected that allowing completed land stuff in those like insert queries for a long time, and I gave up because people really wanted it and. This is our development philosophy. We basically look at what the community is doing, how are they using it, what do they want, and implement them. Uh, so please, like, 
try to use 2.1. It's a very big release, and we want to just like uh, ship it as stable as soon as possible. And we need your feedback. We basically look at the number of apps shipping with Room and see how they are using. We we'll look for the incoming bugs. I look mean, we don't really have bugs, but sometimes no use, bugs. No look bugs. for incoming user errors. Uh, <laughs> try to fix them. And now we try to ship. So uh, please work with us. And we'll try to wrap it up and ship it. And also, please let us know what other features you want in Room so that we can implement them. All right, thanks a lot for coming to this talk. I hope it was useful. Thank you. And we will be in the sandbox area after the talk. Thank you. Everyone, our next session in this room will begin in 10 minutes. Thanks.
Welcome everyone, welcome back. Our next session will get underway in about two minutes and we remind you as a courtesy to the presenters to please mute your mobile devices. We thank you and we'll be getting underway in just about two minutes. Everyone, welcome to our lightning round, and uh, this is where we try to smash an incredible amount of content into only 40 minutes. And what's great about these sessions is these are a lot of things that we might not have the opportunity to present a full-length session for you at a place like I.O. So this is going to be really, really fun. We have an incredibly distinguished set of speakers, and I'm going to talk really fast and get off of here really quickly. You'll he if you hear a gong, it means that someone has gone over their, their five minutes, and, uh, and, we need to, and we need to move on. So we're going to try to move this really, really quickly, and it, it's going to be great. So stay tuned. And our, our first talk is going to be about JNI. So so please welcome Ellie Hughes. <laughs> Hey, uh, my name's Elliot Hughes. I've worked on Android for a while now. And actually, my first job on Android was uh, working on the Java core libraries and actually cleaning up some of the bugs in our JNI. Um, so, oops. Right. So first off, I'll show you uh, what you're probably expecting to see when you think JNI which is code that looks like this. Um, and I, I'm guessing no one can tell that the code that actually does anything useful isn't on that screen yet. And I'm guessing that no one can tell me within five seconds where the useful line in that either is. So like this, this, is, this talk is basically how to not do that. How do we get away from that? Uh, and the, the one line answer is use C++ better. Um, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're using the C APIs, uh, which is what most people do, um, it's really tricky. You end up with the sort of go-to fail style, or you have the sort of nested if style that we had there. Um, and there are a lot of special cases as well, like, you know, I'm trying to throw an exception, but there's already an exception pending. What do I do there? How do I chain that to be uh, the cause of the previous exception? So don't write that in every single JNI method. Write that once. Uh, and in particular, have classes that let you uh, use a string as a string, like, you know, use a J string as if it's a, a stud string. Uh, similar for arrays, you don't want to be having to deal with like a J byte array when you could just use operator square brackets to just use it like a normal array. Um, local references too, and there's, there's, a, there's a long list of other things, but the strings and primitive arrays, uh, I think, are the two major ones. Most of the benefit you get is from that. Um, exceptions. Harder than they look, and the, the sort of raw primitives you get in JNI are not super useful. Um, the, they expect you to find the class yourself. They expect you to create an instance. Uh, if, you, if you want to uh, actually include a proper detail message or a, or a cause, you end up doing weird things like, uh, you know, I need to find the constructor for, my, for this exception, and then I need to uh, invoke the constructor, blah, blah, blah. It's a lot of code, especially if you deal with the special cases. So having a function that just takes a printf style format string is a huge relief. Um, and uh, right. Uh, so I've been talking about this kind of in the abstract. I've been saying you should do these things. 
Um, there are many choices that you can use for this. Uh, and I think a problem a lot of people have is they get hung up on, like, what's the exact perfect way to do this? What's the best? It doesn't matter. Any of these are better than writing the kind of code that we saw on the first couple of slides. Android itself uses libnative helper, which you can find in AOSP. It's in the root directory. Uh, there's a bunch of header-only stuff for doing the things that I've been talking about. Um, or if you don't like any of the others on the internet, you can just write your own. They're, they're really not that hard. So what does it look like if you actually do switch to using something like this? This is the same code. This is the same two slides that we had before, uh, now condensed to one. I think five seconds is plenty of time for you to actually see uh, which is the line that actually does the work there. Um, you can make this shorter. Um, you don't actually need to have the style where we, we have the uh, constructors and then we check, like, did that actually work? Um, if you're prepared to use C++ exceptions and do some kind of transformation. But that's kind of a more advanced topic. I think this gets you 90% of the benefit for like 20% of the effort. So this, this, is, this is what Android does internally. This is actually what the code looks like in Android for that call. Um, so uh, that was a really simple thing, where there really was just one line of active ingredient in there. But this scales really well. Uh, and our recommendation is that you actually you, you try to keep your code like that. So don't mix all the JNI boilerplate stuff in with your actual code. Keep those separate in the same way that you wouldn't, you know, if on the other end of the spectrum, if you, you wouldn't sort of mix your, your business logic and your UI rendering stuff. Down here, it's, it's similar sort of advice. Don't do that. Um, uh, and it, again, if you want a, a good example of this, the Android System OS class is implemented exactly this way, that the, the implementation is super repetitive, really boring, and that's the way we like it. It's hard to make mistakes. Um, I'm running out of time, so I'll just go through this very quickly. If, you're, if you need to um, worry about old Android releases uh, and you have multiple SO files, that can get very tricky. We recommend that you consider the Relinker project. Uh, you can find that on GitHub. Um, the storing SO files uncompressed, that was mentioned earlier in the keynote. Uh, one big library is generally better than lots of small libraries. Um, thank you. Uh, if you have questions, uh, come and find me. I'll be, in, I'll be doing open hours all afternoon. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Wojtek. Uh, and I wanted to share with you a short story about my experience with the new Kotlin multi-platform projects in Kotlin 1.3. So when we come to these conferences, talk about Android, talk about running Kotlin on Android for making Android apps, what we really um, mean is Kotlin JVM. Um, that's the Kotlin that we know that gets compiled to Java byte code. And then you know, we can transform it into DEX files, run it on Android. But it can also run on cloud servers, on our desktops, and so on. Now, there are two more flavors of Kotlin, actually, or compilation targets. Uh, first one, Kotlin.js, uh, for running uh, JavaScript in a web browser environment, or even something like Cloud Functions or Node.js. And then there's Kotlin Native, which compiles down to machine code in you know, native libraries that can run or target various platforms, such as iOS, desktop apps, even WebAssembly, and even Android. So how do we actually get started with this? So Kotlin 1.3 introduces a new project structure and a new plugin that's called Kotlin Multiplatform. And if you apply that to any of your modules, you can then um, select from a, preset, um, from a set of presets to target any of these platforms. So here, for example, I'm targeting an Android library and a JS target. Now, when you add these to your module, um, it automatically creates source sets for each of these platform-specific Kotlin files. So if you put your Kotlin files in the JS main folder, they will get com compiled or transpiled to JavaScript files. Now, what do I mean by Kotlin specific, um, uh, sorry, platform specific Kotlin? Now, if you go and browse the documentation, the reference pages for each of the Kotlin packages, and you mouse over um, any of them, in the top right, you will see these multicolored chips that tell you which compilation target this library is available on. So here, on, for example, the Kotlin browser package uh, that lets you access interfaces for document and window from the web browser environment probably only makes sense on a JS target, and that's, that's um, uh, how it is. Now, fortunately, many, many of the core libraries and functions are available across all the compilation targets. In fact, you can see a fourth one, um, Kotlin Common, which means this is a pure Kotlin library that can run uh, independent of any platform that's um, targeting. Um, and in fact, if you add a multi-platform plugin to your project, 
uh, along with the platform-specific source set, you also get a common source set where you can put platform-independent code. Now, the thing about platform-independent code is it cannot call any of the platform APIs. It cannot call any of the JS-specific or Android-specific um, APIs. The other way, of course, works. You can have your platform-specific code from any of the flavors depend on a shared common library or source set. So knowing all that, I set out to write an example app just to learn about Kotlin multiplatform, and I decided to make a small Sudoku game. Um, now, one thing I have to say about Kotlin multiplatform is it's not a toolkit that lets you write an app once and run it everywhere. I still need to create an Android app with Android-specific code, just like I normally would, and then a web page uh, with some JavaScript code just to like, initialize things like entry points to my app, lifecycle UI, and so on. But then what I do is all my shared business logic, so in my case, it's the Sudoku engine that solves and generates Sudoku boards for me, um, I take it out and put it in a shared library using Kotlin Common. And in fact, um, the only source set I have in this uh, library is Common Main, so I put all my code there, and that means it's available across all the platforms that I choose to target. OK, but then I thought, uh, OK, I have this core engine for solving my Sudoku code, but I would also like to draw the board on the screen. And uh, why code it for each platform separately if it should look the same on, on each of them? So I thought, wouldn't it be nice if I had an API for drawing on the screen that's completely platform independent, something like a multi-platform canvas? But then what I want to do is I want to actually um, have it delegate to each of the platform's imp implementations. So I want to use the Android canvas to draw on Android, while um, I use the HTML canvas to draw on a website. The thing is, I just told you that Kotlin common code cannot call any platform interfaces. Uh, so I can't really depend on these and export them from, from this module. So how does it, uh, does it work in Kotlin? Well, there's this, this expect an actual mechanism that lets you declare expected classes in your common code, which is something like almost like defining an interface in Java. And then in each of my platform-specific um, uh, source sets, I provide the actual implementation that can depend and use platform APIs, such as uh, the Android Canvas. Now, when I add that dependency from my common source set to the other one, it looks something like this. Um, but actually, when compiling for a specific platform, such as JS, um, this dependency will actually use the correct HTML5 Canvas. <laughs> OK, if I could just show the link to the project so that everyone can um, look at it, that would be great. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, everyone. My name is Nick Butcher. I'm a designer and engineer at Google, and I'm also a vector addict. And I've got five minutes to tell you some about, about some of the advanced features that vector drawables Android's vector format supports. So let's get started. So I posit that most assets in your application should be vectors these days. Um, vectors are awesome. They're sharp on every single density display. Um, they're very small. They compress well, so they don't blow your APK. Uh, but they're also extremely flexible. And I want to talk about this a bit today so you can get the most out of vectors to um, realize these benefits as widely as possible. So most vectors in your app probably look something like this. They have some paths, and they're probably hard coding a color, um, something like this fill or stroke here. Maybe you're using a color resource like this. Um, but there's actually a lot more you can do here, which I want to talk about. Um, the first thing is using theme colors. So you can use theme colors in two ways, really. The first is by applying a theme color as a tint. Um, this will tint the entire drawable um, based on the current theme. So here I'm using the theme attribute color control normal, which is the normal color for icons. Uh, and as such, you can have one single asset which displays in different um, themes, say a light screen or a dark screen, and it gets tinted to be the right color. You no longer have to worry what color asset you got from your designers in the SVG, um, that they got exactly the right shade of gray that you need. Um, it will be tinted at runtime, so it is always correct. You can also use theme colors um, directly in the fill or stroke. So in this example here, I'm going to use color primary. So say you have different screens in your app, like say a sports app, which uses um, a theme for a given team. Um, you can reference that theme color. So you can have a single drawable, which just parts of it get colored based on the theme, which can be useful. 
Cool, that was theme colors. Next up, color state lists. So vectors support um, referencing color state lists. You can do some fun stuff. So in this example, um, on a press state, we're changing color. Or perhaps you have a list app um, where when a row item is selected, you could have changed the rendering using, um, using that state. You could do this with a normal state list drawable and two drawables and flip between them. Um, but if, say, the rendering is like 99% the same, you just want to change like the stroke here, this saves some duplication. Um, you define it like this, like a regular color state list in your um, color resources, and refer to it as you would like a color resource. And last, my favorite feature is gradients. Um, so vectors support three different types of gradients, uh, linear, radial, and sweep, which you define like this. Uh, so a linear gradient has a start and end x, y coordinate. A radial has a center and a radius. And a sweep just has a center point. I've so far been using these um, shorthand of start, end, or even center colors to define gradients. But you can actually get much more fine-grained and embed these item tags inside it to define individual color stops. So here I'm going for a specific color at 72% of the way through. Like color state lists, you define gradients in a color resource directory, or you can use the inline resource syntax to embed it inside the vector definition itself. And at build time, AAPT will actually extract that to a color resource and insert a reference to it for you, which is handy. So gradients have been super handy in building apps. Like here's an illustration from a former year's I.O. app, which um, if we'd made it as a gradient would be, with gradient support, would have been um, one fifth the size of the uh, RAS that we had to ship and sharp everywhere. It's really useful for things like um, adaptive icons, because unfortunately vectors don't support um, drop shadows, but you can fake it a lot of the time using gradients. Or if you need to build something like a customized spinner, this is really trivial to achieve using a, a radial uh, gradient. So gradients only support. Um, certain shapes, like this linear, radial, and sweep. But um, paths and vectors can be transformed, like rotated and so on. Um, so in this example, I wanted to create this oval-shaped shadow beneath the, beneath the jetpack droid. Um, so I did this by drawing a circle um, with a radial gradient, and then using the scale Y feature to transform it to produce the effect that I was after. If the gradient you define doesn't fill the entire shape you're drawing to, you can use the tile mode to control how it fills the rest of the area. So in this example, um, the default mode of clamp, it just continues the color outwards. If you use a repeat mode, it will repeat between the gradient, going back and um, continuing it. Uh, or a, a mirror mode will go back and forth through the gradient. You can also um, use gradients which don't go through different colors. So by using um, the same color between two stops and having the next stop start at the same point, you can have these solid, solid color blocks. Like, why would you want a gradient that doesn't do that? Well, you can have some fun with some pretty cool effects. So this example of a rainbow is a, with one single shape using a radial gradient with these solid color stops. Um, you can do like something like a loading spinner, or you can combine it with the tile mode to make some kind of um, pattern support. So this is the gradient over this area, and the, pat the tile mode repeats it to give you a pattern. And you can have some fun doing something like animating it to produce this kind of loading effect. So hopefully I've shown you that vectors are sharp, small, and extremely flexible, so you can use them um, everywhere. As a final example, I want to show you what you can build. This is a single um, animated vector drawable uh, drawn by um, the amazing uh, Virginia Poltrack, and I had the pleasure of animating it. Um, so this is like one vector drawable, extremely small, extremely sharp on every display. You can have some fun with them. So that's vector drawables. Thanks very much. <laughs>
And, uh, and again, thank you all. I know many of you traveled to be here. How, how many of you traveled from, uh, let's say, more than 1,000 miles to be here, just by show of hands? Wow. All right. That's amazing. We're almost there, I think. All right, hold on. We're having technical difficulties. <laughs> yeah. Are we ready? All right, excellent. Let's, let's do this. Level up with data binding. All right, so when data binding was introduced back in 2015, and I can't read anything, so I'll just do it from here, my reaction was pretty much, what have we done? Like expressions inside of XML values, this is kind of nuts. But as it turns out, data binding is pretty cool, and I just needed to level up my understanding. And the one thing I love about data binding is you can actually choose how much you want it to use. So it's kind of the beginner level. You get you know, some immediate benefits, like avoiding find view by ID, but that's a start. At the intermediate level, you actually get things like custom binding adapters and observability, while at the expert level, we actually have two-way data binding. And this also allows you to apply observability not only from data to UI, but also from UI to data. So first of all, let's get rid of find view by ID. Um, ex exactly. So first, we, just, we need to enable data binding. Now, all you have to do to do this is actually set data binding enabled equals true in your Gradle file. And then you need to put these little layout wrappers around your file. Um, and you can actually do that in Android Studio automatically now by using by pulling down from the little light bulb icon and saying convert to data binding layout, which is pretty cool. Now, the binding is actually this object you get from inflating the layout with data binding util. And you simply set your attributes and listeners like this, which is pretty cool. But honestly, you're never going to use this because you're actually going to want to use real data binding. Um, so let's talk about binding expressions. And in order to do this, we actually have to make data available to our layout by declaring variables in this data section of our layout. Um, and then we can use expressions in layout XML attributes um, to actually tie that data to views. Now, expressions are actually wrapped in curly braces and prefixed by an at sign. So here are some examples of data binding expressions. Like in this first one, we're assigning a text property to a view model property. In the second one, we're using a custom attribute, height if zero. And in the third one, we're actually using a lambda, which, calls, which gets past the text view and calls on like. And in this fourth one, we're actually using a lambda, which calls on like with a text property of another view in our layout. So you can actually reference other views and pass them in, which is pretty cool. Now, to give data binding access to the view model instance, we just set the binding object like this after inflating the layout. So, pr so pretty straightforward. And um, then our view model is now available to that layout. But the real question is, how does this all work? And, and the answer, of course, is that there is no magic in data binding. Um, but it does seem like magic, and that's because we have built-in binding adapters that handle almost everything. So with data binding, every call to the framework is actually made in a binding adapter. Um, there's no magic. You can actually see the code and use a debugger to navigate through it. The first lines of the method are just checking for changes to only update the UI if necessary. And that last line is actually the set text we're looking for. And there's lots of adapters provided by data binding, and they make it behave intelligently and consistently across all these views. Now, looking at these source files will help to build your own custom binding adapters, which is really how things start to get exciting. So let's talk about binding adapters 101. The adapter is annotated with at binding adapter and takes one or more attribute names. The adapter method takes a view as the first parameter, and you use a subclass of view to restrict it to a specific view type. Any additional parameters are then matched with the data type of the binding expressions. Now, they can just di uh, adapters can differ just by data types. So you can also use adapters to override the behavior for built-in attributes. Now, this makes all image views load using Glide with their source parameters set. But you've got to be careful with this, because this is module global. So you might have some really cool uh, side effects of this you might not expect. Um, we also can do a bunch of stuff with advanced binding adapters. So like sometimes that old value is really important, such as with a color change listener. So if you use the same parameter type for two parameters in a row, the binding compiler will actually pass the old value into the first one, followed by the updated one. And um, also, you can use multiple attributes, which is pretty cool, like in this image view. So you can actually define these multiple attributes here in, when you declare the binding adapter. And then those are both available to, to your code, actually, as you're looking at it. Now, observability is also pretty cool. Um, and we can actually use live data um, to automatically do observation. Um, so this is pretty cool. Uh, we're actually only exposing an immutable class here with an example of this. And the backing field can either be immutable or mediator live data. And then you just expose a live data using Kotlin's getter syntax. And, um, the, and then you need to do one more additional change. You actually need to set the lifecycle owner. So you can observe the live data in your view model with the correct scope. All right, finally, two-way data binding. And honestly, this is really trivial when you're actually using live data. 
Um, now, you could, of course, use one-way data binding two ways, as in this example uh, of checkbox. But you can actually just use two call this uh, with two-way data binding by using at equals. And the best part of this is we can actually observe live data. So in this case, it's fine to expose immutable live data since it can be modified by our view. And then we set the lifecycle owner, and we use the at, at equals notation for the checkbox, and that's it, two-way data binding. Maybe that's not so expert after all. So to learn more, check out the data binding code lab and the documentation on developer.android.com. All right. There you go. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Carmen, and I'm on the Android performance team. And today, I'm going to show you some examples of analyzing performance using SysTrace. Before I do, uh, I want to remind you that your app is not an island. It's running on top of several layers, you know, the phone hardware, the Android framework, libraries that you're incorporating, A-B tests. So you might think you know what your code is doing, but the reality might actually surprise you. And this is where SysTrace comes in. So SysTrace is a tool that lets you collect precise timing information about what's going on on your device and then visualize it. It records down to the individual CPU time slice. On the Android performance team, it's the most important tool we have for debugging performance issues. Tim Murray and I have given some talks about how to use SysTrace in the past. And if you want to know more about that, uh, Google for his I.O. talk. But today, I'm going to focus on showing you what kind of issues you can find in your app when you use SysTrace. So I took traces of three apps that I don't work on, but I could still quickly find potential improvements to their startup time. So let's jump in. With the first app, uh, when I look at the trace, uh, three different activity starts jumped out at me right away. Uh, there are a lot of reasons to use trampoline activities. Um, I see them a lot when developers are trying to show a splash screen or do a permissions check, something like that. But they definitely impact your launch time. And depending on what you're trying to do, there might be a better way. So if you're trying to make a splash screen, you could set up a special launch theme. Or for permissions, you could refactor your code so that you only open the separate activity if you need to. I don't know why this app has these activities, and maybe they are critical. But if they don't, that's a 160 millisecond opportunity. In the same app, I also browse through the names of the views being inflated by this app. Uh, based on the name of this highlighted view in the second row, it looks like it's a drawer view. Drawer views are always a bit of a conundrum, because they often have a lot of child views, and they take a long time to inflate. But sometimes we need them immediately for UX reasons. If this app can pull this inflate out of the critical path of startup, they could save 42 more milliseconds. So this second app is following the pattern for app startups that I would expect. In the top level, there's no extra activities or services being started. I dug in a little more, clicked on the views that were being inflated, and the names of the widgets that I could see matched up with uh, what was visible when the app started. So far, so good. But then I saw this gap in activity inside bind application that takes up 30 milliseconds. When I click on that trace point, I'll see that it's monitor contention, and I get more information. So monitor contention is another way of saying lock contention, where the owner of the lock is the thread pool3 thread1. So that's in the top row. And so I scrolled down, and I did, in fact, see activity in pool3 thread1 during this time. And then it's given me a pointer to the stack. So I wasn't familiar with Realm, so I looked it up, and it's like a mobile database library like SQL. So the function names kind of make sense here. Um, and this one may or may not be something that you can fix as an app developer, because you might need to coordinate with the Realm library. But if you had a monitor contention between two threads that you wrote in your same app, uh, it would look the same. Either way, this is another potential 30 millisecond opportunity for this app where they could get a startup improvement by resolving the slot contention. In this app, there are two activities being started. But there's another potential improvement here, too. You see that I included the thread name over on the left on the screenshot. This is the UI thread. So if we scroll down and see what's going on in the other threads in this app, we can see these background threads running, uh, CPU 0, CPU 1, CPU 2. And it's awesome that the app developers made background threads to do some of their work. But there's a potential performance issue here that jumps out at me as well, which is that these background threads are doing a lot of blocking I.O. So that's the orange sections in the CPU activity bars on the trace. They're kind of hard to see. So you can see there's some I.O. happening on all three of these threads. Now, it turns out that on a lot of devices, we have to be concerned about I.O. contention. There's not necessarily more than one I.O. channel to use to access the disk at once. So these background threads may actually be slowing down the I.O. requests from the UI thread. So that section is highlighted down below. We scroll up. We see the busy 410 milliseconds it overlaps with these activity starts. By viewing the thread time slices in aggregate, we can see that in this section, we spend 107 milliseconds in blocking I.O. 
we could potentially shorten this amount of time significantly if we move that background activity to overlap with something else. All I needed to do to collect these traces was to clone the catapult git repo and run this systrace command. You can just open the output HTML file in your browser and see everything that I showed you today. And this barely scratches the surface of what you can do with systrace. I was able to identify these potential opportunities in apps I don't work on using only the trace points provided by the system. When you look at a trace of your own app with the expertise you already have, it's going to make 100 times more sense to you. Um, and you can even add your own trace points inside your app code so you can see the context of what's running in your app from within the trace. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Hope you've been enjoying the day one of the summit so far. I'm Parul Soy. I'm part of the Google Play team. And I'm Seb on the Android framework team. Before we head out to lunch, we just want to take a few minutes to talk to you about something pretty important. Privacy. Specifically, we want to talk to you about certain practices that you as app developers can adopt to build products that continue to wow your users at the same time protect their right to privacy. We want Android to be a platform where you can offer personalized experiences and make the life of your users simple, but at the same time, Privacy is important, and transparency in terms of what data you're collecting and how you're using it is very important to be shared. So to ensure Android can continue to serve as a platform that allows developers to build such experiences and protect users, we have ongoing efforts that span multiple releases. So the themes we want to touch upon today are how your apps are accessing user data, ensuring that your users have control over the data being accessed, and most importantly, that there is transparency into why the data is required and how it is being used. So we have a multi-layered approach to privacy in Android. Firstly, we focus on platform updates to improve the APIs that are used by apps to access personal information. We then set up our play policies for keeping abuse in check and also ensuring that a level playing field is provided to the developers and a safe experience for our users. We've built out a technological layer to identify early on when apps may be abusing a user's personal information. We also have human reviewers, so it's not just bots and AI, but actual people who review these apps to make sure that the user's right to privacy is, is, always, is always secured and also ensure that the safe experience is provided. We also invest heavily in secure, to work with a community of security researchers Please do check out these programs. We have the Play Security Rewards Program and Vulnerability Rewards Programs. And also, please feel free to drop by if you want to know more about these. And finally, we have Google Play Protect, which helps, you, which helps users um, conserve their privacy and security. Doing that, sorry. Nice. <laughs> so why are we here speaking to you today? Because we feel privacy and security is a partnership between the platform and developers as you. You as developers who actually build out these apps play a very vital role in the ecosystem. You have the ability to advocate for better privacy practices in your company and ways to ensure that the team's vision of your product is not compromised at the right of users' privacy. For example, if you have a request to, sort, to collect certain bit of information about a user from their device, a question always worth asking is, do we really need it? How do you plan to use it and are we still using it in the instances of historical data collection? The reason is that it is actually not very uncommon for certain information about a user to be collected in guise of behavioral analytics, which is actually never used and is sometimes abandoned altogether. So some examples of data that we've seen being collected includes IMEI, used as a unique identifier for tracking users, the list of installed apps, either to fingerprint a user or to target ads to them, uh, collecting the location of an app open, or cellular net network information, such as the name of a network or the strength. You probably don't always need such information. So for a few cases, we offer more privacy-conscious options, so we encourage you to use them if they fit your use case. Some examples include, we encourage you to use Instance or Android ID instead of hardware identifiers, such as IMEI. If you're trying to confirm a user's phone number, 
we encourage you to use the Play SMS Retriever API instead of the SMS permission, which is not as granular. Um, you could also consider only requesting course location instead of phone find location. And then, if you want to see if the user is in the call, you could check for the audio focus rather than requesting the read phone state, which gives out a lot more data. And lastly, you want to ensure that your users are aware of what data is being collected and how it is being used. This is not just a best practice, but is actually a requirement by Google Play policy. A rule of thumb is that if a user is not aware that some data about them is about to be collected and for what purpose it is being used, you're required to prominently disclose it to them and get their permission to do so. So the example that we have here, the data is being collected of the installed apps on a user's device for fraud prevention purposes. So this needs to be prominently disclosed to the user, and only after your user consents to it should the data be transferred. So in the latest Android releases, we've worked hard to offer more privacy-sensitive OS. I'm going to walk you through a few of those changes. So in Android 9, we split up the call log permissions from the phone permission group into their own permission group, call log, to give users more transparency into what apps are doing. So if your app is requesting phone, uh, reading phone numbers from the phone state broadcast change, we're now asking you to request both the call log and the phone state permissions. In Android 8, we deprecated the build serial static field, replacing it with a build.get serial function that requires a read phone state permission. If you're going to use it, please be sure you can use it for valid purposes, because it's a supply policy violation to use it for advertising purposes. Speaking of limited access, a reminder, apps running in the background on Android 9.0 will require the following restrictions. You will no longer have access to mic or camera in the background. Sensors such as accelerometer, gyroscope will return empty data. If your app needs access to sensor events on devices running Android 9.0, you will need to use a foreground service. And to further inform and protect the user, the system will also add a visual aid to your notifications when your services are accessing the camera or the mic. So um, our contacts provider API used to allow apps to contribute data about how often a contact was being contacted, allowing other apps to glean information about interactions not happening within their own scope. So as of January next year, a limited set of contact fields and methods will be made obsolete. These include fields relating to the last time a contact was accessed or contacted. So if your app is accessing or updating these fields, we ask you to use alternative methods. For example, you could fulfill certain use cases by using private content providers or simply storing data in your backend systems. So this was a really brief talk about best practices for privacy. We hope that we've been able to offer you at least some insight into how you can build apps that are conscious of users' right to privacy and also compliant with all our policies. So as we've mentioned earlier, we, we definitely believe that security and privacy is a partnership between you, the developer, and our platform. So if you have any questions about it, please do come find us at the office hours. And I hope you all have a great summit and have a great lunch as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Android Jetpack is a set of libraries and guidance for modern Android development. Now, there are four categories that make up Jetpack. This video is all about architecture. Here are the architecture component libraries. These libraries work great on their own, but they're also built with each other in mind and can fit together like puzzle pieces. The documentation contains a guide to app architecture, which shows one way that these puzzle pieces can combine to create a testable and maintainable app. This architecture revolves around the following principles the separation of concerns, loose coupling, the observer pattern, and inversion of control. Okay, let's go ahead and start at the bottom. Room is a SQLite object mapping library. It uses annotations to generate boilerplate code for you. You declare your SQLite tables using entity objects. Entity objects are just simple objects with a few annotations. For example, I can take this class representing a user, and after I add a few annotations, it becomes a representation for this SQLite table schema. 
When defining the operations you perform on your database, you essentially write annotated SQL statements. This is where Room's object mapping capabilities come in. You can put entity objects directly into your Room database or have your database return entities. No conversion or intermediates were needed. Compiled time checking is also included. So if you mess up your SQLite queries, Room lets you know right away. Room also supports observable queries, including Rx Java flowables, lists, optionals, and Guava classes, migration between schemas, and testing. Another fundamental part of any data layer is threading and background work. To make sense of background work in modern Android development, we've created the Guide to Background Processing, which includes this handy table. You'll notice that there's this new library here, Work Manager. The Work Manager library provides a unified API for deferrable, one-off, or recurring background tasks that need guaranteed execution. The background tasks are work request objects. With Work Manager, you can build a complex processing and upload flow like this using chains of work requests. As part of the chain, you can define the output of one work request as the input of another work request. You can also set conditions on when the work request should run. Work Manager then performs the work requests in the order that you specified, while also taking care of compatibility issues and best practices for battery and system health. As part of guaranteed execution, Work Manager handles continuing your work across device restarts and if your process is force stopped. Finally, Work Manager can return the state of the work request so that you can represent this state in your UI. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at the lifecycle libraries. The classes in this library help with Android lifecycle management, specifically with avoiding memory leaks when updating your app's UI. Here is one example. Have you ever rotated a device and had the app crash or lose data? Well, adding a view model can help fix this. Unlike activity objects, a view model object isn't destroyed when the device configuration changes, such as when the screen is rotated. This property of view model makes it a good, stable place to put all of your UI data. The view model usually contains another lifecycle object, live data. Live data is built for easy communication between the UI and deeper layers of your app's architecture. Live data is an observable data holder for data that is meant to be shown on screen. Basically, it'll wrap around an object, like this user object over here, and allow the UI to automatically update whatever properties of the user object change. Live data is also lifecycle aware. This means a live data object only tells the UI to update if the UI's lifecycle state is in the correct state. For example, if your activity is not on screen, then the live data will not trigger updates. Also, if the activity gets destroyed, then this observation connection is cleaned up for you automatically. So as your data changes, you never accidentally trigger an activity or fragment that is off screen or destroyed to redraw itself. The lifecycle libraries include other powerful features. For example, live data supports transformations. As mentioned before, Room can return live data objects, which allows your UI to observe objects in the database. View models and live data also now support data binding. You can bind these classes to an element in your app's XML layout definition. That lets you get rid of all of this boilerplate code. The Lifecycles library also contains classes and interfaces for querying and observing UI lifecycle states. The Paging library integrates directly with Room and Live Data. Now, there's a common situation where you have a lot of data that you want to load in small, manageable chunks. The Paging library is built exactly for this use case, and it avoids tricky SQLite cursor performance issues. The library offers the following features. It allows you to define the data sources that you're going to use, be it data from the network, a database, or another data source of your choice. It works out of the box with Room and Recycler View. It supports lists of any size, including lists of infinite length. It leverages live data to update your UI as more data is loaded. And it has support for RxJava. Finally, there's the Navigation Library. The Navigation Library and tooling simplify implementation of complex but common navigation requirements, and help you visualize your app's navigation graph. Now for trivial apps, navigation might seem simple, but when you add things like fragment transactions, the need to implement proper back and up behavior, support deep linking, add a bottom bar, and include animations between screens, let's just say that things get a little bit messy. The navigation library simplifies all of this. Now the basic building blocks for navigation are called destinations. Destinations are specific screens you can go to, there's out-of-the-box support for fragments and activities as destinations, but you can also make your own. The new Guide to Navigation encourages you to have activities as entry points for your app. 
They also contain global navigation, such as this bottom nav. Now, in comparison, fragments will be the actual destination-specific layouts. This UI structure allows you to share an activity view model between all of the fragments associated with that activity. As the user navigates from fragment to fragment, you don't need to serialize that shared data. The new navigation editor in Android Studio enables you to quickly specify destinations and visualize your app's navigation architecture. The connections here show the possible navigation paths between each destination. This generates XML, which you can edit by hand. The library uses this new navigation graph resource and a new nav controller object to move your user through your app. Now, this is just scratching the surface of the proverbial iceberg that is the architecture components and Jetpack. Hopefully, some or maybe all of these libraries piqued your interest. To learn more, we've got dev bytes for all of the stable components. We also have code labs for each component and, of course, thorough documentation. Now, if you find yourself left with questions, we've also got Stack Overflow tags and an issue tracker. Or, you know, you can yell at me on Twitter. Actually, don't yell at me on Twitter. Happy coding. My name is Adobe Frank, and I'm a Google Certified Associate Android Developer. I started mobile development when I left school, and I was based in Abuja. That was where I was raised, that was where my parents lived. My husband knew that I wanted to further my education and my career. But over the years, like things had, had been really hard, so we, we hadn't had that opportunity. So the next thing was to do certification courses to boost my resume, basically make me more hireable. I had a job that required me to move to Lagos for six months. I was like the only female until a team from Andela came to join the project. I think that was the first time I had even heard of the scholarship program to get the Google Android certification. When I got the email that I had qualified, I called my husband. Yes, we have this scholarship. I was struggling for time. I was already working a contract job in Lagos. I would watch these videos on my way to work or on my way back. So I would be with my headphones and with my phone all the time. When I just finished the certification, I actually got a call for a job offer based in Abuja. This is something that will make me earn more than 10 times of the salary that I was earning before. 10 times, I kid you not. The interview process was something that would normally take like weeks. It was like a couple of days. Oh, you are uh, Android certified, great, awesome. Pfft. It was an amazing moment when she got the seal. And the pay began to pick some bills. Rent, you got to help us to fix the cars. She's been amazing, she's been supportive, she's helped me. So now I'm like working from my house and I can actually call my, to myself a developer like not like, oh, in my community, I am, I am awesome. In the world, I am okay. Must not be awesome, awesome. We are trying to do awesome, but okay.
Hello, everyone. It's great to be here with you all today. My name is Phil Adams, and I'm a researcher here at Google. And I'm Pierre Lucen, software engineer at Google. We are here to talk to you today about how we're rethinking app distribution on Google Play. We'll talk about the new app publishing format that we announced at I.O., and share some new features that we've been working on, digging deeper into some of the topics that you saw covered during the keynote. To start with, let's talk about app size and the impact that it's having on your app. Why does app size even matter? We shared this chart at Google I.O., and you saw it earlier today. Play Store data does show that when the app gets bigger, install success rate goes down. Many users don't have enough space left on their device. And especially in emerging markets, data can be expensive and connection speeds slow. I want you to think about your own experience, too. How many of you have seen a warning from Play to uninstall apps? Millions of people see things like this every day. We've started looking into this area more closely, and we have found that freeing up space is a major driver of uninstalls. This is obviously a problem for people with low storage devices. But it's also a problem for people with high-end devices who fill up their devices with HD content. Take the US and the UK. One in five, exam one in five devices have very low storage and are reaching the limit where they can't install or update. A key request we hear from developers is also for help understanding and reducing uninstalls. We ran a user research study last year to look into why users in the US uninstall apps. The re leading reason apps were uninstalled straight away within a day was quality. However, the leading reason apps or games were uninstalled after a month was to free up space. Apps and games keep getting bigger. Since 2012, apps and games have grown over five times on average. Newer devices have more storage, but the apps, games, high-res photos, and HD videos keep getting bigger, too. Making your app big puts it at risk to suffer from all these downsides. Bigger apps lose acquisitions, and bigger apps also get uninstalled to free up space. I'm sure you already know that, and you've probably just considered it a trade-off. Do you add new features and support more device configurations, but lose installs and drive more uninstalls? We don't want you to have to worry about these trade-offs. For a few years, there has been a way to optimize for device configurations. You can use multiple APKs, but it's incredibly inefficient, and it's a painful process. This is what it looks like in the Play Console when you have to upload dozens of APKs for a single release. The number of APKs grows quickly across dimensions, for example, 64 bits, 32 bits, and all the screen densities. And you have to version every APK for each release. It also doesn't help with some of the dimensions. For example, all the languages are still in all APK, in every APK. We can do better. Let us show you the solution that we have built for this and see how the new app model helps make your life easier. So the new app model is focused on improving the whole user acquisition journey from discovery through to retention. It helps by making your app smaller, directly improving install and uninstall rates. And in addition to that, it makes your releases more manageable. In that context, for the rest of today's session, we'll talk about three important steps that we want to help you with. First, we want to help you convert more installers and minimize uninstalls by building smaller apps. Then, we want to make it possible for you to, de to deliver different features to different audiences on demand, only for those users who need them. And finally, we want to help you keep your users up to date on the latest and greatest versions of your app. Let's start with how to make your app smaller. This is where we began with our major announcement at I.O. about the Android App Bundle. The App Bundle is the official Android app publishing format. Apps that have already adopted the bundle are seeing an average size saving of 35%. That's compared to a universal APK, and that's quite a lot. How does adopting the bundle lead to such savings? Here's the big idea. Google Play can assist and take care of delivering just what's needed to each device on your behalf. There's no need to send a bunch of languages and device resources which are not necessary. We support three slicing dimensions out of the box, languages, screen densities, and CPU architecture. 
All of this is made possible by split APKs, a feature we added to the Android platform in Android Lollipop. Split APKs allow multiple APKs to be installed on a device and behave as if they're part of the same app. These split APKs can be installed in different combinations on different devices and can be installed all at once up front or, over time, piece by piece. Given a bundle, Google Play starts by putting everything that is common to all devices in the base APK. This includes the Android manifest and the DEX files, for instance. We then generate a different split APK for each screen density. Each split will contain all the drawables that would have been selected by the Android framework on that device with that density. We then also generate different split APKs for each native architecture. And we can generate a separate split for each language supported by your app, putting each language's strings in a different APK. Together, we call these splits configuration splits or config splits. Now, when we go to serve an app to a device, we only need to serve a subset of these splits. So if Phil, for example, has a Samsung Galaxy J5, we will install the base APKs, as well as the XHDPI density split, the ARM archi archi architecture split, and the English language split. But it can get a bit trickier than that. I speak both French and English, and I have specified both languages in my device settings. So my Pixel 2 XL will not only receive the correct density and architecture split, but also the French and the English language splits. And if, the, if I then move to Brazil and learn Portuguese, I might add Portuguese as a language on my device. When I do this, the Play Store will attempt to download the Portuguese language splits for all the apps on my phone. For devices pre-L, which don't support split APKs, Play will generate a matrix of standalone APKs for each combination of ABI and screen density that your app supports. Each of these APK contains all the files necessary for the device. So my old Galaxy Nexus, still running Android KitKat, would receive the HDPI and ARM APK. Note that all the languages are included in those APKs. Putting it all together, the picture looks like this. You actually don't need to worry about all the details of how these APKs are generated. All you have to do is upload a single app bundle and play generates and selects the right things to serve for each device. To summarize, the app bundle contains everything. Play processes the bundle, generates optimized APKs, and then signs each APK to deliver to user devices. Note that because Play is now signing the APKs, this means that you need to upload your signing key to Google Play. This is part of the program called App Signing by Play. In conversations we've had with developers, they've asked a reasonable question. Is this secure? The answer is absolutely. As you can imagine, Google takes this very seriously. We protect your key in the same storage we protect Google's own keys. We have engineers focused on security, and you'll benefit from our ongoing investments. We've been chatting to developers who are already using the app bundle about what they like. Recently, we've conducted a workshop with some developers from India who make really popular apps. These developers have millions of active installs, and they're very sophisticated about keeping their app size small because their users are very sensitive to it. So this is a useful group for us to learn from. Riofi found that smaller installs improve their conversion rates. Redbus speaks to their release process being more streamlined and easier to manage. And Swiggy reports that switching was a simple process, and they were testing using the bundle within an hour. And it's not just developers in India, of course. All these developers around the world have switched and are seeing fantastic size savings. Duolingo, for example, so a 56% size saving compared to a universal APK. And it's really hard to get such big savings from incremental optimizations. Switching to the bundle is the simplest and highest impact thing that most developers can do to reduce app size. Google Apps are also adopting the bundle in production, and they're seeing strong savings as well. Google Maps is saving about 15% in size, YouTube 24, Google News 27. They also report some streamlining of their release process and have even noticed a lift in update rates. So you can see this isn't experimental. This is ready. There are thousands of apps, uh, thousands of app bundles in production, uh, and it's time for all developers to start moving towards this new publishing format. 
So when you adopt the app bundle, you're not only gaining size savings today, you will also be benefiting from optimi opti automatic optimizations in the future as Play introduces them. Here's a cool example of another optimizations we're just introducing. We've added a new Android platform optimization to the op app bundle called Uncompressed Native Libraries. Here's how it works. On Android L and below, native libraries have to be uncompressed from the APK before the platform can use them, meaning the user ends up with two copies of the library. After Android M, the platform can read the library directly from the APK if it's left uncompressed, thus saving a copy on the device. To do it yourself, you will need to, need to upload two versions of your app and create multi-APK for pre and post M. If you're using the app bundle, you just give us your libraries, and we, cre and we create the required flavor for pre and post M and serve the right APK to the right user. The size savings we are seeing on average are significant, around 16% reduction in size on disk and 8% reduction in download size. As I explained, the app is smaller on disk because the platform does not need to make a copy of the library. But the download size is also smaller because our compression algorithms perform much better on data that is not already compressed. Our partner, Gameloft, saw size savings on disk of 22% and 16% on their download size for the game My Little Pony, using this optimization in the app bundle. And these savings are in addition to the size savings they're already seeing from, from switching to the app bundle. With this optimization, the download is size is smaller, it's faster to install, and it takes up less space on disk. If you're using the app bundle, you get this new optimization without any extra effort. Now, we still want you to remain in control to when these optimizations should be pushed to your users. For that reason, Play will only apply optimizations on app bundle that have been built with the version of Gradle that introduces the optimization. For example, the uncompressed native libraries optimization will only be applied to your app if you build it with the latest Gradle 3.3, which is already available for download in beta. Now let's take a look at how you can build, test, and publish Android app bundles. You can build app bundles in the 3.2 stable release of Android Studio. The build process is very similar to building an APK for most developers, so it's easy to switch. For those who prefer the command line or wish to integrate with automated build systems, the new Gradle Android plugin provides a new set of tasks to build Android app bundles. As you'll remember, you would use the assemble task on the command line for building APKs. And now with the Android app bundle, you use the new bundle task. Similar to assemble tasks, bundle tasks also allow you to build specific flavors. The bundle task will generate an Android app bundle and place it in the outputs folder with the flavor and build type chosen. The build artifact is simply called bundle.aab. We do want developers to retain control over their splits, and so for if any reason you need to disable splitting by a particular dimension, you can do so using the new bundle block as shown here. Android Studio and Gradle are not the only ways that you can build bundles today. Because the format and bundle tool are open source, others are already adopting them. For example, we're excited to share that games using Unity can now build Android app bundles too. Unity added support in the 2018.3 beta release, and you can join the beta program now. So now, let's see how you can adapt your testing with the app bundle. During the development phase, when you need to iterate quickly, you don't need to go through the app bundle. You can keep building APKs directly from Studio, much faster. Before a release, you may want to test the APKs that would be generated from the app bundle. From Studio, this is as easy as creating a new run configuration and selecting APK from app bundle in the deploy menu. Studio, under the hood, uses the same tool Play does to generate the APKs, so you will get high fidelity. When you want to share the APKs generated from the app bundle, say, with your QA team, you can use the bundle tool command line. This tool is what Play and Gradle use under the hood to generate APKs. We have open source bundle tool to be transparent about how we generate APKs. And you can download the bundle tool library on the GitHub repo you see here. Bundle tool generates what we call an APK set archive. 
which will contain all the APKs for all the device, devices that your app supports. You can share this archive, and still using Bono Tool, you can install it on a connected device, which will simulate what Play does when serving APKs to that device. As you can imagine, an APK set can become quite big. So if you want to build the APKs only for a given device configuration, you can do so by passing to Bono Tool a device specification in a JSON format. You can share that archive around, which can then be installed on the devices matching the spec. This is what the command line looks like to build the APK set archive from the app bundle. In this case, we're instructing Bono Tool to build APKs only for the connected device. If you don't have a device at hand, if you're generating the archive from a CI system, for example, you can pass instead a device specification in this JSON format. Finally, if you want a unique, easily shareable APK, you can also choose to build a universal APK. This APK does not use splits, but it can be installed on any device, so it's very convenient for sharing. But the best way to test exactly what your users will get is still to go through the internal test track on the Play Console. This way, you are guaranteed to get byte for byte what your users will get. The internal test track is similar to the alpha and beta tracks that you, that you may already be familiar with. But it differs from these tracks in that there is almost no delay between the upload of the bundle and the update being available on the tester's device. You can see here how it looks in the Play Console. You can create a list of emails for up to 100 QA testers. The QA testers can then follow the opt-in link, and they'll receive automatically the latest version. We know that for some of you, these testing options are not ideal. And we see a gap, in particular, between testing in Android Studio and Play's test tracks. So I just want you to know that we're thinking really hard about how to close this gap. So now you've built and test bundles. Let's discuss publishing bundles and also a new view that we've added to the releases section. In the Play Console, we're starting to show an estimate when we think that an app could really benefit from using the app bundle. We'll take a common reference device and calculate what you could save were you to switch to the bundle. Once you choose to switch, you manage your release just like you did with APKs. Simply create a new release and drop the app bundle in the same location where you currently drop your APKs. Do note, in order to age your migration, you can keep uploading APKs on your production track while you test the bundle in a test track. And when you do this, Play is not going to re-sign the APK. We did this so that you can feel confident trying out the app bundle with a smaller number of users first without affecting your current production user base. Once you've uploaded it, you review your release, you roll it out, and that's it. I can't stress this enough. As Pierre mentioned, there's no more multi-APK to deal with. Play Console has created in the background all the APKs for the devices supported for you. Now that you've uploaded your app bundle and Play has done this heavy lifting, it would be really nice to have an overview of what Play has generated for you. To give you this transparency, we've built a new tool in the Play Console called Bundle Explorer which lets you navigate your uploaded bundles and the generated artifacts. On the first screen of Bundle Explorer, you'll see how much of a size savings you've gained by publishing a bundle. Of course, this is going to be different device by device, and so we calculate this using a popular device configuration. You can also see below a list of device configurations and the total size of the APKs served to those devices. If you click on View Devices, you can see which devices are in each bucket. Alternatively, you can search by, for supported device by name to download the set of generated APKs that get served to that specific device. And this is particularly helpful, for example, when you get a bug report for a particular device, so you can get the exact same APKs that Play has served to it. Of course, we haven't forgotten about everyone who uses our publishing API. Uploading bundles is also available via the API, uh, and automation and CI tools are already adopting the bundle, for example, Fastlane. You'll find all the documentation at these URLs. To recap, that's the latest on the Android app bundle and how we're making your app smaller and, release simple, and releases simpler. The next big change the app bundle introduces is modularization and dynamic code loading. This is an approved, safe way to load features and functionality dynamically, making your app even smaller at install time. 
Okay, let me tell you how it works. Dynamic features offer yet another way you can reduce the size of your app. Some big features in your app may be used by only 10% of your users. So to avoid having the 90 other percent pay the price of disk space for a feature they don't use, you can choose to extract it in what we call a dynamic feature. Dynamic features can be installed on demand when user requests them. Or you can choose to defer installing them to a later time when the app goes to the background. For pre-L devices, which don't support on-demand features, we can fuse the modules into the main app so they're delivered at install time. All of these use cases are supported in production today, with millions of users benefiting already. Facebook was actually one of our launch partners, and they are using dynamic features in production across their app portfolio. Let's, a, let's take a look at the story. App size is really important to Facebook. They evaluate the app size impacts of each new feature carefully to ensure that the benefit of the feature is worth the size increase. Dynamic features means that they can build new features without increasing the size of apps like Facebook and Facebook Lite at install time. Dynamic features also help Facebook with their high-end device strategy. Facebook is able to deliver advanced features to just supported devices. And they can also remove large features that are not used often to avoid taking up space on that device forever. Facebook has told us that dynamic features work well when they're working on a new feature that is separate from the main app. They can have a separate team of engineers working on it. They can then add the app and they can add, then add it to the app without increasing the base app size at install time. Here are some of the examples of dynamic features that Facebook has added to their apps. These are all features that are in production. For example, card scanning is a feature that only a small percentage of Facebook's users are using. So moving it to a dynamic feature avoids it taking up two megabytes on every user's device for the lifetime of that app. Another example is real-time communication. By moving voice and video chat to a dynamic feature, only users with devices that can support them and who actually want to use them need to download it. What might that experience look like for a user? Let's take a simple example. Imagine that you have a recipe app, and you want to keep the initial download size small. You observe that while all of your users like to browse for recipes, only a small fraction of them like to add recipes. And you notice that this functionality takes up significant size in your app. You can choose, therefore, to break this, fe this feature out into its own module and serve it only when needed. We can see what it looks like for the user, or what it might look like for the user here. The app opens, and then the user goes to add a recipe. The app then requests that the module be installed. It's downloaded and installed with progress visible to the user. And the new feature is ready to be used after just a few seconds. Which parts of your app might make uh, good candidates to be broken out as separate features? We think about it using this Venn diagram. If only a smaller fraction of your users use this feature, it could be a good candidate, especially if that feature takes up significant amounts of space. And finally, consider if users can wait a few seconds before downloading and using that feature. If you're interested in modularizing your app, I invite you to check out the Plaid 2.0 project that some of our DevRels have been working on and the associated articles that they've published that describe how the modularization was achieved for the app. Now that we have covered how dynamic features work, let's see how to create them. To create a dynamic module in Android Studio 3.2, all you need to do is use the new dynamic feature wizard. Click on File, New Module, then choose Dynamic Feature Module. Just type in your module's name, and Android Studio will generate a new dynamic feature for you. Under the hood, this is what Studio does. In the manifest of your new module, a split identifier is added. In this case, we'll call it Add Recipe. This is how the Android platform recognizes that although this APK has the same package name, it's still a different module. Then a new module tag element is added, which allows to configure distribution aspects of the module. This tag is used by the Play Store to read properties of the modules of your app. Next, you declare that this module is an on-demand module by adding the on-demand attribute, meaning that it will be only delivered to users' devices when you request it instead of at install time. 
Note that on-demand modules are only supported since Android L. So you have to specify as well what Play should do with this module when it generates the pre-L APKs. You can choose to fuse that module in the base APK or exclude it completely. And this is configured using the fusing tag. Here's an example with our recipe app. In addition to the base module, we have two dynamic features. The add recipe module is marked with fuse equal true, while the other VR module is marked with fuse equal false. And you can see that, the, that play will only include the add recipe module in the pre-L APK. Now let's look at the build.gradle files. In the dynamic module, you can see a new Gradle plugin being used called com Android dynamic feature. You also have to add the base module as a dependency of this dynamic module to access functionality from the base module. Looking at the build Gradle from the base module, the only change is to declare all dynamic modules. This is to instruct Gradle to make the resources stored in the base module available to them. Now that we've created our on-demand modules, let's write the code to download them. In order to interact with the Play Store to request these on-demand modules, we have to use the split install API, which is part of the Play Core library. This is a Java client library that communicates with the Play Store via IPC. The, the Play Store IPC then communicates with Play servers. The API is structured using the same task framework that you may be familiar with from Google Play services and Firebase APIs. Installation of splits is coordinated by the split install manager. You construct a request with all the modules that you wish to download and then invoke start install to trigger the Play Store to download and install the splits required for the requested modules. For large modules, you'll need to obtain the user confirmation prior to the download uh, via the split install API. You'll need to do this whenever an app requests more than 10 megabytes of on-demand modules to be downloaded. The API allows you to listen for updates throughout the download and install process and display this progress um, to allow to display this progress to users. Here we show the download progress bar. An alternative option for installing modules that aren't required immediately is to use the deferred installation API. These will be installed at a convenient, convenient time for the user, generally when they aren't using the device and are on Wi-Fi and charging. And because of this, we allow you to install larger modules, up to 100 megabytes without requiring user confirmation. The split install API also allows you to manage your on-demand modules. You can see which modules are installed, and you can choose to uninstall modules that are no longer required by the app. This will free up precious disk space for your users. So when installing an on-demand module on N plus devices, the app does not need to be restarted. Code is available immediately, and new resources and assets are available once you refresh the context object. However, on Android L and M, installing splits requires the app to fully restart. To avoid this, we include a split compat library, which emulates the installation of splits on L and M until the app goes into the background and we can properly install it. If you are familiar with the Multidex support library, you will set up split compat in a very similar way. Let's have a look. You have three options to install Split Compact. You can use the Split Compact application as your default application. Or if you already have an application, you can simply extend it. And if none of these options um, suit you, then you can still also choose to override the attached base context in your application and invoke Split Compact.install. Now, let's talk about versioning. When you release an update to your app, Play will automatically update both the base module and any on-demand modules that are already installed. So the version of your modules are always in sync. Partners tell us this is something they really like about this model. Let's now talk about the final step here, helping users update to the latest and greatest version of your app. You know that Play offers auto-update functionality, and many users do have auto-update turned on, but not all of them. And in some markets, it's not uncommon for users to have auto-updates turned on, but for their device not to meet the requirements for the auto-update to take place. For example, they may not connect to Wi-Fi. I'm happy to share that we're launching a new API that helps you prompt users to update without ever leaving your app. 
you can call this API to determine first if there's an update available, and then if so, you can show a prompt to your users so that they can update the app. In this example, the flow is designed for immediate critical use cases, such as user privacy or revenue affecting bugs. It's a full screen experience where the user is expected to wait for the update to be applied. It's an easy one for you, the developer, to implement because we take care of restarting the app for you. Some of you have built similar flows for yourselves, but this is a standardized method that you can use with very little effort. Instead of that immediate update, you can also put together a flexible update, which does not have to be applied straight away. The really cool thing about this API is that you can completely customize the update flow so that it feels part like part of your app. For example, you may choose to nudge users to update with an inline flow, like Google Chrome is doing in this example. Once the user accepts the update, the download happens in the background so the user can keep using the app. And once the update is complete, it's up to you and your app to decide how to prompt the user to restart. Or you can simply wait until the app goes into the background or is closed by the user. Google Chrome is testing this now. Uh, and we're inviting early access partners to start testing this, testing this with us as well. Talk to your BD manager if you're interested. Let's take a look at the code that allows that flexible in-app in update to work. First, you can request an instance of app update manager and then request the app update info. This result is going to contain the update availability status. If an update is available and the update is allowed, the returned up app update info object also contains an intent to start the flow. If the app is allowed to start, then you extract this pending intent and you start it. This will start the download and installation. You can monitor the state of an update by registering a listener for status updates. When the download is complete, you can choose again to install it directly or defer the installation to a more convenient time, for example, using a snack bar. The restart happens when complete update is called. So to recap this new API, ensuring your users get the latest update is important. And you can make that happen by following some of these best practices up here on the screen and also by integrating with our brand new in-app updates API. The API is available for any app, and so you can get started with it in parallel to switching to the Android app bundle. And that's it. We've now covered how to make your app smaller and create dynamic features using the Android app bundle, and how you can ensure that your users stay on the latest version of your app using the new in-app updates API. If you want to come and chat about any of this, you can find us at the office hours or the demos on the Google Play stand today and tomorrow. Also, if you want to share about what we've talked today with your team, the Medium post at this link is a great place to start. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Everyone, the next session in this room begins promptly at 2.50. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone. Our program will resume in three minutes. We remind you as a courtesy to the presenters to please mute all mobile devices. Thank you. Hi, my name is Codley. And I'm Rossick. And we're both engineers on the Android Auto team, here to talk to you about what's new for app developers and Android Auto. Now, we're incredibly excited at Google about the automotive space right now, because we see it going through a huge transformation in connectivity, electrification, interfaces and sensors, sharing, and autonomy. Cars are rapidly turning into full-blown computers on wheels. They've got high-speed mobile connections, cameras, microphones, and screens of all shapes and sizes everywhere. Android Auto is an effort from Google and our automotive partners to bring these advances together and create a safe and seamless ex connected experience for drivers everywhere. Of course, that's easier said than done. There are dozens of different car platforms today, many different input types, from touch screens to touch pads to rotary controllers, many different screen shapes, sizes, and resolutions. Today, you can see that vision at work in any Android Auto compatible car. Drivers have access to their favorite apps right from their car's display, and developers build their app once without worrying about different makes and models, input controls, and screens. Today, we'll talk about two of the most important app categories, messaging and media. Great. So first up is messaging. Messaging has come a long way in both Android Auto and Android the OS. When Android Auto started supporting messaging, there wasn't really a good way for messaging apps to get their messaging information over to the car. That's where Car Extender came into play. Car Extender allowed a way for messaging apps to provide conversation details and a way to reply to conversations to Android Auto. But since Android N, apps could stylize their notifications with something called messaging style. 
Messaging style is a huge step up from Car Extender as it allows messaging apps to provide conversation information directly into the notification. Not only does it provide a nicer UI for conversation details, but it provides affordances like replying and liking directly in line to the notification. Android Auto now fully supports the use of messaging style and actions without the need for Car Extender. This also means Android Auto and the Assistant both fully support group messaging. So for the price of implementing messaging style, apps not only gain a richer mobile user experience, but also gain the benefit of automotive support. So let's see how Android Auto interfaces with, these, with this, starting on the messaging app side. From Android Auto's point of view, messaging apps have three core functions, notifying users of messages, marking those messages as read, and replying to those messages. Working backwards, apps can implement reading and replying with services. These services can be triggered internally with intents or externally, like via Android Auto, with pending intents. Notifying is done via an Android notification, and the messaging information is provided with the messaging style. The mark is read and reply pending intents are wrapped in actions and both provided in the notification as well. Note here that the reply action has a remote input that's added that acts as a sort of input field for the reply. And that's the messaging app's architecture. Moving on to the other side of the notification, we can see how Android Auto leverages these objects. Android Auto will first post an in-car notification, and once tapped on, will read aloud the messages contained within. The mark is read pending intent is then fired. The user is given the choice to respond, and if taken, a transcription of that response is set in that remote input. The reply pending intent is then fired. And that's the entire Android Auto flow, so let's see how we can put that into code. First, the app needs to declare support for Android Auto. To do that, it needs to create a new XML file that's linked in the Android manifest. This XML file says that it has notifications that Android Auto should take a look at. Note that for messaging apps that support SMS, MMS, or RCS, this uses SMS bit also needs to be added. So now Android Auto is taking a look at our messages. We can build up the messaging style. So we can't really have a conversation without people, so the first person we have to add is the user of the device. To do that, we create this new person object. Person is used to set things like the user's name, their icon, and a unique key in the event that multiple people have the same name. So we create this device user, and we create the messaging style with it. We can then add our conversation information. So I'm from Seattle, and I love skiing, so I'm setting the conversation title to Ski Group. Um, because this, I'm taking multiple friends, this is a group conversation, so the messaging app needs to set it as such. Note here that conversation title and whether or not the conversation is a group can be set independently. This is new in Android P and has been backported to older Android versions in the Compat library. And finally, we can add all the messages in this conversation in the order they were received. In this case, my friend wants to coordinate breakfast, so the messaging app provides the text, the timestamp, and the sender in the form of a person. With this conversation set up, it's time to add the actions. For the reply action, we instantiate an action builder and set the semantic action to semantic action reply. That must also tell the OS that firing the reply pending intent won't show any extra UI. This is especially important in Android Auto because we don't want to be distracting drivers with extra pop-ups. Finally, the reply action is supplied with that remote input I talked about earlier. On the mark is red side, things are done about the same way. This time, the semantic action is set to semantic action mark is red, and again, we tell the OS that firing that pending intent won't show extra UI. Note here that the mark is red uh, action does not need a remote input. So that's all three pieces. The notification can now be built. For reference, here are the three elements we created. Messaging style, which holds all our conversation information, our reply action, and our mark is red action. To build the notification, 
some boilerplate is provided, and then we set the messaging style. We can then add our actions. Here is where the messaging app has some options. Note that the reply action is added as a regular visible action, and the mark is red action is added as invisible. This is purely stylistic. One can add both actions as visible or invisible. This will just change how it shows up in the mobile UI. On Android Auto, actions are never shown, but Android Auto will be able to read both visible and invisible actions. And finally, the messaging app can post the notification. And there we have it. My friends and I have planned breakfast on the road, and our ski trip is underway. And now that we've coordinated with everybody, let's find something to listen to on the drive out to the mountains. Media in the car is one of our core user experiences, and getting drivers access to their content should be front and center. I'm going to talk about several new features we're introducing today to enhance the abilities of media apps to provide content within Android Auto. In particular, we want to make content more visually pleasing by adding additional content style hints and enabling additional search results provided by the app. To start off, let's go over the architecture that an app has when communicating with Android Auto. The first thing a media app needs is a media browser service. It provides a tree of playable and browsable items. Browsable items are basically folders to organize app content instead of returning a giant list of playable items. The media apps implement the onload children method, which loads a particular level of the tree. Here, in our first call to onload children, our example service would return home, recently played, recommended, and playlists. Now, since this is running in a car, we recommend that media apps only provide two levels in the tree to avoid uh, distracting drivers and making them click through multiple levels while they're driving. Now, once the user has picked something playable from the browse tree, the media session service is used to start playing music and to provide metadata and controls to show what's currently playing. For example, our media app that we're showing here supports play pause, skip forward, and skip back. And we show that in the Android Auto UI. There's also the ability for media apps to provide their own custom actions, maybe something like 30 second skip. Now, obviously, we want to get the user away from touching or doing things while they're driving. So we bring in the assistant. Might say something like, hey, Google, play my ski jams. The Google Assistant performs speech recognition and can request that the media session service play the query and music starts playing. We're going to take it one step farther today. We're given the ability for media apps to implement an additional function on the media browse service on search. And once the music has started playing from a Google Assistant query, we'll provide that query to the media app, and they can provide additional results. Here in this case, the media app provided a ski trip playlist from this year as well as one from last year. So let's take a look at the code needed to make this happen. For apps which already support Android Auto, this should look pretty familiar. This is the onSearch method. It takes the query string, an extras bundle, and a result object, which the app fills in and sends back to Android Auto. First off, apps should return an empty list if they get a query they don't support. Second, for queries that can't be answered synchronously, apps detach from the results object, and that lets the media framework know that not to wait and not to send anything back to Android Auto right away. This gives a chance for apps to do extra work on a background thread before sending the results to Android Auto. And finally, when the results are ready, they can send the results and the result object, and Android Auto will be notified and show the results on screen. Now, all these, these code snippets come from the Universal Music Player, an open source media app published by Google on GitHub. It can be easily cloned, compiled, and used as a great reference building your own media app. So voila, our media app returns a list of items from the Ski Jams query. Notice it returned two playlists and an album. It'd be really nice if Android Auto could group those items and show them to the user as a groups. Fortunately, we're introducing a way to do that in the on-search results. Here's an example function which your media app might use to convert from an internal representation of a media item into the media browser compat media item that Android Auto needs. 
we can annotate items with a category extra, and Android Auto will group any adjacent items with the same category and show a heading. For the two ski trip playlists, we can annotate with playlist, and Android Auto will group them together and add the heading for you. We're also adding some additional annotations on media items that would be really useful on our trip. For example, I may be heading out to the mountains with my family. I worry that maybe a song comes on that has some explicit content. We now add the ability to say, OK, this particular playlist or song has explicit content, and Android Auto can show that in the UI. Similarly, out in the mountains, I might not have great bandwidth. I'd love to know if the playlist or songs have already been downloaded, or maybe I don't want to burn my data on music that I'm playing. We can also annotate with whether or not media items have been downloaded and are already on the device. Great. Looks like the Ski Trip 2018, it's already downloaded, doesn't have any explicit contest, content. Great choice for my trip out to the mountains. There's one more function that needs updating. The media browser service on get root is called when a media app is first connected to by Android Auto. In order for search and for the additional styling hints to be enabled, you'll need to add a couple of extras to let Android Auto know that you support those features. As I mentioned, we're introducing the concept of additional content styling, and Android Auto will be interpreting the browse tree returned by apps in a much more visually pleasing way. By default, items which are browsable, like folders, will be interpreted as lists. This is how we do things today. But for playable items, things like songs or albums or playlists, we're going to be showing them now as grids. Most of these items have much richer uh, visual content that users can identify by seeing much easier than reading and much safer when you're in the car. There are, however, times when a list is better than a grid. For example, in a podcast app, each of the individual podcasts would probably have individual art that is much more visually representative, while the episodes, instead, they would have all the same art, but different episode titles and lengths and in stat in, uh, status. And it would be much better to show them as lists. In the on get root function, we can, the media app can provide a hint to Android Auto to say, I prefer my browsable items to be grids, and my playable items to be lists, or vice versa. So they have full control over how we're showing the items. I already mentioned the Universal Media Player. I just want to reiterate, it's a great comprehensive sample media app that's available. It gives you a canonical implementation of a media app that actually plays music. And it also supports, it supports Android Auto, as well as other surfaces like Wear and Android TV. And if you are developing a media app, I also encourage you to check out the Android Media Controller another open source app hosted on GitHub. It'll connect to your app's media session and media browse service, and it shows you information that your app is presenting to Android Auto in a clear semantic format. If you're using whitelisting to block apps other than Android Auto from accessing your browse tree, it'd probably be a good idea to either add the media controller to the whitelist or disable the whitelist while testing. So to sum up, we've shown code samples for messaging style, notification actions, providing search results with the Media Browser Service Compat on search, attaching new extras for media items metadata, and declaring support for content browse and search in root hints. So great. Uh, we look forward to seeing all of your messaging and media apps in the car. Rasik and I will be available tomorrow morning at office hours to answer any questions you have about Android Auto. Thank you all for watching. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and watching uh, my session, which is going to be um, Android on large screens. Just waiting for it to uh, pop up. Cool. So um, as we all know, Android has evolved from just being a phone platform. It's available on watches uh, and cars, as we just heard. Um, desktop, phones, um, and specifically the mobile space has also changed pretty drastically. Uh, let's see what your mobile AVK is running on today. 
Um, so starting off with the phone, it's what uh, we all develop for mainly, um, if not solely. Um, a couple keys about the platform. It's portrait first, touch first, uh, and full screen first. Um, a lot of apps now even lock rotation. Um, some users do obviously use uh, multi-window or stylus and things like that. But majority of your users are, are using it with uh, regular touch screens and in full screen. Uh, moving on to tablets, um, both orientations here uh, are kind of first class citizens. Um, if you do lock to portrait, users can still use your app um, in the portrait landscape. Um, larger screens do bring challenges uh, design-wise, um, but also the ability to kind of do different things, take more advantage of the uh, real estate, um, allow your users to um, do things faster. Uh, but more importantly, the, the different medium kind of brings a, a different focus on what apps are, are probably going to be used more heavily. Um, content apps or media consumption apps, uh, productivity apps, uh, things that uh, can really take advantage of the, the larger screen. Um, and then moving on to kind of the desktop platforms. Um, you know, we have Chrome OS. We have some uh, OEMs that have made uh, desktop platforms as well, like the Samsung Dock, the Huawei Mate desktop mode. Um, also, uh, Android has now brought the ability to um, really take advantage of having external displays. Um, so it's very possible that your app, uh, even if it's running on a phone, is actually being displayed uh, to an external monitor. Uh, this is really where the biggest difference comes in, where it's landscape first. Um, all these environments have some sort of window resizing, uh, and multi-window is going to be used a lot more often. Um, and you have new first-class input methods, um, such as keyboard and, and mouse and trackpads that actually sh uh, either ship with the device or will be connected. So what to focus on when you're thinking about kind of how to bring your apps to all these platforms uh, and have a good user ex experience? Uh, number one is uh, design. Uh, you know, again, if you've really been focusing on, on phones, most of your designs are probably uh, very portrait-based and kind of smaller screen-based. Uh, window management is probably the biggest uh, place where we see issues with partners' apps. Uh, dealing with resizing, uh, some multi-window consideration, things like that are just problems we've never had to focus before. Uh, and then we're going to talk a little bit about the tooling that's available uh, from Google to make sure that you're able to actually develop for these platforms. Um, and uh, bring it into your actual uh, cycle. So talking about design, um, raise your hands if you have uh, layouts for large screens or tablets at all. A lot more people than I expected. Um, cool. So you know, biggest thing is just thinking about uh, larger screens again. Um, you've, probably for the last couple of years, um, we've seen a lot more apps come out that, that may lock to portrait or are solely uh, mobile focused, um, which makes sense. Um, but with a more, uh, more and more like growing number of platforms that are um, running your, your mobile ABK but uh, showing a completely different form factor um, or platform, it's time to start thinking again about how to really bring the best experience to those um, areas. Um, a really bad example of design is actually uh, Google Play Music, uh, which is always great. Um, so a couple things ab about this that, that really um, are not great. It's super stretched layout. There's tons of white space that could be used to show uh, more content to the user, uh, whether it's like album descriptions, artist descriptions, album art, things like that. Um, the biggest key here, though, is there's no line dividers, which on a phone is fine, because the screen is so small, you can see what uh, options menu you're clicking on. Um, when you take it to kind of a, a larger landscape, landscape layout, it's really hard to actually follow the lines and see what um, item you're pressing the options menu for. Um, a, an external partner that we worked a lot with actually is 1Password. Um, so looking at their phone layouts, um, it's kind of your standard uh, list of items that you'll drill down into. Uh, but when you move to a larger screen, they really take advantage of the real estate going to almost like a three panel layout, um, allowing the user to really get whatever content they need uh, in a lot less clicks and a lot faster. Um, also being able to showcase uh, more information at the same time. Um, so kind of going back to the same point is, again, just building layouts for both orientations. And there's a couple of big uh, keys for this. Um, again, not all platforms are portrait first. Um, a lot of the desktop environments, if you're only really building for uh, portrait, uh, you're going to have a pretty bad user experience when I want to use your app in, let's say, full screen, or even just the top half of the screen if I'm trying to multitask. Um, on top of that, resizing capabilities allow the user to make your app whatever size, uh, orientation, or screen ratio that they really want to. 
Um, so you really want to let the user really decide how they want to use your app. Um, going back to kind of mainly the, the desktop platforms is uh, designing for input mediums other than touch. Um, make sure your design is taking into consideration like how your app works, maybe using a mouse or, or a stylus and things like that. Um, on top of this, the UX patterns for uh, different non-touch are different for non-touch devices. Um, things like uh, right-clicking um, is a little bit different than, than what we kind of uh, are used to with long pressing. Uh, most of the paradigms are long pressing to multi-select items, um, whereas when you right-click on a desktop, you're usually expecting some type of uh, pop-up context menu and things like that. Um, so taking uh, the time to really think about how your app works with the different UX considerations. The other big one uh, that we notice is uh, hover actions. Uh, on, on the web or on desktop environments with a mouse, you really expect some type of feedback when you um, move your mouse like over an action item to let you know that there is actually uh, something you can do there, whether it's clickable um, or draggable. There's some behavior, there's some feedback. Um, myself, even if I use the app on a phone uh, extensively, uh, Google, Google Drive is a good example of this, um, when I use it on, let's say, uh, Android on Chrome OS, uh, I'll miss actions that I can actually do because just natively on this platform, I'm expecting some type of, of hover actions. Uh, I'm going to go over two simple APIs. Uh, there are many APIs that kind of help handle a lot of these input um, methods and things, such as like mouse scrolling and things like that. And there'll be resources um, when the slides get posted. But um, right-clicking, uh, which is one of the usual kind of feature blocks, is um, super easy. You just set an on context with listener and make sure that you're exposing whatever be behavior or f functionality you have on long press in this method. Um, Again, also hopefully considering uh, any type of UX changes you, you need to make. Um, and then setting a hover listener to kind of watch for um, the user's pointer hovering over the item and, and out. Uh, again, this is really the biggest one we see that will lead to kind of misfunctionality um, or kind of really give you the, the desktop native feel or even just kind of the large screen native feel. Uh, in terms of hovering, most of our native components do handle this somewhat. But depending on the colors you're using, the contrast and, and change may not be uh, enough for you or your users, or uh, especially accessibility, things like that. Um, at the end of the day, though, um, you know how your users use the app, and you know the product. So uh, you know, take some time and, and use your app on kind of these different platforms, and think about how you would expect the app to behave, uh, things that you would expect the app to uh, take advantage of. A note-taking app that's stylus-based uh, may not really need to focus much on, on mouse input uh, or keyboard import input, where a productivity app uh, is really going to want to take advantage of all the screen real estate and find ways to let the users do what they need to do as fast as possible. Um, so talking about window management, um, this, again, is the, really the biggest area where we see crashes happen, because it's just uh, challenges that we've never had to face before uh, in kind of a mobile-only environment. Um, I love harping on rotation because I see so many apps that lock to portrait, um, which is completely understandable, but on these different platforms, it really shows kind of where the experience falls. Um, if you do lock to portrait on Chrome OS specifically, um, this is how your app will look like. You'll get these super cool black bars on the side, um, and it's really just a whole bunch of wasted screen real estate. On, on top of that, it also really shows the user and gives this really non-native feel, just because it doesn't really conform to the platform well. Now, why do we generally lock the portrait? Uh, usually to run away from handling configuration changes, because they've always been uh, rather difficult to deal with. Uh, but on these larger screen platforms, uh, configuration changes are, are more important than ever. Uh, Resizing and multi-window uh, brings a lot of new kind of uh, configuration change paradigms and, and challenges. Um, Chrome OS is probably one of the most complex uh, of the resizing uh, strategies because it does trigger configuration changes um, pretty frequently. I know some of the other desktop platforms um, don't uh, cause as many configuration changes. Um, on top of that, with bigger screens, multi-window is going to be used uh, much more frequently than before. Um, so any bugs that you do have in that are going to start kind of being surfaced a lot, lot more. Um, this is a, a 
quick gif about just kind of how resi resizing on Chrome OS works. So any anytime one of those labels changes, it's going through a complete uh, destroy and rebuild process. So you can imagine that this can get triggered substantially faster and substantially more often uh, than on a phone, just because rotation is just kind of slow. Uh, Jetpack helps with this. Uh, the things like ViewModel and being able to build your own uh, components that are lifecycle aware uh, really allows you to kind of uh, take all, any of your business logic that's in your activity, uh, anything you're doing to save state, and, and move it there so that your activity destroy and rebuild process is, is really quick. Um, your app will not always be in focus. Again, this isn't new. Uh, with Android um, N, like we brought multi-window, but um, on these larger screens, you're going to see this being the case a lot more often. Um, I know most of us at work with a large monitor have multiple things up at once. Um, and you need to make sure that your content is still visible and playing, even if you're not the focused app. So make sure that you're still displaying uh, messages if your messaging app or your content um, is continuing playing. And then take advantage of the features on these new uh, and different platforms. Um, larger screens and external monitors bring new possibilities. Um, one of the things that, that we've seen a couple apps do, such as uh, email apps or word processing apps that, that um, really kind of bring a, a better experience is um, allowing uh, you know, com email com compose windows or, or new documents be shown in different tasks so that the user can really see uh, their email plus this new email they're creating in a different window. Um, something that, that we released uh, quite a bit ago but is now uh, really being used a lot more is drag and drop. Uh, again, these desktop platforms specifically, users expect drag and drop to be a thing. Uh, they're not really going to understand that this is an Android app and we've never thought about it before, so why doesn't this exist? Um, so think about if drag and drop kind of makes sense in your app and, and how you can kind of bring it to, to these platforms. Um, and then not really window management, but uh, different features that are kind of new to some of these uh, ecosystems is just um, input cap different like input capabilities and specifically uh, like increased stylus usage. Um, the biggest things that we've seen that users have, have loved on some of the apps that we've worked with is uh, the ability to have keyboard shortcuts um, and keyboard navigation so that if they're heavy power users or there's things that people do often, um, they're able to, to do these things faster, get in and out of the app, get what they need to get done as, as quick as possible. So this is great and all, uh, but how do we actually build for this? Um, and moving on to tooling, you know, it'd be awful if I came up here and talked about kind of you should do all these things, yet there's no tools from us to make this possible. Uh, most of the tooling devices that we do have, or tooling examples that we do have are, are around Chrome OS. Uh, a, it's our platform, and then B, it's also kind of the most all-in-one platform that we have. Uh, most devices ship with a keyboard and trackpad. Um, some don't even have a touch screen. And then uh, it has one of the more complex resizing strategies. So um, it's kind of the best all-in-one platform to test on. Um, we, we're working on bringing some Android Studio integrations, specifically around larger screens in Chrome OS. Um, Lint editions are coming soon. Uh, it's actually my job once this event's over to finish this. Um, and then we're really looking at more things that we can bring to the IDE. Um, it's really great to have devices that you can test on, but um, we want to be able to give uh, quicker feedback and things to look for while you're actually developing uh, in the IDE. Uh, so if you have ideas, please come let me know. Uh, there's a Chrome OS emulator that's currently in preview. Uh, so if you don't have uh, devices, uh, you can download the, the emulator and start to kind of see uh, where your app falls apart, uh, things that don't work, uh, things that crash, things, um, you know, et cetera. Um, one of the biggest complaints for developing for Chrome OS and testing has been um, having to use ADB over Wi-Fi, and the development cycle has always been pretty crappy. Um, but on the uh, HP Chromebook X2 and the Pixelbook, uh, you can uh, ADB over USB, so you can actually bring the devices into the same uh, kind of development cycle that you do with phones. Um, other devices still require ADB over Wi-Fi, um, but we hope to bring uh, more and more, or more and more devices to this feature. But the easiest way really is just to run Android Studio on Chrome OS. Um, this is available uh, currently on the Pixelbook in preview, and we're hoping to bring it to more devices in the future. Um, and we do have this set up at the um, Android and Chrome OS tables, uh, as well as the Android Studio table. Um, being able to just kind of build the app and, and deploy it directly to the device 
uh, makes the whole development cycles uh, substantially easier and faster. At the end of the day, Android is always evolving. Uh, there's more and more platforms that are running APKs, whether they're uh, different flavors or even just your mobile APK. Uh, so make sure that your app is too. Uh, thank you. Uh, again, please uh, ask any questions, any suggestions that you have for tooling, um, any things that you've run into when trying to develop for kind of larger screen platforms. I would love to hear about it so that we can tackle this. Thank you. At Google I.O. 2017, we opened the door to Room, a persistence library that provides an abstraction layer over SQLite. Now, Room has reached version 2.0 and is part of Jetpack. We fixed the bugs you reported and added some of the features you asked for. Let's go over Room's main components and see what queries are supported, how to implement migrations, and how to test your work with a database. Let's say that you want to have a table of users, and you want every row of that table to be an instance of the user class. Annotate your class with app entity. Define the table name if you don't want to use the name of the class as table name. Set the mandatory primary key and the optional column info, but only if you want to change the name of the column. Otherwise, the field name is used. And that's it. Room will take care of the creation of the user table for you. So that's how the entity is done. But we need a way to access the data in the database. We do that with data access objects, DAOs for short. More precisely, create an interface annotated with app DAO. In this interface, declare all the methods needed to work with the database, annotating them with the corresponding SQL query. Room takes care of implementing these methods for you. The supported queries are insert, update, delete, query and raw query. All of them, except raw query, are checked at compile time, which means that if you write an invalid query, you'll find this out immediately. The class that puts together the entities and the DAOs is the room database. Create an abstract class that extends the room database. Annotate it, declare the entities and the corresponding DAOs. Let's take a closer look at the queries. The return type of query and raw query can be the entire entity, but also a subset of its fields. If you're working with Guava or with optional from the Java Util package, you can also use them as return types. So this means that if there are no values to satisfy your query, then your query will return optional.empty or optional.absent, depending on which optional you're working with. All of these queries are synchronous meaning that they will be run on the same thread you are triggering them from. Room ensures you follow best practices by throwing an error if you run queries on the main thread. So use your preferred method of handling threads in Android and make sure you're off the main thread. Room also supports asynchronous query when working with live data or RxJava. What's more, the queries that return live data or flowable are observable queries meaning that you will get notified every time the data in the table or tables updates. Whenever you alter your database schema, either because you've added or renamed a column or a table, you need to tell the database how to handle that change. In order to do that in your database class, you'll need to first, update your database version. Second, implement a migration class, which defines how to handle the migration from the old schema to the new one. And then thirdly, add that migration class as a parameter to the database builder. After triggering the migrations, Room validates the schema for you to ensure that the migration was done correctly. If you don't want to handle migrations and you don't need to preserve your database data, call fallback to destructive migrations when building the database. To destructively recreate the database only from a specific version on, call fallback to destructive migration from and provide the number for that version. So we have our entities, DAOs, database, and migrations. How do we test them? To test the DAOs, you'll need to implement an Android J unit test that creates an in-memory database. The in-memory database holds the data only for as long as the process is alive, meaning that after every test, the database is destroyed. 
To test asynchronous queries, use an instant task executor rule to execute each task synchronously. In your app's implementation, you'll end up referencing the DAOs in other classes. To unit test those classes, just mock the DAO or implement a fake version. Here's another tip. To implement espresso tests, covering code that uses asynchronous queries, extend the counting task executor rule to count the tasks as they start and finish. Finally, don't forget to test the migrations. Export the database schema first, and then use another handy test rule, the migration test helper. This class allows you to create the database in an older version and run and validate each migration. All you need to do is check that the data you inserted in the older version is also present after the migration. Okay, so let's summarize this. Let's boilerplate code, compile time check queries, ease of implementing migrations, a high degree of testability, and checks for keeping the database work away from the main thread. All of these qualities of Room make it easier and more pleasant to work with databases, helping you deliver better apps. It's best practice to provide resources for supporting all devices but sometimes it might seem like you need to make a trade-off between supporting devices and a small APK. Now, if you're not using multi-APK, supporting different screen densities, CPU architectures, and language could account for a pretty big chunk of your app's APK size. That's why we've introduced a new publishing format called the Android App Bundle. It'll mean smaller downloads for your audience and easier artifact management in the Play Console for you. An app bundle is a single comprehensive build artifact that you upload to Google Play instead of an APK. Compared to multi-APK, an app bundle delivers smaller apps to users and is simpler to manage because it's only one build artifact. When Google Play has your app bundle, it uses a new process for delivering APKs called dynamic delivery. Put simply, it only sends the portions of your app that each user needs. Now, just using the new app bundle format will automatically give your users APKs with only the language, screen density, and ABI resources that they require. And it requires no code refactoring from you. Building an app bundle is just a matter of selecting the right build output. When using Android Studio, here you'll see the option to generate a signed app bundle. Select building a bundle instead of an APK, provide your key, choose the destination folder, and you're done. You'll then have your shiny new app bundle. You'll also need to enroll in Google Play app signing in the Play Console. Google Play is essentially generating optimized APKs for your users, so you need to give it the ability to sign those APKs for you. App bundles are supported by Google Play right now. The technology that Play uses to generate APKs from the bundle is open source, so in the future, your app bundle will work with other app stores that enable support. Bundles work for all devices. Devices running Lollipop and higher get the greatest size benefit from dynamic delivery, but pre-Lollipop devices will still get a multi-APK style APK, which is automatically generated by Google Play from your app bundle. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at how Google Play actually uses this bundle, what dynamic delivery is doing, and how users get their APKs. In the past, you'd upload an APK, and then Play would then serve that same APK. When you upload an app bundle, Google Play takes that bundle and splits it into multiple smaller APKs, known as split APKs. The part of the app which is always downloaded is placed into a split APK called the base APK. When using a bundle, Play automatically makes split APKs for resources, assets, and native libraries. These resource-specific split APKs are called configuration APKs. Let's take a look at an example. I'm an English-speaking user on a Pixel 2 XL with 560 DPI resolution running on an ARM64 processor. If I install your app, Dynamic Delivery will find just the split APKs that I specifically need. These split APKs will be delivered down to compatible devices and behave like a single, customized APK that's optimized for my device. For earlier devices, Dynamic Delivery will send down a multi-APK with resource-appropriate ABI and density resources. With the introduction of the Android App Bundle and Dynamic Delivery, we're allowing for automatically smaller apps and a smoother deployment process. In addition, the app bundle format also introduces dynamic features, released in beta. Dynamic features allow you to modularize specific features and then deliver them to your users on demand. For more information, check out the links below. If you're curious about bundleifying your app, the best place to get started is g.co Android App Bundle. Happy coding!
Hello, welcome. I'm Jerome Doshe. I'm a software engineer at Google. I'm Chris Warrington. I'm also a software engineer. And I'm Isa. I'm also a software engineer. Hi, guys. I'm Leo. I'm a product manager. <laughs> um, and so we're here to talk about the Gradle plugin. But first, um, I wanted to talk about build speed. You probably heard from Karen this morning. We recently looked at our data and had some interesting findings that I wanted to share with you today in all transparency. The metrics that you're going to see um, comes from developers who opt into sharing their data with us. So if that's your case, thank you very much. All right. So first, we looked at build time change a little bit across a couple build times before and right after an Android Gradle plugin upgrade. And so what you see here is the median improvement in speed and percent. And you can see that outside of a minor regression in 3.1.2, we've been pretty consistent at 7 or 8% and even 20% with 3.2.0. So we thought, OK, if everyone upgrades to the latest 3.2.0 or the latest release, build speed should be getting faster and faster, right? Well, not exactly. <laughs> Turns out that when we looked at build speed over time, it is getting slower and slower. And I don't want to call this the build speed conundrum, but it got us a little bit puzzled. How is it possible that on one end, we keep, we keep improving with every release, and on the other end, we keep seeing build speed get slower and slower? So after some exploration, we realized that the build ecosystem is very complex. And I'm a new guy in Android, so I can tell you it is very complex for me. And it's rapidly evolving with so many things that can impact your build. For example, your apps are growing. You're writing more code. That's great. It can slow down your, uh, your build a little bit. But that's not the lion's share. Turns out that 96% of you use some form of Gradle plugin outside of the Android Gradle plugin, whether it's another Google plugin, a third-party plugin, or even something that you wrote for your own app or your own company. And when we took a look at some of those plugins, they were not all super optimized. There's also a lot of annotation processor out there, and they sometimes lack incrementality. So when you do a tiny change, it has to recompile everything, and your build speed goes away. Some new languages, like Java 8, for example, or Kotlin, can have some impact on your speed. With Java 8, we mitigated some of the impact by merging the dexing and the desugaring together in one step with the 8, and working a lot with JetBrains to, to improve the Kotlin compiler and annotation processor. There's also some resource scaling issues. If you have a lot of modules, some of the existing resource pipeline is not necessarily optimized. So you can see that that's a lot. And when you add all of this, it can have a pretty significant impact on your build. And to top it off, a recent survey that we did showed that 60% of developers either do not analyze build speed at all or do not know how to. So there's definitely an awareness problem as well around what can cause delay to your build. All right, so what can we do? Well, first, I want to recognize that some of what I just mentioned comes directly from us, Google at large. And we're really serious about improving this. We're taking steps internally to improve existing features as well as the new one. But as I mentioned, there's also an awareness problem and tooling issue. And we want to um, launch new features and new attribution features that can help you better understand what's going on with your build and what is really impacting your build. And we'll cover this in a little bit. We're also really doubling down on performance features, working together with Gradle. Um, and there's a lot of new features that I'll let Jerome, Chris, and Isabella share with you. Thank you. All right, so let's get started. What did we add in the latest 3.2 uh, release? Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is uh, incrementality in annotation processor that uh, Leo alluded before. Um, as you probably know, uh, Java C and even Kotlin C has been incremental for quite some time. Uh, however, if you have annotation processors, all of this incrementality uh, goes out of the door, and so it's a big problem. 
And so it has enormous performance ramifications because when we look at our internal dashboards, we can see that uh, the JVM bytecode production tasks are the most consuming task of our build times. So basically being non-incremental is a huge problem. So Gradle uh, with Groupon and uh, with Google has come up with InCap, which is aimed at making annotation processes incremental. Now there's really two levels of supports that we are aiming for. The first one is called aggregating, which basically means that if you change a class which is annotated with an annotation of interest, we will have to recompile all the classes which are annotated with the same annotations. So it's not exactly incremental, but it's better than, re than recompiling everything. The other one, which is called isolating, which is much better, much more fine-grained, will allow you to recompile only what has changed. Right? So there's these different levels of support. What is important to realize for some of you is that uh, if you have annotation processes yourself that you developed in-house, it would be your responsibility to make those annotation processes uh, in-cap compliant. We are working hard internally to make the most popular annotation processes uh, in-cap compliant. So we're going to do Dagger and we're going to do you know, data binding and all this kind of stuff. But if you have your own, you're going to have to work on it yourself. Um, and if you don't, we also plan to make it very, very clear that if we have to uh, revert our compilation to not be incremental, we were going to make it very clear which annotation processes are making, forcing us to not be incremental. So if you're providing those, um, expect to have some bad publicity coming from us saying, yep, we are running non-incremental because of those annotation processes. The second thing I want to talk about is App Bundle. Uh, so you must have heard about it by now. Uh, in the past, when people wanted to reduce the APK size, they had to do uh, multi-APK which uh, resulted in a lot of the manual steps uh, related to deployments, was very complicated. So now what you can do is basically create this app bundle, which is a glorified zip file with a universal APK in a specific format, which cannot be immediately uh, installed on a device, but can be used by the Play Store to pre-create all these different APKs for all the different devices that you're targeting. So you have got fast delivery, all this nice feature without having to do it yourself. Now, one of the things you need to understand as a developer uh, using the, the, the Android Gradle plugin is that there are things which have changed because of that, right? For instance, you know, you can define, if you use modularity and you have feature modules, for instance, you can define a number of things inside those, those um, feature modules, yet the base module is the one that will actually be um, providing some information even for the feature modules. So, for instance, the application ID, the version code, soon the signing information, all of those comes from the base ID. In theory, we would want to reduce the DSL per module type so that you could only, you could only provide on the, on the build gradle of each of these feature module the exact information that we know we will be using. But we don't have time, so it's the same DSL everywhere, and you have to be aware that some of it will be ignored in the feature modules. Also, for instance, the mapping file for a bundle file will also be uh, for, the, uh, for the base module. Now, when you add modularity um, inside your application, it's relatively easy at the build level. Uh, all you have to do is to use the right plugin, as I described in this slide. In the base module, you have the base functionality, and then you apply the application uh, plugin, which you have used for years. In the feature module, you can apply the dynamic feature. Now, um, we have to declare a special dependency from the base module to all of the different features. And I will explain you later why this is necessary. But this is something that you need to understand is that obviously you have a dependency from the feature module to the base, but you also need to make a dependency from the base to the features. So as an example here, uh, we've got the code shrinking flow. And I'm going to show how this changes when you start introducing feature modules and modularity inside your application. So here you've got a simple example. You've got a base module. You've got three feature modules, module A, module B, module C. So far, nothing too specific. Of course, each of these feature modules depends on the base. Now, by adding this DSL declaration, we are declaring now the dependency or the fact that those feature, those module A, B, and C are feature modules. OK, so far, simple. But you can see that now we have this dependency going both ways. So, when we go through the build flow, the first thing that we do, obviously, is that we build 
normally all the Java source files, we compile all the Java source files into classes.jar. That's so normal. That's the normal process that we go through when we build uh, each of these different modules. But the, the, the thing that really starts to differ when you're dealing with, uh, with feature modules is that you, we are publishing back all of these uh, jar files back to the main module. And that's absolutely necessary because when we do the code shrinking, you need to have a global view of the application. You can't do a shrinking just on the feature module because you will not know how and what they use of the base uh, classes, for instance. So once you have those uh, published to the base, you can feed it to the shrinker and the splitter, and eventually it's going to create uh, equivalent DEX files. Uh, as you can guess, there is more or less a one-to-one -one mapping between the original jar file containing the class files and the DEX files containing the DEXs, but it's not exactly a one-to-one. -one. So for instance, let's say that you had classes that were in your base module that you thought would be shared by different uh, features, but only end up being used by, say, module B, then it's perfectly legal for the splitter to decide that he wants to move those classes into the dexb.jar instead of keeping them inside the main dex.jar of the main module. Um, but otherwise, you can more or less imagine that there is a one-to-one -one mapping. So once this is done, uh, you've got all these dex files which are still residing in the base module. Now they're going to flow back into the originating module, dynamic feature module. And that we do that so that you can have as much parallelism in your build. So as you can see, at the beginning, we had the compilation happening in each of the submodules. It was potentially parallelized. Depends on the machine you have. But if you have a powerful machine, all of those will run in parallel. Then we moved everything to the base. Then it becomes kind of a bottleneck for the build system because it has to wait for all the modules to be ready to be able to do the shrinking. But once this is done, we can move back the processing to each of the submodules. So you can see that um, adding modularity to your application may be a good software practice, but it's also a good practice in terms of the build, because we're going to get much faster over time. We move as much stuff as we can towards the, the leaves of all of these modules, and we can run all of those in parallel as much as possible. Once this is done in parallel, we, once this is pushed back to each different feature module, we can then resume the normal processing, and eventually we will you know, create all the necessary APKs or all the necessary uh, artifacts to be able to create the app bundle. All right, so all of those, again, is in parallel. Now, obviously, the shrinker, the fact it's a little bit of a bottleneck, like I explained earlier, is usually not a problem, because not a problem for debug build, at least, because usually people do not use shrinker code shrinking during the debug builds. It's only done through for the release builds. But we really try to limit these bottlenecks as much as we can. And Chris will explain also how we have enhanced a lot uh, the resource processing uh, with this type of, uh, of improvements. Um, another thing that we added in 3.2 was D8. Uh, so D8 is the new uh, JVM bytecodes to DEX file translation, translator. Uh, we will eventually remove the old one, which was called DX. If you're still using DX, you really need to start panicking because we are going to remove it. And once we removed it, you will not be able to upgrade any longer. So if you are using DX because you have issues with D8, you must file a, bi a bug immediately and follow through to figure out what is wrong, if it's with your build or if it's with D8 itself. Uh, otherwise, you're going to get stuck in the past. Uh, our 8 is going to follow more or less the same path, meaning like, it's available right now to try. We are very happy with the, uh, with the results we are getting so far. So it's very stable. You should definitely try it. Um, eventually, it will become stable. And you can guess what's going to happen to the old cold shrinker to ProGuard. Eventually, we will also remove it and completely replace it with R8. Um, if you want more details, there is a session tomorrow that will give you a lot more technical details about how these two, um, these two libraries are implemented. OK, let's talk a little bit about what's next in 3.3. Uh, so the first, th first thing I want to talk about is um, lazy tasks. Uh, so Gradle has introduced the concept of lazy task. And a lazy task is you should really understand it as a task that will only get initialized and configured if it is on the execution task graph. So that means, for instance, if you've got, let's, let's keep it simple. You've got two variants, the debug variant, the release variant. If, you, if you're calling assemble debug, there's no need to 
to, to initialize or to configure any of the tasks related to the release variant. And so what's, what, what we used to do, unfortunately, so this was done before in this particular example where we used to create all the tasks. We still have to do that. But at the creation time, we were also configuring them. So we were ending up configuring all the tasks for debug variants and all the tasks for release variants, even though only the debug were eventually going to be executed. With lazy task, Gradle is giving us the tool to basically delay all of this initialization until it knows that those tasks will be executed. Now, when I say executed, it's not entirely true, because what it really means is that it's, uh, it's going to be up-to-date checked, meaning it's going to look if the task needs to be run or not by running its up-to-date checks. But potentially, at least, the task is on the execution task graph and may be executed if it's uh, out of date. So uh, how do you do lazy tasks? Um, it's basically very similar to the, old, to the old style. Instead of doing create, you call register. But you can see that now the configuration code, which is in blue here, where you initialize the input food value, will only be called if the task is on the execution task graph. Now, we used to really pay a lot of attention for all of our configuration tasks to make this configuration block as lean as possible because they were always executed. So if you were to do you know, Gradle tasks, it would always execute all of this configuration. So we try to keep it as lean as possible with no access to disk, no access to uh, network, for instance. Now, it's a, probably a little bit more OK to do more work in those uh, configuration um, if you really have to. But you have to remember two things. First, um, if you do real work, <laughs> it will still impact your build time because uh, the, the configuration time is still a mono-threaded event in Gradle, meaning all of the configuration will happen one after the other. So the more you do, the longer it will take. And you already know today that you know, configuration time happens all the time. It's very annoying. We are really trying to reduce it to the bare minimum, but any time is really annoying. Um, the second thing is to not look up tasks anymore. So when you have like build Gradle customization, a lot of people are like, you know, doing project get task by name or kind of stuff like that. This will actually look up the task and initialize it and configure it. And if you do that, it will not only do that for the task itself, but all of its transitive dependencies as well. All the tasks it uses and all the output and all this kind of stuff. So you basically have a good chance of initializing the entire world. Instead of doing that, you should uh, get a provider and, and get a lazy object of the task itself and use that to register your dependency. Now, what you can also do if you want to have access to the output of a task is use that provider and map the output using this type of API to get a provider. So it's basically a promise on a folder or a promise on a regular file that the task that may execute will give you later. You can see how the level of interactions you're getting here. But eventually, it will give you the idea that you can get an object which represents the output of a task. And that object does not initialize the task itself. Getting this, this, this provider does not initialize the task, does not force it to run. And it's really lazy. And, and it contains also the dependency information. It means you don't have to register yourself as a dependent of the task producing this uh, output folder. Just holding the object itself, the provider, will allow you to not only get the object, but also register your dependency on whoever is producing it. Eventually, you can do a get, and that will give you the actual task, uh, the actual object that you can use to configure your own task. So here, when bar is getting configured, foo gets configured, and eventually all the dependency of foo will get configured, and so on and so forth. So you can see how lazy this is becoming. We are retrofitting all of our tasks to become uh, using providers and stuff like that. So if you use customization a lot, you really need to look into these new APIs in 3.3. And now Chris will talk about some of the other improvements we've made. Yeah, so another optimization um, to the build process coming up in 3.3 um, is light R classes. So previously, the Android Gradle plugin would generate an R.java for every single dependency in every sub-project, and then compile them alongside your actual classes. In Android plugin 3.3, it just generates a, a jar containing the class directly. Um, especially for builds with many library subprojects and lots of dependencies, this avoids a lot of compilation, a lot of I.O. <laughs> for some large multi-module builds, um, we actually saw double-digit percentage um, speed-ups um, when building from clean due to this change. 
So the R class system in Android Studio 3.3 has been rewritten to simulate all of these R classes in memory, um, rather than relying on the ones on disk. Happily, this, as well as enabling this optimization of the build, it actually speeds up indexing in Android Studio as well, um, even for projects with older Gradle plugins. This does, however, break some Gradle plug plugins that depend on reading that R file directly, including Butterknife, which I'm working on fixing. Um, and it's implemented for libraries in 3.3, and we're working on implementing it for applications and tests too. Um, as Jerome mentioned earlier, Gradle now has support for incremental annotation processing, but it does need support from the annotation processes themselves. And yeah, he said that we're working to support the most popular annotation processes, including Dagger, Room, Glide, AutoValue, and some others. Um, we're also working to re-architect data binding to allow it to be an isolated annotation processor, speeding up your incremental recompilation even more. We also want to help you understand that build time impact of annotation processes. So we want to report to you like which annotation processor was time spent in and how much did they cost. On that theme, there are several other areas we want to give you better insight into your builds, easily and simply. So yeah, if you're using annotation processes, um, that's really critical that you have that insight, because they're often a bottleneck for incidental builds for a lot of builds that we see. When a Gradle task causes you trouble, it's really helpful to know the Gradle plugin or the script where it was created and what triggered it to run. Um, and we're working to make finding that out more easy. We also want to help you find these types of issues, even if you're not actively looking for them. So longer term, um, we want Android Studio to flag if there is an issue, um, or if something changed and regressed. And we'll point you towards the Gradle build scan, which is a powerful tool for getting a bit of insight into how your build's working. OK, so on from these kind of better insights to complete rewrites, um, Android resource namespacing. Resource namespacing is a completely new pipeline for compiling and linking Android resources. So we're actually doing this for two reasons. Firstly, speed up the build and make it easier to understand. And secondly, we want to better support dynamic features. Looking at think how things work now, in the existing resource pipeline, there are two namespaces, the Android platform and everything else. That means that if you have two libraries, they define a resource of the same name and the same type. The resource manager has to pick one. And it's not always clear what the right thing to do is, or even that this is happening at all. This actually also makes splitting your APK up into several dynamic features much more difficult. As each dynamic feature is shipped separately, where those resources come from and where they go is really important. So with resource namespacing, each library is compiled and linked separately, and then linked together into the final APKs. The R class in applications will no longer have final IDs. And then when you're using resources from both XML and from Java, you need to be explicit about where they came from. So each resource is only listed in the R class for the library that defined it. And in XML, you need to use the namespace of the resource to refer to it. This also means that resources no longer implicitly override one another just because they had the same name. For cases where you needed these overrides in the application, we're working a new way to do that explicitly. ARs that we generate from namespace libraries will be backwards compatible. So you can have all the benefits of namespacing yourself, um, but not impose it on your consumers until they're ready to switch. OK, passing on to Isabella to tell you a bit more about the details. Thank you. OK, now that we know what resource namespacing is, let's move on to how to, in the future, namespace your app or library. You might find yourself asking questions like, where is that resource coming from? Or what is the proper syntax? Or how do I even namespace my dependencies? Well, the, the answer to all these questions is, we'll fix it for you. Oh. <laughs> uh, so yes, so the solution is automatic namespacing or auto namespacing for short. There are two main parts here. First is the automatic rewriting tool in the IDE, which will help you migrate your local modules to be namespaced. And the second one are the transforms and tasks um, in the Gradle plugin that will rewrite your remote dependencies under the hood, no actions required. 
Um, here is an example dependency graph. Um, the, blue, not the blue nodes are local modules that can be rewritten using the um, IDE tool. The three orange nodes are not namespaced, classic, remote libraries that will be automatically rewritten by the AGP. This means all the resources, classes, the manifests will be rewritten to use the full resource namespace. Uh, and finally, the green nodes are, um, they represent dependencies that are already namespaced, so they will not be modified at all. Uh, let's see what types of changes we can see after this migration takes place. Uh, in the bytecode or Kotlin and Java uh, sources, you can see that now there will be different R classes present. If a resource was defined in a different module or a remote library, you will see the package of the R class will change to match that package. Um, in the XML resource references, uh, like in the values files or in the manifest, you will see the new namespace appear between the at symbol and the type of the resource, similar to the Android namespace. Um, and finally, another way resources can be referenced uh, is in attributes, for example, in layouts. Here, the XML namespace will be modified to point to the correct package instead of res auto, and the attribute will use this new namespace as well. And since we're already on the topic of resources, let's talk about resource visibility. So probably many of you uh, created an Android library with a lot of effort into declaring which resources are public, and then publish this AAR with the public.txt. Only for consumers to ignore it. This currently is only a lint warning. This code compiles and runs fine at runtime, completely ignoring the intended visibility of the resource. I'm sure many of you actually ignore these warnings as well. Great, so to combat this, we want to introduce stricter resource visibility. So these violations will now become build errors instead, so we will catch them early. And we will introduce three levels of visibility. One, public. This means these resources will be present both in the public art classes of the consumers and the private art classes for that local module. Private resources, only present in private R classes. And last, private XML only resources. They will be not present in any R classes at all. Instead, they will be only, um, you can only reference them from other XML files within that module. This will result in smaller R classes, both compile and runtime, and also resource hermetization similar to the class or method hermetization currently in Java or Kotlin. So with that, Leo. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, we're working on a lot of things, and many of which we hope would help with beat speed. But going back to my point around awareness and tooling, I want to share some of the things that you can do today to understand your build better and improve its performances. So the first thing is to upgrade. If you recall my first graph, we do improve with every release. And so if you really uh, care about your build speed, the best thing to do is to upgrade to the latest stable, beta, canary, whichever you feel most comfortable with. Down to toolings. There's uh, some tools out there that you can start leveraging to better understand your builds. One that I really like is dash dash scan. It's a free tool from Gradle. It uploads some of your build data into Gradle servers and then provide a very comprehensive dashboard around task durations, plugins, dependencies, and many, many more things. So if you're trying to understand what's going on with your build, why is it slow, this is a very, very useful resource to use. Sharing some of your build data with Gradle is not something that you feel comfortable doing. There's the Poorsman's version of it, which is dash dash profile. Dash dash profile will create a local HTML file that you can open in a browser to show some information about your build. It's definitely not as rich as the dash dash scan, but it provides some information and remains local. You can combine it with dash dash info, which gives you information on why a given task ran. 
Another tip, which is more of a continuous request, um, is to file bug. We really try to test all of our releases on as many environment and use cases that we can, can, but there's always edge cases and different configurations out there. So please file bugs when you encounter issues. And when you do file a bug, please include a scan with it. It really helps us deep, go deeper into the issue and understand what's going on. Last but not least, if you're writing plugins, whether it's for you to publish them or, just, or even just customize a little bit your build file, here is a set of tips to follow. So first, as Jerome alluded to, configuration is really just to set up tasks, not really do anything else. And as, when, as was mentioned earlier, remember, if you need to compute things for up-to-date checks, checks, you can always use provider and suppliers to only run those checks if your task is part of the active graph. For example, in configuration, you should not do things like query git, read a file, search for a connected device, or compute anything. Configuration is really just a place to set up tasks. And it's the place to set up all tasks. Because build doesn't really know what pass is going to take in advance, so really try to set up all of your tasks in the configuration step. Regarding tasks, make sure that each task declare, declare all input and outputs, even if it's non-file ones. And make sure that they're incremental and cacheable. If you're working with a complex step, try to split it into multiple tasks. This really helps with the incrementality, because some tasks could be up to date, what others do work. And if you have multiple tasks, they could run in parallel. So it helps with incrementality and parallelism. This third um, best practice sounds obvious, but I still want to put it out there. Just make sure your tasks don't write into or delete any other task output. Um, When you, write ta I'm sorry. when you write tasks, use Java and Kotlin instead of Groovy, and put them in a plugin slash build src file folder. And last but not least, as you've heard from Jerome, leverage the new worker API. Um, oh, no, we didn't talk about this. No. Oh. But leverage the new worker API. I did talk about parallel stuff. Though. Yeah. <laughs> um, that really helps with parallelism. All right, if you didn't get it clear, pictures of all of what I just said, uh, don't worry. We're working on a full write-up covering everything that we talked about around speed, around the findings that I shared, the tooling, the best practices, and more. So stay tuned. To recap, here's the takeaway from the session. First, we, sh we shared some finding on speed and that we're basically a little bit outpaced by some of the features, the plugins, and all the other things that are impacting build speed, but we're taking this very seriously. And so we're doubling down our efforts on better tooling and attribution that you heard, as well as continuing to improve performances. We share the new features in 3.2, and I definitely encourage you to upgrade to 3.2 if you haven't already. And we mentioned some of the things that we're working for 3.3 and beyond. And by the way, 3.3 beta is available, so I encourage you to try it. It has all some of the things that we mentioned, like lazy tasks um, and others. And last, I talked about some of the tools that you can use, dash dash can, dash dash profile, today to understand your build, and share some of the best practice if you're writing plugins or customizing your build speed. That's it for today. I want to make a bad joke, but. Unlike build, we finished earlier than expected. So <laughs> uh, we're going to be out there with, uh, in the speaker Q&A or at the studio booth today and tomorrow if you have any questions. So thank you.
everyone. The next session in this room will begin at 4.50. Thank you, everyone.
Welcome back, everyone. As a point of information, this session will get underway in two minutes, and we ask you as a courtesy to the presenters to take a moment to silence your phones and your digital devices. We thank everyone. Come on in and be seated. Our program will get underway in two minutes. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm super excited to be here, and today we're going to be talking about constraint layout with a focus heavily on the visual editor, how to use the visual editor to effectively make constraints in Android Studio. Uh, so I'm going to start out by talking about the basics, and then... Oh, I'm Chris, UX designer on Android Studio, and I'll be talking about some of the new features we've added to Android Studio for constraint layout. Awesome, awesome. And I'm Sean McQuillan, developer advocate for Android. After we talk about the basics, the features that shipped in Constraint Layout 1.0, 1.1, we're going to talk about some of the new features that are coming out in Constraint Layout 2.0. So let's dive in. What are constraints? So when I add a view to a constraint layout in the visual editor, I'm going to get these four new handles, one on the left, top, right, and bottom. If I click one of those, or if I go over to the view inspector over here, and I click that, I'm going to go ahead and add a constraint to this view. So I want to pause for a second here and mention that in constraint layout, before I added this constraint, constraint layout is going to add that view to the view hierarchy, but it's just going to lay it out somewhere on the screen. So I'm going to add that constraint. It's 30 dp off the top. And if I add another one to the left, I've now fully constrained this view. Now constraint layout knows how to solve where this view goes. And we're going to see, starting with this very simple example, how to kind of build up more complex examples of constraints. Now, of course, I could change this 30 dp margin to be 50 dp, or I could set both of them to 0 dp and then add a constraint over on the right side. And if I do that, I'm actually going to center this view. And if I add another constraint on the bottom, I'm going to center this view on the entire constraint layout. And this trick of constraining equally on the right and the left is going to work everywhere in constraint layout. This is how you center a view inside or on top of another view. So, Let's take a look at one more thing I can do with just a single element using constraint layout. So if I look at the slider that's over on the left, it starts at 50 when I've constrained the top and the bottom like this. And I can change that. I can change it up to 25. And when I do that, instead of centering it exactly, it's going to introduce a bias. It's the bias slider. It's going to introduce a bias to the layout. Now it's going to lay that out 25% along the way, 75% along the way. And of course, there's, of course, a horizontal slider as well. 
So let's dive in further into this view inspector and taking a look at what's available in the visual editor. So there's this triple chev going on here inside of this view inspector. And I asked John Hofford about this, and he said that's because it's wrapped content, so it's like trying to pull in as hard as it can from both sides. So this is what it's going to show for wrapped content. I can change that, of course, to fixed width. That's 100 dp. That's not too exciting. I can also change that to match constraints. So match constraints is a new feature for constraint layout. It's a new way to lay out views. And what it says is take up all of the views, all of the space available by the constraints given. So in this case, I'm constrained off the right and the left, so it's basically the same thing as fill parent. And this is how you would take up the full screen in constraint layout. You wouldn't want to use fill parent in constraint layout. And when I'm in match constraints, I get this really interesting icon here. And I originally thought this was a heartbeat for the longest time. I thought this was like a heartbeat icon. I asked John about this. It turns out that's actually a spring. And on some versions of Android Studios, you get two springs. And on some versions, you get one. So I guess it's more springy for some of us than others. So let's switch this back over to wrap content. And let's add another view so we can start building more complex layouts. So I'm just going to add an image view. Then I'm going to constrain it so it's you know, 20 dp off of this text view. Then I'm going to constrain it on the right. And it does you know, what we'd expect, right? It's going to go ahead and move that image view so it's 20 dp off the left. And the ends are aligned. Now I'm going to add another constraint over on the right. And we'll see that this image view is going to center itself. And so here we can see this centering trick that we did for the whole screen. We can do this on another view as well. Now, I want to change the width of this view from wrap content to match constraints. And this time, instead of match constraints, meaning it's going to take the whole screen, it's going to take the width of this text view. Whatever size that text view is, this image view is going to try to match that constraint as well. And when I do that, this new control shows up in the visual editor. So this little line, it creates a little triangle. And when I click it, actually enable an aspect ratio on this image view. And this is, this is a really nice feature if you want to display an image with an aspect ratio. Images, you know, when we get them from designers or from the web, they come in whatever aspect ratio. And our designer always wants them to be 1 by 1 or 2 by 1 or 16 by 9. You're laughing because you're a designer. and It's my fault. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and so we can set up exactly what our designers ask for. And we'd have to write a lot of code to do the resizing or to fix this aspect ratio, and also resize this view as that text view changes at the same time while maintaining this aspect ratio. Now, if I set this aspect ratio to 3 to 1, I kind of introduce these conflicting constraints here. I've set one aspect ratio that says, I'd like this to be 3 to 1 aspect ratio, or one constraint, 3 to 1 aspect ratio. And then another constraint saying, this can be no wider than this text box. And this constraint layer has to solve both of these at the same time. And it's going to choose to use the constraints from the text box above the aspect ratio. I can free up another dimension for constraint layout to solve. So if I change the height to be match constraints, it's capable of resizing both dimensions. So now it can set the 3 to 1 aspect ratio by making this image view less tall. So that's all we can do with just a single you know, element or two elements. Let's add a little bit more of a complex view and talk about how to lay things out with more features from constraint layout. So my designer just sent me this lovely email form. Thank you. Uh, and so uh, I want to pause for a second and mention this is a talk about constraint layout. This is not a talk about how to design login forms. I did one of those earlier today. Please don't copy this login form. There's many problems. Uh, but we can see here there's a couple things going on. The labels are right aligned to some sort of invisible line in the center of the screen. The edit texts appear to be left aligned to that same line. And then the login and new account button are kind of hanging off, and they appear to be aligned to the you know, edit text right. Um, and then at the same time, email and password appear to be vertically centered on the screen. And we're going to try to do all of those things in constraint layout. So before we do that, how are we going to lay out those you know, text views, right? We have the email text, and then we have the email edit text. We could align like the top of the text view to the top of the text view, or the bottom of the text view to the bottom of the edit text. Uh, but that would actually be incorrect. And if we take a look at how fonts work, just dive into fonts for a second and look at font metrics. We have a bunch of them. We have this baseline at the bottom, which in English, in most languages, almost everything sits on. And then at the very top, we have the ascender line, which nothing goes above. And then out at the bottom, that dashed line is the descender line. And it turns out that the metric that really matters is this baseline. And if we line out two texts that have completely different fonts next to each other along the baseline, that creates uh, a single line of text for our eyes. And it allows us to read it as a coherent unit. So we want to do that in constraint layout. So if I select this email label, 
I'm going to get this control and constraint layout. It looks like this. I've enlarged it substantially so you can see it. And when I click it, I get my favorite control in all of Android Studio. It actually blinks in the editor, and I call it the green glowing orb of baseline. So we can go over to the edit text and click that same thing. And now we can drag from one constraint, or sorry, one baseline to the other and create a constraint saying these text views should have the same baseline. And we'll do that for all of the other text views on the screen here uh, in order to set up all the baseline alignments. And when you line up text next to text, you almost always want to use the baseline. That's the correct way to do it um, all the time, especially in constraint layout. So now let's go ahead and put that login button on the screen as well. So the login button has to be constrained off this edit text, and then it's also going to get constrained on the right side. Then let's figure out how to do this centering, right? The email and password is vertically centered on the screen. How am I going to do that? So we've been doing this thing where we put a constraint on both sides of a view, and it centers. So let's try to do that. So I'm going to put a constraint from email up to the top of the screen. It's going to pull stuff up to the top, from password down to the bottom of the screen. And it's going to pull stuff down to the bottom. And so far, this makes sense. Now, I guess I'm going to have to add a constraint from password to email, right? Because I want these things to go back together. So I'm going to do that. And this is actually going to center password between email and the bottom of the screen, which is not quite what I wanted. Let's pull email back down with another constraint. And when I do that, I'm actually going to solve this problem like a little bit differently than how I did before. This introduces what's called a chain in constraint layout, and it's going to solve it with the chain solver. Now, of course, setting up all of those constraints by hand in the visual editor is kind of tedious. So there's a helper for this. You can go into right-click on center and choose vertically when I have email and password selected. And when I do that, it's going to set up all of the constraints that I just talked about. So inside of a chain, there's actually three different ways it can get laid out. Well, four, technically, but three that I use all the time. So we have spread, which means evenly distribute everything. So this looks similar to what we did with linear layout. And we have spread inside, which is basically the same thing, except the first and the last elements get pushed to the edges. And then the one I use most of the time is packed. This says push everything towards the center of the screen and center it as a group. And so that's what we're going to use here. right? We're going to use a packed chain in order to center both of these views together. So there's one more thing we need to do. right? We need to put this invisible line in the middle of the screen that everything's kind of based around. So to do that, I'm going to go to Helpers, and I'm going to add a vertical guideline. So vertical guideline is basically, you can think of it as a new edge of the screen. So it's like, I have one on the left of the screen, I have one on the right of the screen, and now I've put an edge of the screen in the middle of the screen that I can use as an anchor for constraints. I'm going to kind of move that to where I'd like it in my design. And now I can just take those text views and create constraints from those to this guideline. And to kind of visualize what this is doing underneath, if I move the guideline, it's actually going to move the entire layout now. So let's move that back, and then let's get another design, because it turned out that design was not performing very well. So after many user studies, we've discovered the solution to our login form is left aligning the labels. So my job is now to implement this. So let's try to do that. Well, I did it, and I translated it to German, and this is what happened. This is not, not great. So what happened here? So it turns out, uh, if I lay this out similar to the way I just did, right? so password's the longest field in, this, in these labels. So if I set up a constraint from the edit text over to password, and then another constraint from the edit text down to the password edit text, this is going to work great in English. But then when I translate it to German, these constraints, this invariant I had that password is the longest field is no longer correct. So what I'm going to need is something that's dynamic, that's based on all of these things. It's kind of like a view group. Um, you know, basically, I might want like a linear layout to hold these things. But actually, I'm in constraint layout, so how do I do that in constraint layout? Well, it turns out there's another helper, and we're going to use that now. So if we go into helpers, and we use add vertical barrier, this allows you to add a barrier to the screen. What a barrier is, is it's kind of like a view group. In fact, it's actually called a group in code. So we can open up the component tree, select our email and password, and drag that down to be inside of our barrier. Now, it's not actually a view group. It's just a view that's added to the screen. It's positioned on one side or the other of all of the views that are inside of it. Right? By default, it's on the left. But if I open up the attributes pane and scroll down to the bottom, I'm going to find a barrier direction, which I can set to the end. And now that I've done that, I'm going to set up my constraints and then translate my English over to German. And everything's going to relay out and do exactly what I expected. So that's 
really it. That's all of the features in Constraint Layout 1.0 and Constraint Layout 1.1. So now I'm going to pass it over to Chris, who's going to talk more about more tricks that can be used to use the visual editor to build constraints. Cool. Uh, thanks, Sean. So with Constraint Layout, we've, you know, over time introduced many concepts. And so, you know, we started with the basics, which is just constraints, margins, baselines, and chains. But over 1.1 and 2.0 alpha, we've introduced things like guidelines and barriers and groups, and then there's many more helpers to come. And then, of course, there's motion layout. But one thing that we've heard consistently is that as we've added more concepts and the layouts have become more complex, it's actually become increasingly harder to manage all of these with constraint layout. And so what I'm here to tell you today is that we've actually been improving a lot of this in the visual editor in Android Studio. And so the four areas I'll talk about are creating constraints and how we improve that, also some new view options we added to the design surface, and then some tricks around zooming and panning, which are super useful when you're dealing with constraint layout, and then, of course, using sample data, which we introduced back in uh, 3.2. So creating constraints. So you know, in this case, we have two components. It's pretty simple. We have an image view and a text view. And so if we want to center the image view, then we just put one constraint on the top and one on the bottom. But let's take that lovely login form from before. So from a UI perspective, this is actually not too complicated. We just have some labels, we have some inputs, and we have some buttons. But from the constraint point of view, there's actually a lot going on. So you know, we have this guideline in the middle. We have the login button constrained to the bottom and the right of the input. We have the inputs themselves constrained to the guideline. And so because all these components are pretty close to each other, you know, when you're dragging these constraints around in the layout editor, it can actually be pretty challenging to get, the, get it right. Yeah, even when I made that slide, I hid half the constraints because it was too busy. Yeah. Yeah, this is very simplified, actually. <laughs> so one thing we've done is actually is we've added the ability to add constraints directly with the context menu. So in this case, um, you know, if you have components that are really close to each other, this makes it a lot more precise and more direct to actually set those constraints. So in this case, um, and this is available in 3.3 beta as well, uh, so you can try it out today. And so in this case, if we select one component, which we have this uh, lovely cat picture, um, you can just simply constrain it to the parent. So what does it look like if you have multiple, comp multiple components? So in this case, we have these two text views that are really close to each other. And so I'm um, not sure if people have tried to create constraints between two text views that almost overlap. It becomes a little painful when you're going from the bottom of one to the top of the other. And so with this new context menu, you can actually just keep the two selected. And then when you open up the context menu, there's now this constraint menu. And so you can actually just see that the two elements that you want to use are there, and then you can easily cascade to the right constraint that you want. And in this case, you know, we only have, uh, we're only showing the start and end, and that's because, in this case, the top and bottom constraints have already been set, so we don't show them. So we can look at another example. So here, we want to constrain the location icon to this vertical guideline that's all the way on the left. So if you use the drag and drop method, what you'll notice is that as you drag from the left or sorry, from the right all the way to the left, you get all these, I guess Sean's favorite little green flashing stuff. Um, a lot of these targets that all show up when you try to create the constraint. And so if you're trying to target some of these smaller things like the following text or the numbers, it actually gets pretty hard when you're trying to do drag and drop with constraint layout. And so again, this makes it a lot more direct. So you can select the guideline and the icon and just use the context menu. And if you really don't want to select these things on the design surface, you can totally use the component tree. Um, this is, becomes even more useful depending on how deep or how complex your hierarchies get, um, and does the exact same thing. But if you do like drag and drop, you know, you can still do it. And one thing that we've tried to make easier is actually when you drag it. And so in this case, we have this new gesture which, pending, is called drag to center, and so. I think, as I had mentioned before, as you drag, you now see all these like, little targets. And so instead of trying to actually target those specific green dots, you can just simply drag to the middle of the thing that you want to actually constrain to. And so in this case, this is just some screenshots. If I drag from the mountain view text view, I can just drag all the way to the middle of the cat picture, 
release the mouse, and then I get this nice pop-up menu that just shows me the two constraints that I can set. And so in this case, because the mountain view, we're going from the left of the mountain view text view to the cat picture, the two constraints that make sense are actually the left and the right, or start and end. And we actually have this as well, which comes in handy when you have overlapping views. And so this one's pretty simple, but sometimes you, know, you have views that you want to hide and show at runtime. And so all you have to do is drag to wherever you, to the target. And what we'll do is actually figure out which views are under that pixel that you released to the mouse, and then show you a context menu accordingly. So if we move on to view options, so the design surface has always had a bunch of view options to, to take advantage of when you're working with your layouts. So the two I'll talk about specifically are, which we added, is show all constraints and live rendering. So if we go back to our login form, we're going to reuse this a lot. <laughs> uh, you know, the constraints are set here, but the thing is, you know, when you're trying to, like, let's say you're new to this layout and you're trying to actually edit constraints on one of these controls, there's actually a lot going on. And actually, again, this is pretty simplified compared to the normal uh, design surface. And so what we've done in Android Studio 3.3 is we've added this option to show all constraints, but it's actually turned off by default. And so here's a quick video to show you what that looks like. And so what we'll do instead is we only show the constraints on the actively selected component. So this makes it easier to just you know, work with the component that you're actually working with and not be distracted by all the arrows and margins that usually come with uh, the layout. Of course, you can easily turn this back on if you do want to see all the constraints at the same time. And so this is kind of showing you a side by side. And so on the left, we have it turned off. And on the right, we have it turned on. And so especially in the design surface or design mode, it actually cleans it up a lot because you don't have all these little arrows and margins, especially for elements that are really close to each other, like the 322 and following and the 20 followers. And then in Blueprint mode, it's the same thing. Um, even though Blueprint mode is heavily simplified because we don't render the components, it still gets a little hairy to look at. And so we think this is a good option as well here. The other view option we have is live rendering. So we've actually done live rendering by default in constraint layout for quite some time. Oh, let me go back. Can I go back? Is this, oh. And so it's on by default, but depending on the specs of your machine, it can actually be a little slow. So as you drag around, you might you know, make a mistake, or oftentimes when I've tried to use it, it's I'll try to create a constraint, and then the button will move way after I drag it. And so that actually causes me to make more mistakes. And so. And so if you turn it off, it's actually much faster as you drag and move things around. You can still see the bounding boxes when you're dragging around, and so you'll know where things end up. The only downside is that it just doesn't render as you drag. And alternatively, you can use Blueprint mode. So here we don't do any live rendering. Um, we usually recommend this is the best way to work with constraint layout because you can just focus on the constraints. And so, you know, as a refresher, to set these options, they're in the top left corner under the eyeball. Um, and if you want to switch between design and blueprint mode, that's using the blue layers icon as well. So the other thing I'll talk about is zooming and panning. So you've actually been able to zoom and pan in the layout editor for a while now. Um, and it comes really in handy when you're dealing with constraint layouts, especially when, again, when things are really small or when they're really close to each other or overlapping. But what we've done in 3.3 is we've actually changed the keyboard shortcuts to match more of what we expect from the design tools like Photoshop and Sketch. And so to zoom in, you can use Command or Control, depending on what OS you're on, and then the equal sign. So you don't have to actually hit Shift and then the equal sign to get the plus, just hit equals. But if you really want to use Shift, it actually still works. Um, and then with the mouse wheel, you can, use, you can hold Command or Control and scroll up. And then if you have a trackpad, you can just pinch in to zoom. Then the opposite is for zoom out. So it's command and control minus, and then command and control with the mouse wheel, scroll down, and then pinch in the opposite direction. And then zoom to fit. So if you're zoomed in and you want to get back to that layout where you can see the whole thing, you can just use command and control plus zero. And so then 
if you're zoomed in and you don't actually want to zoom out, but you want to pan around, you can actually do so by holding space and then using the mouse to kind of click and drag. Um, this is kind of a familiar gesture if you've used Photoshop or other design tools. And so the last tip I'll talk about is using sample data. And so with sample data in constraint layout, it's actually easier to preview how your layouts will respond to different content types at runtime. And so we, we introduced sample data helpers in Android Studio 3.2 to make it easier to work with in the, de in the design surface, specifically for image views, text views, and recycler views. But before that, you could use tools attributes in XML, which are still useful, but we just didn't find were as discoverable on the design surface. And so with the image view, we have two sample sets. We have avatars, and we have scenic backgrounds. And so if you, and if you want to add your own images to the sample data, you can do so. You just create a sample data directory at the root of your project. And so with sample data and with your image views constrained, you can actually just you know, quickly switch between different types of images and then also set different aspect ratios and constraints so you can quickly see how your layout responds without actually having to run your app. And the same goes with TextView. So with TextView, we have a bunch of sample data. So we have cities, we have lorem ipsum, we have dates, full name. And again, if you want your own sample data, you can create it at the sample data directory at the root of your project. And I think we support flat text files and JSON. And actually, with text views, I think this is even more important because oftentimes you know, you'll have text views that are meant for more open-ended content, such as profile descriptions. So in this case, we have you know, domestic short hair is a very short description. But then on the right, this one's just you know, a bunch of text plopped in there. And so you know, without having to run our, your app, you can see, just with sample data, how your layout responds. So I don't need to copy Laura Mipsum off the internet every time now? No, it's just, just there. <laughs> Um, and I think, as the, you mentioned in the previous example, this is great for testing out like, across different languages. And so with that, I'll hand it back to Sean to talk about some new features. Thanks, Chris. All right, so that covers everything in Constraint Layout 1.1, 1.0, some of the new features in the design service coming out in 3.3 that should hopefully help you use that to build Constraint Layout. And now I want to move on to new features coming out in Constraint Layout 2.0. And by that, I mean Motion Editor, the thing we're all very, very excited about. Uh, so I want to show of hands, like, who has tried playing with Motion Editor already? So I see five people. So hopefully we can give like, a nice introduction here to the basic concepts of Motion Editor. And then Chris is going to get back on stage and talk again about the design surface. So Motion Editor, sorry, Motion Layout allows you to build dynamic layouts using all of the features of Constraint Layout we talked about earlier, but then just changing the constraints over time. So here we can see an example of building a collapsible header that Chris Baines put together that does a pretty dramatic animation that would be pretty hard to build with a collapsible header itself. So you can see that that title image actually sh hides itself behind the view as it scrolls up. It's a pretty dramatic animation. So before we get to something like that, let's talk a little bit about what we can build with Motion Layout. Motion Layout can be used to build collapsible headers. You can build state feedback or transitions, maybe the open and closed state of a drawer. Um, and you could also make uh, most of the animations that are in this presentation as well. To understand motion, to understand animation in general, it's really important to take a step back and think about like, what actually defines an animation. Not, not just on Android, but like, even if a Disney movie, what, how do they make an animation? All animations are defined by a start and an end. So I start over here, I'm here and then I'm ending over here. And in between, over time, I created an animation by doing that walking. So that's a very complex motion. Let's talk about a very simple one and talk about the same concept. I'm going to put a blue dot on the screen, and I'd like to build an animation. In order to do that, I have to define a start. I'm going to put it in the top left corner with constraints. I have to define an end. I'm going to put that in the bottom right corner with constraints. And now, in order to build an animation, all I do is transition from one, from the start, to the end over time. And that's what Motion Layout will do for you. It'll figure out how to transition that blue dot from the start down to the end. To build a Motion Layout, you have to start with a Motion Layout in your XML. So Motion Layout is a subclass of Constraint Layout. So we did that so that it would have all of the features of Constraint Layout while adding all of the new features in order to support animations. A motion layout then points to a motion scene, which is a separate XML file from your main layout. 
And the motion scene is where you encode that start and end information that defines your animation. The start and end are defined in terms of constraint sets. And what are constraint sets? You may be familiar with this already, but if not, what we've been talking about so far looks like this, right? So this is what I would call a constraint layout. It's the views, the actual labels, plus all of the constraints and all of the sizing information. A constraint set is just this part. It's just the constraints and just the sizing information. It points to IDs of actual views, but it doesn't actually contain the views themselves. And if I animate a constraint set, it would look like that. And if I apply that to a real view and did that same animation, it would look like that. So let's build a, a fairly you know, easy to follow along animation in constraint layout with motion layout. So here we have a pretty dramatic reveal animation where the title comes in on the top, the subtitle expands down below, and then the description comes in from the bottom. And at the same time, the image in the background is also resizing itself. So there's a lot of things going on here. Uh, and this might be actually hard to write in code, but it's fairly easy to write using motion layout. So let's take a look at how we're going to do that. So to make a motion layout, I'm just going to add, uh, I'm going to define the start and the end. So the start, I'm going to move that title off the screen. And I'm going to do that by making a constraint from the end of the title to the start of the, the viewport, to so the constraint layout. And constraint layout's very happy to lay your views out off the screen if you ask it to. Uh, so please intend to do that if you ask it to. Uh, then we're also going to do the same thing on the bottom, where we're going to put a constraint from that description text to the bottom of the screen to push that description, description text off the screen. Then to actually build that, we're going to go ahead and make a motion layout. So again, this is a subclass of constraint layout, and it has one new tag. It has this layout description tag, which is going to point over to that motion scene file. Here I'm going to call it space scene. Then I have to define my layout which is just the views. I don't give it widths and heights. I don't constrain anything. I'm literally just going to make a list of three text views and an image view. Now I'm going to go over to that space scene file I was talking about earlier. This is the, the motion scene file. So it has a motion scene tag, and inside that it defines a transition. And a transition has a start and an end. And again, that's the thing that defines an animation. An animation always has a beginning, and it always has an end. To define start, I'm going to make a constraint set. And a constraint set is just a tag. It has an ID. And then it defines a list of constraints. And it's going to have to define a constraint for every single view that it's constraining. Here, I'm just going to show one of the views and leave the others off the slide deck because it got a little long. But we'll, give it, we'll say which ID I'm constraining. I'm going to constrain the title. I'm going to set its height, width, and I'm going to set its padding. And then I'm also going to constrain, to push it off the screen, I'm going to constrain the end to the start of parent. Then I'm going to do the same thing for the constraint set end. I'm going to just go ahead and make the title view constrain the start to the start of parent. And this brings that title onto the screen. I'm going to do the same thing for all of the other views in this layout as well. And that's all I have to do. It's just a little bit of declarative XML, and I've built this animation. So now I'm going to pass it back to Chris, who's going to talk a little bit more about the motion editor. So at I.O. this year, we gave you a sneak preview of the motion editor when we had announced motion layout. Since then, we've been wor working pretty hard on it, but it's not quite ready yet, sorry to say. Um, but we're still very excited about it. But we also wanted to make sure that we focus on getting some foundational pieces in place before we release it. We also don't want to be too impatient and really make sure we get it right, unlike some things we've released too early in the past, like uh, Instant Run. <laughs> <laughs> so the first foundational piece is really the motion layout library itself. So we just talked about that, and it's been out for a while. And so before we got too far in building the tool, we wanted to make sure that we actually nailed the right animation concepts and controls that are required to make these simple and beautiful animations. On top of that, the library also needs to be performant and integrate well with your existing views. And so John Hoford and Nicholas have been really working hard on the library. And so they love all your feedback and all the really cool demos that have been coming out. So please keep it coming, and thank you. But the other thing is actually the quality of Android Studio. And so this is the second foundational piece. And it's been the primary focus for us in 3.3 and the upcoming 3.4 release. And so in this case, we've made a lot of performance 
sorry, performance and interaction improvements to the design surface because it actually has to be able to render animations at 60 frames per second. And also making it easier to work with constraints because one of the biggest prerequisites of motion layout is you have to know how to use constraint layout. And so we think that if we invest in the quality now in the tool, it will actually make the motion editor experience much better in the future. And so with that, I'm here to show you some very early explorations of the motion editor. These are just mock-ups. This is not the build. Um, <laughs> I'm the designer, remember? So this is all sketch. made in Photoshop. Yeah, this is all Photoshop. <laughs> of course, we'd love to hear your feedback, so feel free to find me or Sean. Um, and I think John is here as well. Uh, we'll be at the speaker QA to talk more about it. So if we take the example from before, where we have the space picture and we have some text views animating in, let's just use that as kind of the context of what we'll see in the motion editor. So what does that actually look like? So here we have a new perspective on the component tree, which for now we're just calling the transitions view. And so for the purpose of the talk, I'm just going to talk about this new view uh, because we think this is the most significant animation part of the new UI. Of course, you know, later on you'll actually have the other views like the property panel and the palette, um, but we, we haven't quite figured out the details of how that integrates with this timeline or this transition view, so stay tuned for that. So in this case, we have the start of the transition. And so you can see that the text views are actually off the viewport, but you can see that there's a motion path that goes from with outside and then in. We don't actually render the uh, text views outside the viewport today, but that's definitely something that we will need to have for animation because we know that's a very typical animation example to have things fly in. And so if we kind of fast forward through halfway through the transition, so now you can see that the text views have moved about halfway in. And in this case, we have the space image uh, zoom back out. And that's kind of what we intended here. So if we, if we rewind, let's go deeper on what this transition view actually does. So we're only showing one transition right now. And it's uniquely named by its start and end constraint set, which simply is just start and end in this case. You can have multiple transitions per motion layout. And so with this drop down, you'll be able to switch between the different transitions. And of course, we'll load the corresponding constraint sets and change the timeline so you can see how the components change. And so each transition has its own properties, which is, of course, the start and the end constraint set. It has the duration, which is expressed in milliseconds, and uh, the stagger property, which allows you to actually stagger the, um, the animation itself. So if we move down, we have the timeline. And so you have, starting from the left, you have the playback bar. So you can loop the animation as many times as you want just to get the animation right. You can quickly jump to the start or the end. And if you want to speed down, or sorry, speed up or slow down the animation, we also allow that as well. Again, just to like tune the animation perfectly. And we have this uh, time control here. So you can actually step through um, millisecond by millisecond just to see how the animation plays out. And then for the timeline itself, you know, we show from 0 to 100, 100 being the end. And so you can use this slider here to actually make the timeline bigger or smaller, depending on which part of the transition you want to focus on. And so if we move down, we can actually see all the components that you can animate in the motion layout. And so in this case, each component will show that they have a start and an end constraint set, which are required in order to actually animate anything. And so if we look specifically at the space flash image, it has a key attribute in the middle or keyframe, which we're actually going to change the scale type halfway through the animation. And so if we zoom out, those icons on the timeline actually correspond to the same icons on the design surface. That way, you can actually kind of correlate, OK, here's my components that I'm animating, and where they're starting and ending, and what are the actual motion paths. And so that's kind of where we are with the motion editor. Um, we hope to get it out soon, uh, but I can't promise anything. And <laughs> sorry. Later next year. Yeah, sometime <laughs> in 2019. And that's it. Everyone, the next session in this theater will begin at 5.40.
Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Our program in this room is going to get underway in just about two and a half minutes. If you have been using your digital devices, we ask you to take a moment right now to silence them. Thanks. Please be seated. Our program will resume in two and a half minutes. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the talk. My name is Dong Chen. I'm a tech lead of MLKit team at Google. I'm here today to talk about MLKit, Google's machine learning SDK for mobile. I will provide an overview of what MLKit does and also what's new since its inception six months ago. I also share some tips and the best practices to improve performance, accuracy, reduce size, and a few other things. In the end, I will talk about what we're working on. Two years ago, Google CEO Sundar Pichai said, we'll move from mobile first to AI first world. The intersection of these two worlds means machine learning on mobile. In recent years, more and more mobile apps are using machine learning to produce fascinating user experiences. With smartphones becoming increasingly powerful and capable, more and more machine learning logic is shifting from the server running the cloud to the mobile device in your pocket. 
Running on device machine learning has many advantages. It's fast, it does not need to send very expensive RPC costs and incur long network latency. It also runs anytime, anywhere, with and without ne network connectivity. It also provides better protection for user privacy, since the data does not have to leave the device. Let me take a quick poll here. How many of you traveled from outside California to attend this Dev Summit? Wow, welcome. Welcome to the Silicon Valley. I hope you get a chance to visit Golden Gate Bridge, Fisherman's Wharf, and also enjoy some good food at the local restaurant around the Bay Area. Talking about food, my biological watch tells me it's time for dinner. So where should I eat? Well, I will pull out my phone, ask Google Assistant. Hi, Google. I'm hungry. Any good restaurant around here? Google Assistant uses machine learning to understand my question and make recommendation where to go for dinner around the area and location I'm currently at. When I travel to a new place, I would like to take a lot of photos. And Google Photos use image recognition to understand image content. It can classify photos quickly into thousands of categories. It can also detect individual faces, paths, objects, text in the photo, and then make them searchable by keywords or categories later on. Mobile device can now run really increasingly suffix machine learning tasks. Last spring, I took my family to Tuscany in Italy. We drove around those beautiful hilltop towns. In each of the towns, there are many signs. But I don't speak Italian, unfortunately. I wish I, I do. So uh, how do I know what it means? Here's where the Google Transit came to rescue. Google Transit can perform multiple machine learning tasks in a single journey. When I pull out my phone, pointing the camera at the sign, it will use optical character recognition to detect text in the sign. It will also use natural, uh, natural language processing to translate the text from one language into another. Finally, it will use speech synthesis to convert text into voice and using speaker to tell me what the sign is in my own language. All these tasks involve machine learning. Combined, they produce a seamless and a powerful user experience. This all look great, but as a developer, how do I build something like this? Well, it's doable, but not easy. Machine learning often requires specialized knowledge and the years of experience in training and building ML models. The model training, a lot of time, requires a, a large amount of good, high-quality data. The mobile device, however, on the other side, it has very limited computing power. Models running on a server in the cloud are often too large or too complex to run directly on a mobile device. You need to spend a lot of effort to optimize the model for the mobile usage. After finally the app is built, you need to worry about how do I deploy, how do I maintain the ongoing experimentation of the models. That becomes another headache. To tackle all these power problems, we launched MLKit. Google's machine learning SDK for mobile, which helps the mobile developers to build Android and iOS apps using machine learning technologies. MLKit is aimed at making machine learning easy for mobile developers. Just because you want to use machine learning on mobile, it does not mean you need to worry about collecting data, building models, training, model compression, optimization, hosting, deployment, downloading model, all this headache. MLKit will take care of all this for you. We provide common turnkey models that work just out of box. All the models are optimized for speed, accuracy, as well as efficiency for the model, for the mobile device. We provide one consistent API across both Android and iOS. It's very easy to integrate MLKit with Firebase tools like remote config or A-B testing. For commonly needed machine learning tasks, we have base APIs that come with pre-trained Google models that work out of box. Currently, there are five APIs we are supporting. The test 
recognition API are supported on both on-device and the cloud. The on-device API can recognize Latin characters, and the cloud API supports a wide range of languages and special characters. Face detection is another API we support, which can be used to detect faces in both static image as well as live video streaming. Now, we also launch contour detection, which can help you to identify different parts of the face, and you can then apply face masks or filters. The barcode scanning can be used to detect both one-dimensional and two-dimensional barcodes, as well as a QR code. Image labeling API can detect objects of various entities inside the photo. And for, it supports both on-device and the cloud. The on-device API supports more than 400 labels, which cover most of the common things you see in photos, while the cloud API can support 10,000 labels across many categories. Finally, our landmark API can recognize well-known places in the photo, like White House or Eiffel Tower. If this pre-trained model do not fit your need, and you are an experienced developer with, with the knowledge in how to build and train models, you're more than welcome to bring your own custom model. We run custom models on TensorFlow Lite. As you might know, TensorFlow is an open source framework for machine learning, and TensorFlow Lite it's a lightweight version of TensorFlow optimized for mobile platforms. For models trained with TensorFlow, we provide you tools to convert and compress into a format compatible with TensorFlow Lite. When you're using custom model, you have two options, either bundle it inside your app or host it in the cloud. If you choose the latter option to host in the cloud, it does not mean you need to build your own cloud server. MLKit and Firebase will provide a way for, for you, for, for you we will manage the model hosting, deployment, downloading, upgrade, as well as the ongoing experimentations. Since MLKit was launched six months ago at the Google I.O., we have made several enhancements. First, we greatly enhanced our face detection models, which is now 18 times faster and 13 to 24 percent more accurate. We also polished our text recognition API by making them more streamlined and consistent across both on device and the cloud. In addition, we launched 133 point face contour detection. As shown in this image, you can see now you can use our face contour detection API to identify the contours of various parts of your face uh, or anyone's face in the photo and includes the entire face, both eyebrows, eyes, nose, and lips. This is where the real-time apps can put custom faces, a custom face mask and the filters, like a goggle or some funny nose on the face, and make the mask move with the face in a live video streaming. Next, I'm going to share some tips and best practices for how to use MLKit so that can build uh, impressive mobile apps using on-device machine learning. First of all, I will share a couple of tips for achieving best accuracy. There are two things you should make sure. One, you should take a very sharp and well-focused image. Poor image focus can really hurt the accuracy. Second, you should ensure the objects you want to detect in the image has sufficient size. For example, for face detection, you should have at least 100 by 100 pixels for each face. And if you want the contour detection in a selfie mode, for example, then the face should be 200 by 200 pixels. For, for the text API, for Latin languages, each character should be at least 16 by 16 in, in size. And if you use our cloud API to detect and recognize Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, then each character in those oriental language should be at least 24 by 24. Similarly, barcode also have the size requirement. Please check out our online documentation for more details. Machine learning and the libraries can be large, which can slow down the app download. There are two ways to reduce the APK size. First, you can build your app as an Android app bundle. By doing that, you enable Google Play 
to automatically generate APKs for specific screen density, CPU architecture, as well as the languages. Then your user only have to download the APKs and native code libraries that match their device configuration. Another way you can reduce APK size is if the machine learning feature in your app is not the primary purpose, then you could move the machine learning features which require the ML kit into a dynamic feature module. In that way, you prevent users from unnecessarily downloading ML models, which can sometimes be large. We all know machine learning involves a lot of computation. So the speed becomes really important. Here are some tips how you could improve the performance, for, especially for real-time inference on streaming video. You can reduce the image resolution as well as the video frame rate to limit the amount of computation it involves to do the inference. When the current frame is being processed, you should also throttle incoming video frames to avoid any backup which increase memory as well as slow down the performance. For real-time face detection, you should use face fast mode, which luckily is the default mode. Oftentimes, 480 by 360 resolution is sufficient for face detection. For real-time processing, you should also choose between contour detection versus classification or landmark detection, but not both, because doing both could be expensive and may not be fit for the real-time device, real-time processing in the slow device. Another tip and trick you, should, you can use is you should wait for detection to finish before render the face and contour together. You can check out our online quick start sample app on GitHub for more details. To illustrate what I mean, I will do a live demo. Let's switch to the demo mode. So for the purpose of demo, I'm using a um, slower three-year-old uh, three Nexus 5X phone. Because using the latest Pixel phone, the difference are not as prominent. In the first video, I'm going to show you without any performance tips. And uh, we do not do video throttling. We do not do any lake drawing to make sure the contour and the face are together. So if you just call the API, Without any performance improvement, you can see the contours are not falling in the face. And there's a big gap between these two. All right, so now I'm going to switch to another version after applying performance tips. In this version, it's using the exact same Nexus 5X phone, but we throttle the video frame, uh, incoming video frame when we're still processing the current frame. And also, we wait for the detection to finish before render both the face and the contour. As you can see now, the contours are following the face all the time. They match each other. There's no more gap. Cool. So let's switch back to the slides. Thank you. If you're using our custom model API, how to include the model becomes a, something you should consider. There are two ways. You can either bundle the model inside your app or host it on the cloud. If you bundle your model in your app, it's available immediately. It also does not require any model downloading, so it works offline. But the downside is, you get a bigger app because the app contains the model. It may slow down the app download. Also, you cannot change the model without a new app release. On the other hand, if you host some uh, model in the cloud, we provide all the hosting support for you. You get a smaller app size because the app itself does not contain the model, which translates into faster installation. You also can choose to download the model only if it's needed. The model updates can come over the air into the app without any new app release. You can also use remote config and the A-B testing framework provided by the Firebase to do face rollout as well as controlled pilots. The drawback of hosting model on the cloud is obviously it needs connectivity. When there's no connectivity, you, don't get to, you, don't, you cannot download the model. Also, the model will not be available until they're downloaded. 
So a third option is using a hybrid approach. You can bundle the model, the initial version of the model in the app, so make it uh, usable right away after installation. Then you can receive model updates over the air from the cloud. If you are using our base API, it's provided in two different forms. For the latter of better terms, I call it thick SDK and thin SDK. In a thin SDK, the models are actually provided by the Google Play service, which means they are shared across all apps. The apps itself does not have to contain the model, and which will make your app smaller. Text recognition and the barcode scanning APIs are provided through the thin SDK. The second type is called thick SDKs. The models are bundled inside the SDK. Each app will have their own copy of the model, which will increase the app size. Face detection and image labeling are supported through the thick SDKs. To use these two types of SDK and use various APIs provided by the MLKit, you need to include the appropriate MLKit dependencies in your app level build.gradle file. Inside that file, inside this dependency section, if you want to use the API support through the thin SDK, you should add the dependency called Firebase-ML-Vision. And in addition, if you want to use thick SDK, you should still keep this line, because all the Vision API entry points are coming from this thin SDK dependency. But you also need to add additional dependencies. For example, if you want to use image uh, de recognition, uh, image detection, then you need to add the Firebase ML Vision face model dependency because it's a thick SDK. Similarly, for image labeling, if you need that feature, then you need to add image label model dependency. Next, I will talk about a few new areas we are currently working on. A few new MLKit features are either under development or in early testing phase. We expanded beyond vision, starting natural language processing with Smart Reply. Smart Reply is a feature which can enable you to produce meaningful response based on the current conversation context. We are also planning to go into other areas like speech. At the same time, we will continue to enhance performance and accuracy of base APIs. We launched model compression and conversion service to our alpha users, which helped them to convert and compress large models into smaller and faster versions for mobile usage. The conversion service currently seen in alpha uses pruning, quantization, distillation, as well as the transfer learning to retrain the large models, make them smaller and faster without sacrificing too much accuracy. FishBrain is a community-based app. It enables users to share the photos of their catch and within their social networks. With a machine learning model, it can identify any fish with just a photo. When they first came to us, their model is more than 80 megabytes. By using our conversion and compression service, they're able to trim down the model to under one meg. As you can see, the not only maintain the same level of accuracy, but actually it's actually slightly better. If you are interested in trying out our model compression service, please join our alpha program by sign up today at g.co slash firebase slash sign up. No matter you are new to machine learning or experienced AI expert, I hope you enjoyed the talk today and can take home some tips and I can't wait to see what you will build with MLKit. If you have any question, I will wait outside in the Ask Andre Lounge. And we we'll also have office hour tomorrow. Thank you very much for listening.
everyone. Oh, yeah, good point. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Welcome to More Than Android Notifications. Uh, my name is Jing Yu. I'm a developer advocate in the partner DevRel team. And I'm Paul Matthews. I'm a partner developer advocate in London. So three years ago on this stage, uh, Chris Wren, an Android engineer on the system UI, um, gave this quote, and it's a brilliant one. Um, Don't annoy the user. Respect them, empower them, delight them, connect them to the people they care about. And this is still very much true today. So we're going to look at uh, channels and how you can use them in your app, what's new in notifications, and finally, digital well-being. But first, how to respect your users. So respect your user's attention. Don't annoy the user, respect them. Some useful tips. Um, so do respect the user's settings. So um, if they've communicated to you in your app that uh, they want a certain setting for your notifications, then you should respect that. Don't try and override it. Don't try and uh, ignore it. You should check that the notifications you're sending are not blocked, that they, they do still want to hear these notifications. <laughs> And finally, if you're capable in your app, you should back up any settings that they've told you about notifications, and you should make sure that they're synced um, over installs and over devices. You should use well-structured um, notifications in your app, so making use of the, the, the um, styles that we provide, such as messaging style, inbox style, big picture uh, style. And you should make sure that your, your notifications are relevant and timely. A great example is using high priority FCM messages to ensure that the user gets the notification when you intend them to get your notification. And uh, prioritize posting the notifications first and then making them look even better, so downloading assets and that kind of thing. Some don'ts, some basic don'ts. Don't just send these notifications, kind of forget about them. So we really want you to, to use the platform features that are there to help you. For instance, auto cancel making sure that your notifications disappear when they should. Timeouts. Is a notification really relevant after four hours? Um, and synchronizing across the devices. If you know that your user uses your app on, on multiple devices, like tablets and desktops, you should try and synchronize notifications that they dismiss on one or read on one across others. So don't send notifications that are not actionable. The point of notifications is that they're there to be used. The, the, by definition, the user wants to know something, which means they generally need to do something. So don't send them a notification that just tells them, hey, we sync some stuff in the background. This is not the best use of notifications. And finally, don't annoy the user. So when you send, post a notification to them, you should use alert once and make sure that they're not getting buzzed like crazy as they're standing up on stage presenting about notifications. And you should make sure that the group notification behavior is representative of what you want. So if you're a chat app, maybe children um, group notification behavior, or summary if you're something else. So respect the user. Otherwise, they might just turn off your notifications, and then you've got no way of communicating to them. They might choose to uninstall your app, which would be far worse. And we help. There are some platform um, features that deliberately enable notifications being turned off. For instance, you can see here the uh, uh, notifications being posted, and the user maybe keeps swiping it away. And so now in, in P, we prompt the user, do you really care about this notification? Do you really want to see this content? This acts on channels. So if you're not describing your channels correctly, then this can lead to con some confusion and perhaps some um, lost notifications from the user's perspective. So let's look more about notification channels. They provide granular control to your notifications for the user. So you should empower the user. And clearly, channels are the way to empower them. So let's look at how to use them. Well, first of all, they're now required on all apps as we've, uh, they're required on API 26. And that should be everywhere prevalent now. They help the user categorize so they help you categorize your notifications that help the user to, to interact with them. But more on that soon. And finally, they allow the user to customize the settings. So the user has the final say. So if you think something's important and they don't think it is, they can, they can tell you this. So let's look at the best practices. 
again, um, you should allow the users to manage their notifications through the channel creation. You should allow them to maybe deep link into settings to, to change these things. If they're expressing an interest of working with your, your notification channels, perhaps they want to be able to change the, the importance of something. So setting the right importance level for a notification channel seems like an obvious one, but it's so easy to overlook. And finally, user settings. You should respect the user settings, as we said earlier, but back them up where you can, and don't try and abuse them by deleting and recreating. Other don'ts are only using one channel. This is a clear uh, notification smell, if you like. If you've only got one channel in your application, there's probably something else you need to be looking at. If you provide poor descriptions for users so that they don't really understand what the purpose of a channel is, then they're not going to be able to make the best decisions. Or if you use wrong or, or blocked channels, then this is probably, you know, they're trying to communicate to you that, that they don't like this content, and you should respect that. And finally, spamming the user with notification channels is, is just not the best way to proceed. So choosing your channels can really help. Choosing your channels carefully. You really should think of the user when you create your channels. Not your application, not your architecture. Think of the user and how they might want to interact with your app. For instance, it's a bad idea to try and create notification channels around your importance level that you find important. So, hey, this is a really high priority thing. This isn't what notification channels are for. You should, say, you should group them around you know, categories of, of notifications. For instance, tagging in a photo or liked posts. Let the user communicate back to you how they see that, that type of notification. You should also think about creating notifications when there's more control needed. For instance, if I'm on a chat app and I've got a set general channel for all chat notifications coming in, but then I, I express an interest in controlling like a family chat group, you should, allow, you should create a channel at that point and allow the user to dive deeper and, and have more finely uh, grained control. And finally, lazily creating. So this comes back to not creating too many groups, uh, channels or groups, and that is, you know, if, if Jingyu never receives a, a direct message on, through your app, maybe don't, you don't need to create the, the, group, the channel for that. And then the user can, can provide feedback to you to say, look, this is useful or this isn't useful. And you should listen to that. So in Android P, we added broadcasts for listening in to, um, blocking, to blocking or changing state of your notification channels. You should understand those. And you should react to them. You should maybe back them up so that the next time you create a channel on a different device, it makes sense. And finally, you can you know, query these APIs at runtime also to find out you know, how, how the user interacts with your channels. So now look at what's new in notifications. Thank you, Paul. Um, OK, let's now look at what else is new in notifications on Android 9. So first, we added some viral updates. Uh, to make the notifications easier to read and scan through. As you probably noticed, we added more paddings in the notification, and, went back, uh, and we went back to using the rounded corners at the top and bottom. The other improvement that we really love is this smooth app opening animation that you are seeing here on the slide. Instead of closing the notification and opening the app, now the notification transforms smoothly into the app, which speeds up the transition more than twice. Um, and you might ask, uh, what do you need to do to have this? All you need to do is to make sure that you are uh, starting your activity directly and your activity starts quickly. Since for most users, um, the uh, notification they care about the most are the ones connecting them with the people uh, they care. So we enhanced our messaging style, uh, messaging experience. Um, by adding a new person class um, once you use API 28. Um, and if you're using messaging style in notification, you can see that we have now moved the people's avatar to the left of the notification. And you can set that avatar by using this set icon method. We also added support for images and stickers in the messaging notification. By using set data, you can add image in your messaging notification directly. 
The other feature that I love on Android is direct reply. Um, but sometimes when I'm replying to a notification, I would accidentally tap on the notification, and that will open the app, and my response is lost. But on Android 9, you can help the user with this. Um, by retrieving the draft from this extra, uh, you can populate the response in your app. So make the user experience better, delight them. Um, if you already support Smart Reply in your app, uh, we highly recommend that you use this Set Choices API to also display them in your notification. Instead of replying to the notification, user can now just tap one of them um, and to reply. Okay, here's an example we have for creating messaging style notification using the new APIs. So first, we're gonna create a instance, uh, person instance here. Uh, so we're gonna use the person builder. As you can see, we are setting the name, the URI, the icon for this person. And this is gonna represent the sender in a message. And then we're gonna pass that to this message that we're creating here. As you can see, we're passing the instance of the person, not like before, where we're passing the name of that person. And in this message, we also want to include the image. So we're using the set data method to include that image. And then after that, we're adding this message uh, with another uh, message. So we're adding two messages into this messaging style notification. And then we're setting this style into our notification. OK, so here's a quick summary of some of the do's and don'ts when you're using messaging style. First, please use messaging style for messages. And this also applies for if you're building for Android Auto or, or Android Wear. If you're sending messaging notifications, please use messaging style. In the past, we've seen developers switching between messaging style and some other styles, like big picture style, in order to uh, create that um, big uh, image expansion presentation. But now, with the data method, you don't need to do that. You can just use messaging style, and this will create a consistent experience for the user. And it's always good to add that icon for the people in the notification. So we highly recommend that you use that icon to add that avatar. But if you don't set the icon, we will use the initial of the name for that person to create, it, create that visual presentation. And finally, if your app supports smart reply, uh, please add that into your notification. So you are creating a better experience for the user. And here's a few things that you want to avoid. There are a lot of good reasons to auto-cancel a notification in order to give the user a clean and up-to-date notification jar. But after the user replies to a notification, uh, a messaging notification, this is not one of those cases. You would want to keep that notification there so if user want to return to this conversation and reply afterwards. So please don't cancel that. And let the user swipe away when they're finished with the conversation. The other bad behavior that we've seen in the past is some developers uh, are, using, are, are setting this empty name uh, in order to achieve a viral presentation. Um, but on Android 9, please don't do that. Uh, there are two reasons. One is because it will break on Android 9 uh, on the presentation. And the other, uh, the, and the other reason is because um, a person without a name is not a real person. <laughs> um, so up until now, uh, we will talk about how you can reach the user, uh, how you can help your user connect with people they care about, and how you can make your notification uh, a better experience for the user. But I want to hit a, stop, uh, hit a pause here and look at app usage from the other side. Since as much as I want to get that notification from my friend and family, I still need time away from the device. So to help users with this, we announced the digital well-being at I.O. this year. If you have a Pixel device running uh, Android 9, I highly recommend that you download it from the Play Store uh, and sign up for beta. So this is what digital well-being will show us. It provides an overview of our app usage and provides a da dashboard that shows um, our time spending on each app and the number of notifications that we received. 
Um, I've personally loved using digital well-being to learn that where I'm spending my time, but sometimes I would find that one or two apps are sending me a lot of notifications unexpectedly. So one question you might have is, how are these notifications counted? Since this is still in beta, the counting method may change, but the goal is to track user interruption, interruptions. So in general, any newly created notifications are counted as one, and in any updates that's visible to the user are also counted as one, which means if you're sending a notification to the block channel, that is not counted here. So in this case, I saw this app is sending me lots of notifications. So I got curious. Uh, I went into the dashboard, and I opened that um, to see the overlay breakdown. And as you can see here, I got notifications every hour that day. And even at 4 AM in the morning, I got eight notifications. So if these notifications are high importance, I would be woken up in the middle of the night. But thankfully, that's not the case. Um, but if these notifications are push notifications and they are sent using high priority FCM message, which means this app is constantly waking up a deep dose device. If I want to have good battery in the morning, I might just uninstall this app. But for now, um, I will turn on DND, do not disturb, so that I don't get disturbed. Digital well-being also provides ways for users to um, disconnect and reduce interruption. And on Pixel 3, you can even turn on DND by simply flip your device, which is super convenient. But uh, what if this is a super important uh, notification that the uh, user actually wants to receive? So for those, uh, here's a few advice for you. First, set the right category to your notification. As we can see here in the Do Not Disturb setting, user can choose what to block and what to allow. And they can set exceptions on calls, messages, reminders, and events. If your notification belongs to one of them, please tag your notification as such. Here, I listed a few categories which correspond to these exceptions on the other side. As I said, if your notification belongs to one of these categories, please let us know by tagging them. The other advice that we have is, if this is a notification coming from another uh, person, then please tag your notification. As you can see here in the, digital, uh, in the Do Not Disturb setting, user can choose who they want to get a notified from, from their contacts. So please add that person in your notification and um, associate and add the associated URI if possible. Doing this will allow you to bypass Do Not Disturb. But you should always remember that when users turn on Do Not Disturb, they really don't want to be disturbed. So if you're sending a notification that's not expected, that will really annoy them. So please don't abuse these APIs, which this brings us back to the quote we had at the beginning, where we're saying, whenever you're sending a notification, please keep this in mind. Don't annoy the user. Respect them, empower them, delight them, and connect them to the people they care about. Thank you. Say hello to Android Things 1.0, Google's managed operating system for building and maintaining Internet of Things devices at scale. I'm Wayne Pekarsky, and today I'm going to explain what's new in version 1.0, how it provides long-term support for production devices, and a new lineup of system-on-module hardware. So what is Android Things? Android Things is Google's managed operating system that enables you to build and maintain Internet of Things devices at scale. We provide a robust platform that does the heavy lifting with certified hardware, rich developer APIs, and secure managed software updates using Google's backend infrastructure. So you can focus on building your product. Version 1.0 is the first release of Android Things that is ready for your production devices. We just recently completed our developer preview and the preview SDK was downloaded over 100,000 times. Developer feedback and engagement has been critical in our journey towards 1.0 and we're grateful to the over 10,000 developers who provided us feedback through filing bugs, attending events, and posting in our communities. 
A core part of our IoT platform is the supported hardware based on a system on module or SOM design. So what is this? A SOM is a fully integrated component with CPU, memory, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and flash storage that you can just drop into your final design, just like you would use a library when writing software. The SOM is certified by Google, and we provide a board support package that includes the kernel, drivers, and libraries to support Android. With Android Things 1.0, we've announced support for SOMs based on designs from NXP, Qualcomm, and MediaTek. And these modules are certified for production use and available in quantities to make real consumer products. If you want to try Android things right now without buying a SOM, you can even use any one of our developer platforms, even the Raspberry Pi 3. And this highlights an important feature of Android things. It's quick and easy for prototyping. And when you're ready for production, there's a clear path to buying SOMs in small or large quantities, depending on your needs, and then your software is ready to go. You can then design your own printed circuit board or PCB to connect your hardware to the SOM. When building IoT devices, maintaining security is very important. Providing timely software updates over the air, or OTA, is a fundamental part of that. And stability fixes and security patches are supported on production hardware platforms, and automatic updates are enabled for all devices by default. For each Android Things version, Google will offer free stability fixes and security patches for three years, with additional options for extended support. Even after the official support window ends, you'll still be able to continue to push app updates to your devices. You use the Android Things console to upload Android APKs with your updates. So the OTA mechanism can push them out to your devices. You can initially experiment with 100 active devices for non-commercial use. When you're ready for mass production, we'll provide you with a distribution agreement, and now you're ready to sell your devices in large quantities to the public. With Android Things, you can build apps using the rich framework provided by the Android SDK and Google Play services, including the same UI toolkit, multimedia support, and connectivity APIs used by mobile developers today. You can also easily integrate your apps with popular Google services like Firebase, TensorFlow, and Cloud IoT Core. This is done using the many existing Android client libraries. And since it's Android, you can use Android Studio and all of its languages and tools right out of the box. This means you can easily program and debug in Kotlin, Java, C++, or C, depending on your needs. Who else is using Android things? You may have seen the new voice-activated speakers from Polk, LG, and iHome, as well as smart displays from Lenovo, LG, and JBL. These devices showcase the powerful capabilities of the Google Assistant and are coming soon to stores near you. There are also lots of startups and design agencies using Android Things to prototype innovative ideas for all kinds of devices you're going to see very soon. We want to make it easy for anyone to start building IoT devices without having to own your own factory and without requiring lots of funding. This is all part of our efforts to democratize hardware development, making it accessible to more software developers out there. If you want to get started with Android Things, we have a great community website, androidthings.withgoogle.com, where you can see the developer kits and the interesting projects created by others. So what's next? Get some hardware, check out the documentation, download some sample source code, and try it out. And join our community to ask questions and share your ideas with others. Android Things 1.0 is now open for business and ready for production. I'm really looking forward to seeing all the exciting products that you build. I'm Wayne Pekarski, and I'll see you next time. The Android Dev Summit lineup is full of talks on the latest and greatest in the Android developer world. Now, if you're itching to try out what you've actually seen, check out Google Developer Code Labs. Code Labs are hands-on, step-by-step coding tutorials for Google libraries, APIs, and technologies. There are over 70 Android Code Labs, including Code Labs for Android Jetpack libraries and Kotlin coroutines. Code Labs are also available for all skill levels whether you're just starting out as a developer or a seasoned professional. The best way to master a new technology is to do it yourself. Find your code lab and learn something new today at g.co slash codelabs slash ads18.